Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Murray-Darling Basin Select Committee for a private meeting today from 3.05 p.m. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. General Business Order of the Day number 65, Migration Amendment, New Maritime Crew Visas Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. I rise to speak on the Migration Amendment, New Maritime Crew Visas Bill 2020. This is an important bill. It will help plug Mr Morrison's huge gaping hole in our border security at our maritime ports. Now, Mr. Morrison's a man who's got a trophy in his office of a boat, and it says, I stopped these. You'd think that Mr. Morrison would want to stay on top of emerging maritime border security threats. You would think that Mr. Morrison would be doing everything he can to fight crime. But we, are we seeing this kind of behavior from Mr. Morrison? As Senator Stirl says, no, we are not. In fact, Mr. Morrison has had a few weeks in one area where he's had a few bad weeks in one area where prime ministers really should not have a bad week, and that is in national security. First, many Australians will remember thinking how odd it was that Mr. Morrison pushed his way into a press conference with the Australian Federal Police just two weeks ago. This was a press conference three years in the making for the AFP after they had worked diligently on Operation Ironside, working hand-in-glove with the FBI and State and Territory Police. The AFP were ready to tell their story to Australians about their extraordinary work, which has put such an incredible dent in the operations of some of Australia's most notorious drug barons. But what happened? Obsessed with photo opportunities, Mr. Morrison stormed his way into the AFP's press conference, elbowing everyone out of the way, and took credit for years of hard work by the federal police. And I'm sure it hasn't gone unnoticed that this press conference seemed to magically occur just in time for Mr. Morrison to fly out of Sydney for the G7. Now, the story appears in the morning papers, it jumps into the press conference, and then Mr. Morrison runs out so he can get on his plane onwards to the G7. What a coincidence. How extraordinary. Now, uh, of course, of course, I am hopeful the Prime Minister did not seek to adjust any aspect of the AFP's media plan that day to suit his own political purposes, and I certainly hope the AFP did not adjust any of its media plans to accommodate the Prime Minister, especially if the changes meant any officers might be put at risk. But Mr Morrison did not stop just at hogging the limelight. He went further. Mr. Morrison chose to use that moment to flat-out lie about our national security. Not once, not twice, but three times. Mr. Morrison lied Senator when Keneally. he said— Senator Keneally, I ask you to withdraw. It's not appropriate Thank you. to— Mr. 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 Morrison misspoke when he said that Labor was holding up the progress of the Surveillance Identity and Disrupt Bill. The truth? The bill is still before the Parliamentary Joint Committee on uh, Intelligence and Security. Mr. Morrison also misspoke when he said that Labor opposes the international production orders legislation. Mr. Morrison said, and I quote, that does not have bipartisan support and we need it passed. In fact, the opposite was true. 
The Intelligence Committee had issued a bipartisan report in support of the legislation. And then Mr. Morrison claimed that Labor was holding up transport security changes. This is a bill, this transport security bill, that had in principle Labor support since it was introduced in 2016, that Mr. Morrison allowed to lapse not once, but it, two federal elections, and that could have become law in 2017 following amendments in the Senate, but the Liberal government did not proceed with the bill. Now, Labor's long been concerned that the Liberals have refused to increase background and security checks for foreign crew working in Australia's domestic shipping industry, and we want to work with the Liberals to improve our national security, but the government simply won't come to the table. So, we have Mr. Morrison making false claims about three important national security bills. Mr. Morrison politicizing and playing games with national security, unfortunately, is not new. He sees everything through a political lens, and he thought that he could just politicize national security again. Well, he was wrong. Most news outlets completely ignored Mr. Morrison's claims. They knew these claims were false. They knew he was politicizing national security. And those that did report the story called out Mr. Morrison's false claims for what they were. Unfortunately, Mr. Morrison did not learn from his mistakes and refused to improve the transport security bill. And this is why we are here today debating the new maritime crime visa bill. Because for all his photo ops, for all his tough talk, Mr. Morrison has left Australia's border security with a big, huge, gaping hole. And that hole is caused by the Morrison government refusing to increase the security and background checking of foreign crew who work up and down Australia's coast. After years of Liberals undermining Australia's domestic shipping industry, most ships in Australian waters are now foreign flagged. Some 20,000 foreign flag ships with some 200,000 foreign crew are in Australian waters every year. Yet, while Australian crew are generally required to hold a maritime security identification card, foreign crew are not. Obtaining an m for an Australian is not easy, with Australians waiting for up to three months for their security checks to be finished. But how long does this Liberal government allocate the checking the background of foreign crew? Just 24 to 48 hours. The Migration Amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill 2020 changes that. This bill will create two categories of maritime crew visas. The first visa, an international seafarers transit visa, is for seafarers entering Australia on a continuing international voyage. Indeed, this was the original purpose of the current maritime crew visa. The second visa will be an international seafarers work visa. Applicants for an international seafarer's work visa must undergo similar security assessments as Australians do through an MSIC process. This is a common sense reform to our visa system that will allow Australia to better protect its borders and root out a range of illegal activities that take place on foreign flagged vessels. Foreign flag vessels, or flag of convenience vessels as they are known, have long been a source of illegal drug imports into Australia. 83% of cannabis, 72% of cocaine, 72% of amphetamines seized by authorities in 2018-19 came from maritime ports. Despite these facts, the Morrison government has argued that foreign crew do not require vigorous security checks because they are, quote, under constant supervision whilst in port. Well, events from just last week show that this is not true. On Sunday, 13 June, two Vietnamese nationals escaped from their vessel while it was in port in Geelong. These two men also stole their passports from the master's cabin just before they escaped. To make matters worse, the Morrison government have refused to release details to the community to help them identify the escapees. If it wasn't for the Geelong advertiser who sounded the alarm, 
Australians may have never known about this border breach. The Australian Border Force is silent, with no Twitter updates, no media releases on its website. We know that a culture of secrecy has overwhelmed the Morrison government. It is now clear that culture has spread into our border controls, with Mr. Morrison limiting the information Australians can receive about border breaches. The incident in Geelong is symptomatic of the ongoing and significant risks of foreign crew working in Australia without sufficient oversight. The Senate Regional and Rural Affairs and Transport Committee heard in March this year about an alarming lack of security screening conducted at our airports. Our airports, sorry, conducted at our, our maritime ports. Our airports are investing in state-of-the-art scanners with every crew member and passenger carefully scanned. But Morrison government officials have confirmed there are no x-ray machines, no metal detectors, and no bag checks at our maritime ports. The Department of Home Affairs also confirmed that foreign crew members can be left to wander through highly sensitive areas of ports without physical escorts accompanying them every step of the way. I've previously spoken about the frightening case of Captain Salas and the Sage Sagittarius, who was provided with a maritime crew visa in 2015 and 16 to sail into Australian waters. Despite Australian authorities knowing he was linked to three suspicious deaths in 2012 and had admitted to being a gun runner. Despite all of that, Captain Salas was granted a maritime crew visa, which allowed him to work in Australia for a whole eight months. I could go on and on. I could speak about the gaps in the temporary licensing regime where foreign vessels flagrantly flout Australia's laws. I could speed, speak about how flag of convenience vessels have wreaked havoc internationally, used by Al-Qaeda, North Korea, people smugglers, and more. There are simply too many examples of the risks posed by a lack of oversight of flag of convenience vessels. I could speak about how in 2017, the then Department of Immigration and Border Security advised this Senate that the regulation, rules, and practices at our maritime ports allowed for flag of convenience vessels and foreign crew to undertake illegal activities. Drug smuggling, gun running, and more. 2017, this chamber is warned by the Department of Immigration and Border Security that there are risks of foreign ships and foreign crew conducting illegal activities through our maritime ports. And in the four years since, has this government, this liberal government, done one thing to increase the security and manage the risks at our maritime ports when it comes to foreign crew and foreign flag vessels? No, they have not. And that is why this bill today is before this Senate. Where the government has failed, it is up to the Senate to step in and to provide an appropriate security clearance process for foreign crew on flag of convenience vessels. They had their chance last week with the transport security bill. They were provided, they have been had their chance now for some five years to fix up the gaping holes, the big gaping holes at our maritime ports, and they have failed to do so. It brings me no joy, Madam Deputy President, to bring this bill before the Senate. I would have preferred that the government tackle this problem. I would have preferred that the government amended their own transport security legislation last week. I would have preferred that the government had listened to the advice of our national security agencies, including the Department of Immigration and Border Security. They have not, so it's up to the Senate now to take action. I will conclude on this point. Australia's border security has a huge, big, gaping hole in it 
at our maritime ports. It has been there for too long. A hole that organized crime is using to target and, and import illegal drugs into Australia. It's quite clear the Liberals don't want us to think or know about this gaping hole in our border security. This is probably why Mr. Morrison jumped into the AFP's press conference. Obsessed with the photo opportunity, Mr. Morrison wants you to think he's doing everything he can to stop drugs pouring into this country. But Australians are quickly learning that Mr. Morrison is all about himself and he doesn't really care about them. When things go right, he is the first to take credit. When things go wrong, he refuses to take charge. Well, if Mr. Morrison will not take charge, the Senate can. We must do everything we can to improve our border security, to stop illegal drug imports, to stop illegal weapon imports, to stop human trafficking, and to keep Australia and Australians safe. That is Labor's commitment to the people of Australia. That is why we have brought this bill before the Senate. That is what this bill will do. And I look forward to the debate and seek the support of the members of this Senate to fix this great big gaping hole in our maritime border security. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. It's my pleasure to rise and speak on uh, this private senator's bill. And I want to start by reiterating <laughs> that this government has always been resolutely committed to the security of Australia's borders and the safety of all Australians. In particular, we are committed to safeguarding our ports and maritime transport. As Operation Ironside demonstrated, we know that serious and organised criminals use our airports and seaports as transit points to import weapons, illicit drugs and other harmful goods into Australia. This kind of trafficking, Madam Deputy President, puts everyone at risk. It puts Australia's security at risk and it puts Australia's prosperity at risk. It ravages our communities and it costs this country over $47 billion every year. And on the point that Senator Keneally has raised about Operation Ironside, what a pity Senator Keneally was not able to focus on the fine work of the Australian Federal Police rather than engage in a personal slanging match targeted towards the Prime Minister. Not only did her, her contribution reflect on the Prime Minister, it reflected on the independence of the operations of the AAP, AFP. And, Madam Deputy President, uh, I want to commend the AFP for the outstanding work that it has done on Operation Ironside. Uh, it has been extraordinary work, and, uh, which has resulted in more than 100 people being charged and uh, incredible seizure of, of um, guns and other illegal materials and, of course, a very big international operation, including in concert with the FBI. So what a shame that Senator Keneally was not able to speak about the fine work of the AFP, one of the most extraordinary criminal investigations we have seen by the AFP, which has resulted in incredible results in upholding law enforcement. Our government's focus on the security of Australia's borders is why we have passed the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020, which strengthens our current aviation and maritime security identification card schemes, the ASIC and MSIC, by ensuring those with serious criminal convictions or links to organised crime do not exploit these schemes to access secure areas of airports, seaports and offshore facilities. Australia's aviation and maritime security identification card schemes are a vital part of our effort to, to curtail the risk of our transport network being used by criminals. People who hold ASIC or MSIC cards are able to access the most secure areas of Australia's airports and seaports and remain there unmonitored. We know that over 200 people who hold ASIC or MSIC cards have already been identified 
by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission as having links to organised crime gangs and other criminal associations. These criminals use the access granted by their ASIC or MSIC cards to facilitate the trafficking of vast quantities of illegal goods through our airports and seaports. Through their hands, rivers of drugs and weapons flow into this country unchecked. This exploitation of our law and of all Australians must stop. The government's bill strengthens our defences against organised crime by requiring that background checks for ASIC and MSIC cardholders. And they, those background checks, of course, will determine if applicants have a criminal history and, of course, will harmonise the eligibility criteria under each scheme. This is essential that those accessing and working in the most sensitive areas of our airports and seaports are people of good character. We must be able to trust them to do their job without fearing that they may be involved in serious criminal activity. Such activity harms us all, and this government will not stand for it. Australians deserve to be kept safe from the machinations of organised crime syndicates. The government's bill is a strong step towards that worthy aim. But what does Labor propose? Labor wants to split the maritime crew visa class into two separate classes, one that mirrors the current maritime crew visa and another, an international seafarer's work visa, which is specifically for crews of ships under temporary licence to undertake coastal voyages under the Coastal Trading Act. Labor wants to establish a legislative requirement that applicants for the coastal trading visa class be subject to scrutiny, to subject to security and criminal history checks consistent with the MSIC requirements prescribed in the Maritime Transport and Offshore Facilities Security Regulations 2003. As we have come to expect from this opposition, Labor's proposal muddies the waters. It is shallow, it is ill-conceived and it is wasteful. All maritime crew visa applicants are required to meet prescribed public interest criteria regarding their, criteria, um, their character. This includes a criminal history and a national security check. If a new visa subclass were introduced as Labor is proposing, it is very likely that applicants for that subclass would be subject to the same public interest criteria that apply to maritime crew visas generally. Moreover, if we're worried about potential security breaches, international crew who require unmonitored access to maritime security zones are already required to obtain an MSIC card. Accordingly, these crew members are already subject to appropriate identity, criminal history and national security checks as part of that process. Labor's proposal is wasteful and unnecessary. There is no reason to introduce a completely new subclass of visa merely to duplicate a screening process which is already in place. If Labor's proposal was merely wasteful, perhaps we wouldn't bat an eyelid. After all, wastefulness is par for the course for this opposition. But here, Labor seems to be discontent with mere wastefulness. It goes much further. Under Labor's proposed changes, all crew on cruise ships with a coastal trading licence will need to meet MSIC requirements whether or not they need to access maritime security zones. This means serving staff would need to undergo a national security check to serve you um, dinner. Dishwashers would need to have their criminal history checked before working in the kitchen late that night or doing what other, whatever other work is required. This is clearly ridiculous. So ridiculous, in fact, that we might wonder if there is a hidden agenda here. What is Labor's real purpose in proposing such a nonsensical amendment? Its purpose is to kill the government's Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill. Labor has done this before. It used this bill to move amendments to the Migration Act, which would have rendered the government's transport security legislation inoperative. The effect of Labor's amendments would be that if the new Maritime Crew Visas Bill were not to commence, the government's transport security amendment would not commence either. 
Of course, given that Labor's bill is a private member's bill, uh, there is obviously little chance that it would pass the House of Representatives and come into effect, and, and Labor well knows this. Labor has proposed this bill with only one thing in mind. The purpose of this bill is to render void the government's strengthened ASIC and M6 schemes. Its purpose is to undermine government legislation that actually bolsters Australia's national security and protects Australians from organised crime. This bill is a cheap trick to stall the government's genuine and effective legisl legislative defence of our national security. Organised crime is a scourge on this great nation. From the shadows, criminal gangs work tirelessly using Australia's transport network to import illicit drugs, weapons and other harmful goods into Australia. These criminals do not care for the good of Australia or Australians. Any delay or disruption to the government's transport security legislation just increases the risk that Australians will be harmed by organised crime. So I reject Labor's time-wasting, ridiculous bill, and I ask whose side is Labor on? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Mi Migration Amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill 2020. And we Greens actually think this is a very important contribution that the Ma Labor Party has made on this issue. And so Labor and the Greens are on the side of having of Fi fixing a gaping hole in our national security that the Liberal Party seemed completely blind to, completely unable to recognise that this is a massive problem. So I'm hoping, I mean, yes, it's a private senator's bill, but surely the Liberal Party, surely the government should be able to see sense that here is a solution to part of the problem. We have this massive problem of foreign seafarers who do not have to go through the same checks, they do not have to have the same security clearances at the moment as Australian seafarers do. To us, it is just common sense. It makes sense. Um, I mean, as others contributing to this debate have noted, I mean, this bill is being introduced in the context of the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020. And although others and others have also noted that although that bill was dated 2020, it in fact incorporated key elements of a much earlier bill from 2016, which in fact passed the Senate in 2017, and 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 only a fortnight after it passed the House of Representatives. So we could have had action on this back in 2017, but the government has been dragging its feet. I mean, after that bill passed the Senate, it went back to the House, it went backwards and forwards, but the Liberal Party at that stage refused to, to pass the bill because the Liberal Party are all over the place when it comes to national security. For everything that they like to strut and talk about that this is about national security, they are not willing to act, and particularly they're not willing to act on the gaping holes that have been exposed through multiple Senate inquiries. I've been in the Senate now for almost seven years, and this issue of foreign flagged ships and, and foreign seafarers and the problems with national security has been raised multiple times. And I call upon my colleagues here to go back and have a read of some of the Hansard from those inquiries, because it is all there in black and white. And that their view of the world, that every foreign seafarer who steps um, foot on our, on our ports is followed around by somebody with an M6, that we know exactly where they are at all times, that we, there's a, you know, areas the port that are designated security zones and we've got nothing to worry about. It's not what happens in reality. And we have had that evidence presented to the Senate. It is there in black and white. And we know, we know from what happened in Geelong just a couple of weeks ago that those examples of the lack of security, it's ongoing today that you have foreign seafarers who are able to get through that security and to get their passports, and off they go into Australia. And they are the people that we know about. Then there are the ones that actually they don't have to abscond. They've just sort of got to um, you know, have some time on shore, having not um, had the security clearances that they should have. And who knows what um, arrangements they could be making when they're meeting with people sort of when, when they are here in our port cities. This happens. 
We know what happens, and yet there has been nothing that has been done to address this gaping hole in our national security. So the bill in front of us would, in fact, make a significant improvement by creating new classes of maritime crew visas, and it would create a framework that could begin to address some of these risks. But the Liberals won't act. They will not act on this, this gaping hole. And why not? Because this is not about security. I mean, um, Senator Henderson was saying this is a ridiculous bit of bill that's just going to add extra work. What it means is that, that this was in place, it would actually maybe provide some checks and balances with foreign flagged, foreign owned ships that are at the moment not just undermining our security, but they're undermining the conditions of Australian workers, they're undermining environmental controls as well. And basically, what their refusal to act is because the government is just acting right in the interests of their supporters, of their donors, of their mates. They want to keep a shipping environment that is dominated by foreign flag and foreign owned ships. They want to decimate the Australian shipping industry because the Australian shipping industry, where you actually have to pay workers a proper rate, you've got to make sure that your ships are meeting all of the environmental regulations, yeah, that actually might cost a bit more because we are not exploiting the workers. We are not exploiting the environment. These workers on uh, these foreign flag, foreign owned uh, owned ships, we know in so many cases are being employed under the most atrocious, atrocious of conditions. We know that they are being paid an absolute pittance. We know that the environmental controls on these ships are disastrous. But yeah, it means that it's cheap, isn't it? And the people, the vested interests that this government is governing in the interests of, that's all they are interested in. They just want to bring down the costs, bring down their bottom line, get away with paying their, as little as possible in their transport um, costs. That's what this is about. This is all about full bore ahead, full steam ahead for those foreign-owned, foreign-crewed, foreign-flagged vessels at the expense of the Australian shipping industry. So, the Greens are not going to be part of that. For all the government wants to talk about national security, we can see through it, and I think the Australian public can see through it too, and certainly Australian workers can see through it and know that by not supporting this bit of legislation, you are not governing in the interests of those workers. You are not governing in the interests of fairness. You are governing in the interests of your mates, of your donors, of, of your friends who just want to keep the cost down as low as possible and put as little, few barriers in their way at all. So, I mean, the Liberal government is not governing in the national interests. I mean, despite for all of, of Prime Minister Morrison's spin doctoring, they're not even governing in the interests of middle class Australians, the quiet Australians, as he likes to tell them. And you, know, you see their position on this, on this bill, and it fits with their position on so many other things. I mean, if their handling of the pandemic has shown us anything, they're, not, they're willing to hand out billions of dollars to their mates in the fossil fuel industries, but apparently not willing to pay that is, so that Australians can get the Pfizer vaccine. And instead, you know, as countries around the world are reopening um, and are vaccinating large chunks of their population and able to reopen, we're at the mercy of a leaky quarantine, hotel quarantine system that the Liberal Party have refused to take action on. They're willing to govern in the interests of their mates, to put billions of dollars in the interests of their mates, but to not take action that's actually protect, protecting the interests of ordinary Australians, whether they are Australian maritime workers or people who are in leaky hotel quarantine system. You know, so, and, and again, you know, so we've got. If the Liberal Party really cared about the national interest, if they cared about anyone, they would take action so that we actually had fair conditions for Australian workers. They'd be taking action on creating a secure, safe future by acting on the climate emergency, but they only care about their corporate donors. So you know, on this issue, like so many, why aren't they acting on this gaping hole in our national security? They are failing to act because it's not in the interest of their donors. It might cost some of their donors. Like, they've left a gaping hole and are happy to continue to leave a gaping hole in our national security system because it would cost the corporations. 
The Liberal Party, our government, should be supporting this bill. They should be taking action, and they should stop propping up their corporate donors at the expense of actual people around this country. Sorry, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you I'm very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to speak on the Migration Amendment uh, Bill 2020, the new maritime crew visas. And of course, the um, Prime Minister, as was mentioned before by Senator Keneally, the Prime Minister infamously kept a trophy in the office. And you've got to really picture this. In the proudest spot in his office is a trophy of a boat. And it said, I stopped these in thick black letters. Well, I don't think the Prime Minister could name a single accomplishment he's achieved in his office, because he certainly hasn't achieved a competent vaccine rollout, he certainly hasn't figured out a national quarantine system, and he certainly hasn't grown wages for Australia's middle class. But one thing he will always take credit for, apparently, is stopping the boats. But here's the kicker. Here's the dirty little secret the Prime Minister doesn't want you to know. The crowning achievement of the Prime Minister's career is a lie. It's a fraud. They didn't stop the boats because if you're a drug trafficker, if you're a people smuggler, if you're a terrorist, then so long as you're board a boat as a foreign crew member, it's all clear. It doesn't matter where the ship is coming from, what flag it flies. It could be a Liberian flag, it could be a Russian flag. It doesn't matter. You can apply for the maritime crew visas. And how do they operate? With as little as 24 hours notice, and they're given the tick to come in into our, across our borders. These foreign ships regularly have more than 20 foreign crew on board, and under the Morrison government, our intelligence agencies have 24 hours to vet them all. That's 24 hours. Now, the proposition would make any, a sensible person ask the following. How, how thoroughly can the Morrison government background check 20-plus foreign crew members in just 24 hours? When it takes the Morrison government up to three months to process background checks for Australian maritime workers, it's a gaping hole in our border protection. Because if you're an Australian maritime worker, you need a maritime security identification card, or MSIC. And the waiting time for one of these takes as long as three months. It takes the government three months to do background checks on a single Australian maritime worker. And the Prime Minister would have you believe he can do it for 20 foreign crews in a single day. Now, that doesn't pass the sniff, sniff, the sniff test, does it? So when confronted with these facts, what did the Morrison government do just last week? It introduced the bill to add more red tape to the approvals for processing for Australian workers and did nothing to plug the Prime Minister's huge gaping border hole. Labor even put forward amendments in good faith to fix the problem, and the government voted them down. Which brings me to the private member's bill before us today. The bill aims to ensure foreign crew are subject to proper security background checks. This bill will bring the background check requirement for foreign crews on ships with a temporary licence to engage in Australian coastal voyages. It will bring it into line with the background checks required for Australian maritime workers. And this bill will end the blatant discrimination by the Morrison government towards Australian seafarers and maritime workers. Now, here's another little secret the Prime Minister doesn't want you to know. Thirty years ago, there was 100 Australian flagged vessels. If you saw a cargo ship come into a port in Australia, there's a reasonable chance it was an Australian ship with an Australian crew, paid a fair Australian wage and complying with Australia's labour, tax laws and border requirements. Now, how many Australian vessels are here today? Just 13. 13. An Australian flag vessel is almost as rare a sight today as a Prime Minister taking accountability. As a result, the government has overseen the death of thousands of jobs across Australia. 
and has exposed Australia to a massive national security risk, our borders at risk, a risk that is compounded by foreign crews being able to waltz into Australian ports at 24 hours' notice. 24 hours, foreign crew, up to three months for Australian crews. It doesn't compute, does it? It doesn't compute unless you're being lax on border security and leaving gaping holes. The government-owned Department of Immigration and Border Protection said in 2017—and I'm pleased for those on the opposite side to answer this one, because this is the government's own Department of Immigration and Border Protection. In 2017, it said reduced transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial and ownership arrangements are factors that can make flag of convenience, flag of convenience ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organised crime or terrorist groups. So here's some quick facts about the size and scale of the Prime Minister's gaping border hole. 20,000 foreign flagships with 200,000 foreign crew, both liter literally and figuratively, sail through Australian border control each and every year, again on as little as 24 hours' notice. The Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission reports that 72 per cent of cocaine, 83 per cent of cannabis and 72 per cent amphetamine seized in 2018-19 came through our maritime ports. Last year, 18 foreign flag ships carried ammonium nitrate on Australia's coastal routes. So let's, let's look at the issue of ammonium nitrate and the fact that we've got people that have 24 hours' notice that are sitting on ammonium nitrate ships without getting proper security checks. They get flagged through. They just get, they just get the tick and they come in. Now, for those that may not be aware of what the dangers of ammonium nitrate is, Ammonium nitrate is the same material that caused a massive explosion in Beirut of last year that killed tragically more than 200 people and was heard hundreds of kilometres away. The Beirut explosion was caused by just 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate that had been seized from a Russian ship. The 18 foreign flagships that carried ammonium nitrate around Australia carried up to 6,500 tonnes each, more than double the amount in Beirut. In 2019, 85,000 tonnes of ammonium nitrate moved the port through the port of Newcastle alone. That is more than 30 times the amount that led to the Beirut explosion. And the crew carrying the material gets their maritime crew visas from the Morrison government with 24 hours' notice and without adequate security checks. The Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs heard recently that a foreign master, Captain Solace, was provided a maritime crew visa in 2015 and 2016 to sail into Australian waters, even though just three years earlier he had been investigated by the New South Wales coroner for three highly suspicious deaths on his ship and he had previously admitted to being a gun runner in Australia. Now, here is what the committee report said. In giving evidence to the coronial inquest, Captain Solace admitted that he had assaulted a crew member on several occasions and that he facilitated the purchase of guns. Captain Solace organised for crew to complete gun applications, collected money for the guns, with the guns to be collected in the Philippines, and kept a small commission for his administrative efforts. So he says. After all this, Captain Solace was granted a maritime crew visa in both 2015 and 16. Now it's very apparent that the maritime visa system, maritime crew visa system, is absolutely a joke. Just last week, two crew members of a Panamanian flagged ship, the Glorious Plumeria snuck through security at the port of Geelong. They're still at large nine days later. No, no border force, no security checks from screening, no on-time, real-time oversight. Quite clearly, the government has dropped the ball. But the thing is, we spoke about this last week. 
Here's an opportunity for the government to rectify what is a gaping hole in our border security. Now, if they didn't do the, the, Marigra, the migration amendment, new, new maritime crew visa, Bill 2020, addresses that huge gaping hole in the Morrison government's border security. By creating two categories of maritime crew visa, a transit visa for international seafarers entering Australia on a continuing international voyage, which is supposed to be the purpose of the existing visa, and a more rigorous maritime crew visa for international seafarers engaged on ships authorised under a temporary licence to undertake coastal voyages. Now, it's quite clear when you look at these lax arrangements on our borders. We see this lax arrangement when it comes to foreign crews. We see this lax arrangement when it comes to moving dangerous goods as ammonium nitrate around our coastal ports from port to port. And yet the government fails to say that those people need to be properly checked. Oh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite telling the whole truth. What they did say is that if the criminal or the terrorist applies for an ASIC or an MSIC, then they'll get the, Australian, the same Australian test that every other Australian crew member gets. What a ridiculous suggestion. What a ludicrous suggestion. What a pathetic suggestion. In actual fact, it's just demonstrating the fact that they have not got the answer on this critical question of border protection. In the, the government uh, as argues that the foreign crew do not need strongly sec strong security checks because they are under constant supervision while in port. However, the Senate Regional and Rural Affairs and Transport Committee heard evidence that there are no X-ray machines. We heard this last week. There are no metal detectors. We heard this last week. There are no bag checks. We heard that as well last week. These seafarers often just have a backpack and they're not checked. And that's border security? That is the most lax border security in this country, and the country will pay the price for what this government is failing to do. There is an opportunity to redeem themselves. Vote for the bill. Now, the Department of Home Affairs has also confirmed that although most so, some foreign vessels have more than 20 years on board, uh, more than 20 seafarers on board, all 20 sea, foreign seafarers could be left to walk through highly sensitive areas of ports simply under security camera supervision without any MSIC accredited officials physically present to escort them. Now, why that's interesting, because that was given to a Senate inquiry uh, this year, that information. So what happened at Geelong? Exactly what Paul McAleer, as I wrote out before, when he gave evidence to the same inquiry. And that is that there's gaping holes. The border security and the ABF aren't aware of those gaping holes. The government's certainly not aware of it, because otherwise they'd be filling it. And it does raise that serious question, why aren't they filling those border security um, lax arrangements? Because paymasters don't want to spend an extra amount of money and have their business pay an extra amount of money to make sure terrorists don't come into this country, to make sure Drug runners don't come in this country. Gun runners don't come in this country. Now, the Prime Minister owes Australia's maritime workers an explanation for why they should be forced to wait three months for an MSIC while foreign crew can obtain a maritime crew visa in just 24 hours. And the Prime Minister owes an explanation to the Australian people why he's keeping our borders open to terrorists drug traffickers, gun runners and people smugglers. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Migration Amendment, the new Maritime Crew Visas Bill of 2020, and why it is clear to me that this bill is not in Australia's interests and not in the interests of the maritime industry. As an island nation, Australia conducts 98 per cent of its trade through its ports. We are incredibly reliant on the maritime industry to keep us connected to the world and ensuring that our ports and maritime industry are operating as efficiently as possible. And it's of vital importance to Australia's economy 
and national security. Now, my grandfather was an ambulance driver on the wharves for most of his working life. I still remember hearing him talking around the uh, Sunday lunch table about the crime and corruption he used to see going on on those ports each and every day. And this is why I was proud to see the Transport Security Serious Crime Bill pass recently. So good, honest people like my grandfather, who work at our ports, are able to go to work every day in an environment free from crime and corruption. First and foremost, the government's role is to keep Australians safe and secure. And this government is committed to combating the impact and the influence of serious and organised crime at Australia's airports and seaports. And this is why we recently passed the Serious Crime Bill to stop corruption and crime at our ports of entry and to root out organised crime from areas of national security. Now, numerous inquiries and reports have noted that malicious individuals and organised crime groups have been exploiting weaknesses in the aviation and maritime security identification card schemes. This is why the government introduced the Serious Crime Bill, to stop serious cr criminal activity occurring at our seaports and ensure that our borders are secure. The bill that those opposite fought for days to try and stop last week. The Migration Amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill, introduced by Senator Keeley, is largely a redundant bill that only duplicates already existing security provisions and threatens to undermine the serious crime bill that recently passed through the parliament. The amendments put forward by the Labor Party will not help keep Australians safe and this bill looks to undermine the Morrison government's hard work in rooting out organised crime. Firstly, in regard to Amendment 6, 117, if the Migration Amendment Bill 2020 ever commences, the amendments made by the Serious Crime Bill will never commence. This means Australians will be less safe and less secure. This means that organised crime groups will continue to exploit weaknesses in the aviation and maritime security identification card schemes. And is Labor okay with that? Seriously? Labor okay with letting serious crime threaten our economy and our way of life? Labor's attempt to stop amendments made by the Serious Crime Bill show that they will never be tough on crime and that they don't take border security seriously. They never have. And if we can't trust Labor to take secu border security seriously, what can we trust them with? One of the many lessons that COVID-19 has taught us is that we must ensure our supply chains are free from constraint and that they are able to operate as efficiently as possible so that critical goods and services can get to where they are needed. We have seen that maritime workers are essential to our economy and without them our trade stands still. Ensuring that our maritime industry is able to operate as efficiently as possible means that our ports must be free from crime and corruption and unencumbered from unnecessary processes so that the honest, hard-working people, like my grandfather was, are able to get on with the job. However, what Labor is proposing only looks to constrain our maritime industry and place further administrative burdens on our departments. So let's have a look at the amendments proposed in this bill by Labor, what they do and why they are not in the interests of Australia's maritime industry. This bill splits the current maritime crew visa into two new categories, the International Seafarers Transit Visa, which is largely the same as the current maritime crew visa, and the International Seafarers Work Visa. Currently, all maritime crew visa applicants are already required to meet prescribed public interest criteria relating to character, including criminal history and national security. If a new visa subclass is introduced, it is more likely that the same character and national security public interest criteria would apply, and the security assessments and criminal history checks would result in potential duplication of existing visa criteria for a subset of MCV applicants creating more work for the departments 
and slower processing times for applicants. This bill requires applicants for the proposed International Seafarers Work Visa to satisfy criteria consistent with any criteria in the maritime regulations concerning security assessments and criminal history checks of an MCIC applicant. The proposed amendments attempt to link aspects of the MSEC background check to the maritime crew visa, which would be a replication of current regulatory requirements and cause unnecessary delay in the issuing of visas. As a proud member of the Liberal government, I believe in making our systems more efficient and ensuring our trade industry is as productive as possible. Unnecessary delay in granting of visas only threatens to hurt our maritime trade environment and with it our economy and economic growth. While this may not be something that Labor, the Labor Party cares about, I do as all of those on this side do, and this risk is simply unacceptable. Senator Keneally's proposal would duplicate screening processes for a cohort who already need to obtain an MSEC, and it also increases the workload of screening agencies for a cohort of crew who would only enter a security zone while monitored. If a maritime crew visa holder requires unmonitored access, to a maritime security zone, they would be required, like all individuals, to obtain an MSEC and undergo the required background check. A decision to issue a maritime crew visa already considers the individual's criminal history as a security assessment before the visa is issued. And for most MCV holders, unmonitored access to a maritime security zone occurs only to transit the onshore zones to access the ship. Generally, they do not access the security zone unescorted. The duplication of these processes is simply unnecessary and unlikely to provide any tangible benefits to increase the security of our ports and reduce organised crime groups exploiting weaknesses in the aviation and maritime security identification card schemes. When Senator, when Senator Keneally spoke on this on February 18 this year, she said, and I quote, this government has done nothing to ensure that these foreign workers are subject to robust background checking and that this legislation would, and I quote again, level the playing field to make sure that foreign workers are subject to the same kinds of background checks that hardworking Australians face. However, this is simply not true and Labor is deliberately seeking to create confusion around the issue. As noted earlier, when an applicant applies for a maritime crew visa, they are required to meet prescribed public interest criteria relating to character, including criminal history and national security. Similarly, international crew who require unmonitored access to a maritime security zone are already required to obtain an MSIC card and anyone seeing to have unescorted access to secure areas of our ports also must have an ASIC or an MSIC. There is no government requirement for Australian seafarers to hold a, an MSIC. Not only are foreign workers who apply for a maritime crew visa subject <coughs> to background checking, but this government is going one step further under proposed changes to the Coastal Trading Act. All crew on cruise ships with a coastal trading licence will need to meet AMSIC requirements. This will incorporate everyone working on the ship, including those working in the kitchen, to those working behind the bar, even though, though they are not accessing the maritime security zone. The criminal history check and security assessment elements that are required by the bill set out by Senator Keneally are simply not appropriate for international maritime crew and may delay the grant of maritime crew visas. The last thing our maritime industry needs is extended delays while they wait for visas to be approved. Further delays would be expected if this bill is supported as there are no draft regulations to support it, meaning that the department would have to prepare new regulations to be made under the Migration Act. When it comes to 
ensuring the integrity of our ports of entry and the safety and security of Australians, we can't afford delay. The Morrison government has provided targeted, effective measures to address what is a very serious issue. And the Labor Party want to delay this action and put the integrity of our ports at risk. One must ask, what is Labor actually proposing with this bill? That we make applicants undergo unnecessary processes and procedures? That we increase the financial burden of the maritime crew visa scheme? That we unnecessarily increase the load taken by our departments? This bill will only cause uncertainty and delay for industry and government, and when it comes to our borders, any level of uncertainty and delay is unacceptable. Our border security is too important to get wrong. These amendments are not being put forward to protect Australians, and anyone wishing to ensure that our borders are safe and secure should not support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this bill and uh, to speak in support of this bill. Um, you know, I also uh, supported the, the Transport Security Serious Crime Bill, but I think that uh, this, this uh, bill adds a, a proper dimension. If I go work off the logic of, of Senator Van in his uh, contribution, uh, we, we can, uh, where he's suggesting we simply uh, drop security because it might take a little bit of time. Uh, that, that's uh, hugely, hugely uh, problematic. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, your visa processing, if you care about times, why don't you care about the times that it takes to actually uh, give visas to people who want to come here and contribute uh, to Australian lifestyle? Um, you know, the, the logic that, uh, that's been put forward is, is fundamentally flawed. We need to understand that ships are very large and complex uh, machines, and uh, there's lots of working space, uh, lots of uh, places where uh, crime can be set up. Um, we, uh, it, it's an obvious place for the exploitation of criminals. On top of that, we know that Customs doesn't have the resources to screen every container coming in from another country. That's just not possible. Uh, we know that they use intelligence to work through uh, some of the uh, uh, selection process for that screening, uh, but uh, we certainly don't get every container screened. Now, of course, uh, when we're dealing with ports, there's two elements uh, to the, the uh, cargo that's transiting through the ports. There's, of course, the, um, uh, the, the off offshore parties that could be loading uh, contra contraband and also the crews uh, working uh, through, uh, throughout the journey, um, and uh, that is uh, prob problematic. So we do need to understand something about the seafarers that are on the ships that are transiting uh, our coastal regions. There have been a whole bunch of recent events uh, in relation to criminal activity, and I won't go uh, to, through them um, uh, be, because, of, because of time. but. Uh, um, one of the problems we've got is that, uh, uh, and this, this has been quite typical of uh, what I've seen often coming from the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party says we want a free market, we want to make everything easy, uh, but then they, on, on Australian companies, uh, we load up requirements like uh, le you know, leave loadings and, and uh, super and uh, uh, long service leave and occupational health and safety standards and, and environmental standards, quality standards, and then we say, let's look over here and buy stuff over here because it's cheaper. And we're doing the same thing on coastal shipping. Coastal shipping, uh, shipping in Australia has been decimated as a result of these disproportionate measures that are applied. And this is an, another good example of what's happening here. We've got Australian industry having to run through the hoops in order to make us safe. And then we drop the ball on the international uh, component, and uh, of course that makes it cheaper uh, for them, you know, along with their vessels that may not be uh, to the same standards as the 13 ships that we have uh, flagged uh, with uh, uh, the Australian national flag um, or the merchant flag. We've got all these ships running around with uh, with, with varying different standards, and again with crew that are, are simply not. Um, 
that are simply not uh, properly screened, and that is, uh, that is hugely problematic. Um, particularly in circumstances because of the, de the, the uh, destruction of our coastal shipping, uh, we've got more and more foreign ships ploughing through our waters. More and more of these people coming into uh, Australia's maritime jurisdiction uh, that have not been uh, checked in the same way uh, to the same standards that we check Australian workers. Um, and that is, uh, that is hugely uh, problematic. Um, we do not want to have a situation where we have a difference in the way we assess the security risks of foreign workers compared to the Australian maritime workers. Risk is risk, and you have to deal with it. You don't say, well, it's going to take too much time to deal with our security risks. We're only going to apply that to the Australians and not to the uh, international seafarers. It does, doesn't make sense. I mean, ultimately, what we should be doing is restoring our, our, uh, uh, our Australian merchant shipping fleet. We need to be building a capability. Now, we're going to be talking about fuel security a little bit later during the day. If we get to the end of 2027 or 2030 and we don't have any refineries, we're going to have to wean ourselves, I think it's inevitable anyway, off these fossil fuels. Um, uh, one of the ways to do that is to have more efficient uh, transport, and that may well be coastal shipping, and it ought to have an Australian flag at the back of any ship that is ploughing through our waters. That ought to be the goal of government, not to try and make it easier for the, uh, for the foreign entities to, uh, to, to carry out that business. So uh, I will be supporting uh, this bill. Uh, this bill is a good bill. Um, and, uh, uh, Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Clark. General Business Order of the Day, number 72, COAG Reform Fund Amendment, No Electric Vehicle Taxes Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I'm really pleased to be rising today to speak to my No Electric Vehicle Taxes Bill which aims to neutralise the impact of discriminatory taxes against electric vehicles, such as the one that has just been introduced by the Victorian government, which has been described as the worst electric vehicle policy in the world. And hopefully, that if this bill is passed through the Senate, it would ward off other states and territories thinking about going along the same misguided route. We need to be supporting electric vehicles, and in this place we need to be doing everything we can. The government has been missing in action, so it's up to us to be doing what we can to actually be supporting electric vehicles and to be supporting the state and territory governments to be encouraging the uptake of electric vehicles. I went for a drive in an electric vehicle this morning. It, um, with Daniel Blakely. And Daniel's an electric vehicle campaigner, and he took me out for a ride in his Tesla. And Daniel is famous for taking his Tesla to different places. He's been driving around the country and for letting people get behind the wheel of his Tesla, which I did this morning. I understand Senator Patrick is going to be um, taking a drive with him tomorrow. A very practical demonstration of how great electric vehicles can be and exactly what our government, what the Liberal and the National Party are holding us back from. I mean, I'm not a rev head. My approach to cars is that they are vehicles that get you from A to B. But I enjoyed my ride this morning. It was a very nice car to drive and a lot of oomph when you put your foot down. But the reason why Daniel Blakely and I are equally passionate advocates for electric vehicles is because shifting our private passenger transport to zero carbon vehicles as quickly as possible is incredibly important. Daniel grew up in coal country in Queensland, and in fact his, some members of his family are still very big advocates for the ongoing coal industry, so he knows the reality of the fossil fuel industry in Australia. But he learned about the climate crisis and he decided that he needed to do something practical and be part of the shift to a zero carbon society as soon as possible so that we can be getting out of doing the mining of coal and gas and oil and Australia can be playing its part, its role in shifting the world 
to a pollution-free, safe climate future. He's very aware of what the, the issues are, what the challenges are, how we need to be supporting Australians, ordinary working Australians in the transition. And that's the beauty about electric vehicles. They enable us to do that. A couple of things that in our conversation this morning as we are driving around that Daniel shared with me. One, of course, is the ongoing issue that people seem to have with electric vehicles is range anxiety. I couldn't possibly drive an electric vehicle because I've got to drive long distances. And in fact, he, he mentioned the fact that this is an excuse that Angus Taylor, the Minister for Energy, um, has recently trotted out as to why he couldn't possibly have an electric vehicle. He told me that Angus Taylor, actually, his office is 300 metres from an electric vehicle charger. And that the current charges, you can get a charge of your vehicle for 400 kilometres in about 20 minutes. So range anxiety, basically, how far can you go in an electric vehicle before you need to charge? How long is your bladder going to last out? You've actually got to stop for a wee. You stop for a wee and 20 minutes later, your car can be charged up with 400 metres ready to go. The other thing that Daniel um, that we talked about this morning is how much having a rollout of electric vehicles is going to improve the health of our cities. So much of the pollution in our cities comes from the pollution from petrol and diesel, and particularly diesel. There is no safe level limit for diesel pollution. Every diesel particular, particulate is carcinogenic. It causes cancer. If we shift to electric vehicles and get that transition happening, we are going to have massive improvements in the health of our cities. And in fact, he told me about how the, the air quality in Oslo, with their uptake of electric vehicles, has improved dramatically over the last 10 years. So look, it would be really good if I didn't have to be introducing this bill today. It would be really good if we had a federal government that was actually showing some leadership and recognising that electric vehicles are so critical that we need to be taking every action we possibly can to be incentivising their uptake. And it would be so good because this government, by failing to take a leadership role, that is what's leading to states and territory governments deciding they've got to go out on their own. I mean, we know, however, that the approach that the Victorian government is taking is, as I said, it's been described as the worst electric vehicle policy in the world. We know that it's going to stymie the uptake of electric vehicles by putting a discriminatory tax on electric vehicles. The argument that the proponents say is that, oh well, electric vehicles, they're not paying fuel excise, so therefore that they should be paying this extra road user charge to make up for that. What I want to tell people is just to look at the numbers of, in fact, what electric vehicle owners are already paying. Because at the moment, out of the goodness of their hearts, because they want to be part of the shift to zero carbon transport, they are paying, on average, an extra twenty to thirty thousand dollars for their electric vehicle compared to the equivalent internal combustion vehicle. By doing that, by paying that extra twenty to thirty thousand dollars, they are paying more in stamp duty, more in GST, that adds up to it's about the equivalent of five years of fuel excise. So they are already more than paying their way. Five years worth of paying their way. I mean, come back to me in five years' time. Come back to me in when electric vehicles are actually up to the, around the 20 or 30 per cent mark, and then let's have a conversation about road, road user charges to replace fuel excise. I mean, let's start planning that now. Let's do the work. Let's work out what is an appropriate regime of road user charging that's going to be fair equitable, sustainable, encouraging the type of transport that we want to be encouraging, that's not going to be discouraging also people from using public transport. Absolutely, let's be having that discussion and work out what is the road user charge that, that I agree probably is going to be introduced in the future, but let's do it properly. Let's not impose discriminatory charges like the Victorian government is doing. And we need to do everything we can here at a federal level to be stopping the states and territories from imposing those charges. So what my bill does, it basically neutralises the revenue that would be raised by these discriminatory taxes. It would mean that every dollar that is raised by, for example, the Victorian government, that that's a dollar that that state doesn't get from the federal government in terms of the grants to the states and territories. 
and for every dollar that the Victorian government doesn't get, that we redistribute that money to other states and territories. It's a carrot and stick approach. The stick to the Victorian government and other governments are doing the same thing, and the carrot that we give extra, extra money to the states and territories to encourage them, encourage them to be taking action, to encourage them, for example, to be putting the money into the rollout of fast charges. So that's, that's the, the, the nut, the nub of this bill. The other reason I want what I really wanted to talk about today is why does it matter? Why does it matter that we shift our fleet of passenger vehicles to electric vehicles, to zero carbon polluting electric vehicles as quickly as possible, side by side with changing our energy generation to be 100 per cent renewable as well? It matters because transport is now almost 20 per cent of Australia's carbon pollution. And it's the fastest growing area of pollution in Australian society and economy. This matters because Australia needs to be playing its part in tackling the climate crisis. Not only is this government failing us on the shift to electric vehicles, we know that they are totally failing us on doing anything else with shifting our society, shifting our economy to a zero carbon future. This matters because we are in a climate crisis. We are facing a future where global average temperatures are going to be three, four, even more degrees above what is safe for humanity and the rest of life on this planet. And I just want to remind people what this means. If we reach a future where we are three or four degrees higher than, than um, pre-industrial temperatures, it means no more growing wheat in Australia or pretty much anything else in the areas that are currently our agricultural, major agricultural production zones. It means metres of, level, of sea level rise, flooding cities and towns where millions of Australians currently live. It means wildfires that if you find, I find it hard to believe, but it means wildfires that are more extreme, hotter, more frequent, with over a longer fire season than we had in 2019-20. So it means thousands of properties being destroyed. It means uh, undoubtedly many, many Australians dying, whether it's from the fires or whether it's from the heat. It means uncountable numbers of plants and animals across the world going extinct. It means billions of people around the world who will be climate refugees, homeless without a, play, a way to feed themselves and looking to find anywhere on the planet where they can possibly survive. And it will mean billions of people absolutely living wretched lives, struggling to survive. It basically sounds really, really, really bad. I mean, this is what the science is telling us. This is not you know, over the top. This is not extremism. This is what science is telling us. This is what we need to listen to. This is why we need to take urgent action to reduce our carbon pollution to zero as quickly as possible. There is no time left for delay or for half measures. I mean, other countries around the world have accepted the challenge. We've just had the G7. Where, remind, let me remind you what the G7 agreed to just over a week ago. They agreed that they would halve their collective carbon pollution from 2005 levels by 2030. That's in nine years' time. That they would end fossil fuel subsidies by 2025, and they would achieve overwhelmingly decarbonised power set systems in the 2030s. Australia needs to be up to the challenge as well. And the thing with electric vehicles is that they are a technology that we know we can literally be rolling out on the roads today, and other countries are doing it. In the UK, they have got a commitment to have the, a ban on sales of polluting internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030. Norway, similarly, Norway is now 20 per cent of their fleet is electric vehicles. 75 per cent of all new sales are electric. This is being rolled out around the world. It, Australia could be part of this electric vehicle revolution. But no, we are laggards. We have got less than 1 per cent of our fleet being electric vehicles. We're being left behind. And of course, the, industri the opportunities for workers, the opportunities for industry, the opportunities for growth in manufacturing of electric vehicles or components or batteries, we're being left behind in that as well. So uh, internal combustion 
um, engine vehicles have got no place in a future where we need to be shifting to zero carbon as quickly as possible. Shifting to electric vehicles is a practical, easy response to address a huge part of our carbon transport pollution. And this, I mean, it's, it should not be about party politics. As I said, I've just quoted what the UK government are doing. They are a conservative government, led by Boris Johnson. The Norwegian government is a conservative government. We could be doing the same here. This should not be an issue of party politics. It's a matter of common sense. It's a matter of our common humanity. It's a matter of us working together to do what we can to be creating a safe future for us and our children. And of course, another example of why it's not an issue of party politics is the announcement over the weekend from the New South Wales government. That's a Liberal government, and they announced a new major electric vehicle policy. And so, I mean, I'll come to the detail of that in a minute, but what it does, it, it highlights the, the devastating inaction and the refusal to act that we've seen from the Liberal government at a Commonwealth level. So we've got the, the New South Wales government. I mean, basically, what they've asked, what they have proposed, is subsidies of $3,000 for 25,000 new cars, waiving stamp duty for new and second-hand electric vehicles, $171 million in charging infrastructure, and access to priority lanes for EV drivers. And in particular, on the issue of a road user charge, what they've said is, well, when the number of electric vehicles gets to 30 per cent, or in six years' time, well, then we will consider it. This is exactly the sort of um, way forward that should be being coordinated at a federal level. I mean, it's crazy to have a different system of road user charges right around the country. Nobody wants to see that. We need federal leadership and we need support from the Labor Party as well. We need both the Labor and the Liberal Party to put their money where their mouth is. If they say they're concerned about climate pollution, to do something about it, about carbon pollution, to do something about it. And I call upon, I mean, I'm not sure whether the Labor Party are in support of this bill, and I urge them to be so, because it's an opportunity to put your votes where your values are. If you say you want action on climate, here is an opportunity to be doing something about it, to be actually acting to be reducing our carbon pollution and creating that safe future for us all. Whip. Um, Chair, I just want to draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Calling for quorum. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Too late, mate. Too late. <laughs> Quorum present. <laughs> Senator Henderson, you have the call. Thank you very much. Madam Acting Deputy President, it's my pleasure to rise and speak on the COAG Reform Fund Amendment. No Electric Vehicle Taxes Bill 2020, and I say it's my pleasure. Uh, this is a 
a bill that the government does not support uh, because we consider it to be piecemeal and not in the national interest. And I have to say that I'm really uh, disappointed that Senator Rice didn't mention any of the very substantial incentives announced by the New South Wales government just yesterday in relation to uh, electric vehicles. Uh, some $490 million has been committed in the 21-22 New South Wales budget in relation to cutting taxes, incentivising uptake and reducing barriers for electric vehicle purchases. Uh, and these include a stamp duty waiver, rebates of $3,000 to be offered on private purchases of the first 25,000 eligible electric vehicles, uh, $171 million for new charging infrastructure across the state, and $33 million to help transition the New South Wales government passenger fleet to uh, electric vehicles where feasible. So, we're seeing some very good action in some states, and what, very importantly, the New South Wales government, along with the South Australian government, has deferred uh, any road user charge because uh, the Liberal governments in New South Wales and South Australia recognise uh, that it is important to have a national, nationally consistent approach where there is proper consultation across the board, and it is a shame that the Andrews Labor government has gone ahead with this tax, yet one more tax from the Andrews Labor government. So on that point, the Greens and uh, the government, the Morrison government, are in unison. Uh, we do not agree with the huge array of taxes which are being imposed, additional taxes being imposed by the Andrews Labor government. So uh, as I say, I, I, am, I do note, uh, I do note the significant difference between the New South Wales and South Australian governments with respect to a road user charge for electric vehicles and, disappointingly, the Victorian government, which is persisting with this uh, tax, which frankly is not an incentive to drive the uptake of electric vehicles in Victoria. Madam Acting Deputy President, Oh, apologies. I, I'm now seeing that there is an <laughs> acting deputy president. I've been called worse. I've been called worse. <laughs> you have been called worse. Uh, good to see you in the chair, acting deputy president. Uh, I want to reiterate that this government is committed to lowering emissions and protecting our economy, jobs, and investment. Uh, this government, despite the many attempts by Greens and the Labor to mischaracterise the efforts of our government in the many different initiatives that we are delivering to drive down emissions, to invest in our environment at, and, at the same time, to protect jobs and the strength of our economy, this government has a very strong record in meeting and beating emissions reduction targets without sacrificing the health of our economy. And in contrast to the Morrison government, we know that Labor is bitterly divided on its energy and climate policies. Bitterly, bitterly divided. They are a complete and utter mess, and the blue-collar workers, the coal mine workers and, and all other workers in the oil and gas industries in this country know they do not have many friends in the Labor Party. Their friends are in the Morrison Liberal National Government. We understand the importance of oil and gas to this economy. The key to the success has been the fact that our emissions reduction plan is driven by technology, not by taxes. It's one thing to have these lofty ideals, the rubbish that Mr Shorten took to the last election, the 50 per cent re renewable, um, re um, renewable reduction target, renewable energy target, the 45 per cent emissions reduction target, which said to every worker working in coal mines and in oil and gas and in construction and building sites that Labor had deserted these workers. Mr Fitzgibbon has it right. He's worked you mob out. And that's why Labor is such a mess when it comes to its energy and climate policies. Proudly, Australia is only one of a handful of countries which has beaten our Kyoto commitments. 
We didn't just beat them, we beat them by a very substantial 459 million tonnes. Our emissions have fallen faster than the G20 average, faster than the OECD average, and much faster than similar developed countries like Canada and New Zealand. Between 2005 and 2019, they fell by more than 15 per cent, while New Zealand's fell by only 4 per cent and Canada's barely moved at all, so our emissions fell by more than 15 per cent in contrast. The latest figures for 2020 have us at 20.1 20 per cent below 2005 levels, and we are well on our way to meeting and beating our 2030 target, which is to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 per cent below 2005 levels. As the Prime Minister has said, our target is net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. This is realistic and this is sensible. Net zero emissions is a worthy goal, but it is not one that ought to be pursued at all costs. We will not sacrifice jobs, we will not sacrifice industries in regional Australia for no benefit. We won't increase taxes with no thought on the effect of family on families and uh, businesses. Senator, se sorry, Senator Henderson. Uh, on a point of order, Senator Chagain? Uh, sorry, Chair. Not on a point of order, but I want to draw you to your attention the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Okay, ring the bells. For four minutes. Didn't you walk out? Thank you. Order. Cor quorum present. Senator Henderson. Yep. Senator Henderson. Uh, you thank you very Senator much. Henderson. Acting Deputy President, I'm sorry that Senator Giacconi saw fit to interrupt my contribution, but I am very pleased to—I think there is a bit of uh, disruption that Labor senators are imposing on the chamber. but. Nevertheless, I will continue. As I was saying, technology, not taxes, is the way to go. Australians are practical people, and this is no more apparent than in the context of technological adoption and adaptation. Australia's experience has always been that when new technologies become economically viable, businesses and households rush to adopt them. And we can see this happening right now with the adoption of renewables in Australia at 10 times the global average. Ten times the global average, the adoption of renewable technology is happening in this country, and it is happening under the Morrison government. Four times higher than Japan, the US and Europe. We now have the highest solar capacity per person in the world. What an achievement! That's why we have developed our technology investment roadmap. It is a comprehensive plan to invest in the technologies that we need to continue to bring emissions down here and around the world, driven by the most incredible investment in renewables happening here on the watch of Prime Minister Morrison and under the leadership 
of the Morrison Liberal Joyce. National Government. Our investment is, is accelerating technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, soil carbon measurement, low carbon materials like steel and aluminium, and long duration energy storage. Getting these technologies right will support 160,000 new jobs by 2030 and maintain Australia's position as a world leading exporter of food, fibre, minerals, and energy. Widespread global deployment of those technologies will reduce emissions or eliminate them in sectors responsible for 90 per cent of the world's emission, some 45 billion tonnes. So this is about setting practical goals for the technologies which offer the most abatement potential where Australia has real advantage. And of course, the government is also driving investment into consumer choice when it comes to new vehicle and fuel technologies. We have already committed around $1.4 billion to help increase the uptake of low and zero emissions vehicle technologies, including over $74 million through the Morrison government's future fuels package. This is proactive investment in future fuels, in future technologies for vehicles in this country. The Future Fuels Fund is the centrepiece. It will enable businesses to start integrating new vehicle technologies into their fleets and address flat spots in public charging or refuelling infrastructure. We are developing a future fuel strategy that considers all of these new technologies, not just in relation to electric vehicles. This includes hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, hybrids and biofuels to support fuel consumer choice. We've released a discussion paper for consultation to help inform our final strategy and shape the design and rollout of our investment programs. The strategy will be finalised later this year once this feedback process is complete. Australians are already making the choice to switch to new technologies, such as hybrids. Hybrid sales have almost doubled in the last year. Hybrids also have immediate emissions reductions benefits are uh, even over battery electric vehicles across many parts of Australia. In contrast to the Morrison government's integrated national plan, this bill from the Greens is, as I mentioned before, a piecemeal measure which will do little to provide the taxpayer with value for money. To bridge the gap over the 10-year lifespan of an electric vehicle purchased today would cost between an estimated $195 and $747 per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent. To put that into some perspective, the emissions reduction fund price is $16 per tonne. So this bill, if, if it would, um, was ever to be implemented, would add yet another set of rules to an already dizzying number of local and state regulations uh, that do nothing to um, add to what is incredibly important in this sector, and that is national consistency. Uh, we do not need more piecemeal regulations across different states and territories. Regrettably, this bill does not facilitate a nationally coordinated strategy for electric vehicles. It does not solve any problems that are not already being solved by the government's future fuels package and the future fuels fund. It creates more red tape for local and state governments and delivers no value for Australian taxpayers. So with this bill, the Greens uh, rush, without pausing to consider some of these bigger issues at a national interest level. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, bill, the Greens have not considered uh, the better alternatives, including, I think, a lost opportunity to provide for a nationally coordinated strategy. And so this is very much legislation on the fly. Um, it may be good enough for the Greens, but it's certainly not good enough for this government, and it is certainly not good enough for Australian taxpayers. When it comes to effective emissions reduction legislation driven by incredible investment in renewable technologies in this country, what we need is the Morrison government's nationally coordinated scheme uh, not the piecemeal approach of the Greens, and for these reasons I do not commend this bill to the Senate.
Thank you. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr um, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, <coughs> I seek to uh, make some comments about this, uh, this proposed uh, legislation. And we know that um, Australians will need to transition to cleaner forms of transportation if we are to make meaningful reductions in our carbon emissions and avert the worst effects of climate change. Transport emissions make up 18 per cent of Australia's total greenhouse gas emissions. This makes transport the third largest sector by emissions, also the fastest growing source of emissions. Although transport emissions dropped during COVID, they have rebounded quickly as movement restrictions ease. Based on the latest figures, passenger motor vehicle emissions make up 55 per cent of road transport emissions and 8 per cent of total Australian emissions. Uh, Australia needs to change this. In the first instance, this means prioritising active transport like walking and cycling, something I know you're very interested in, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, and where possible, making the collective uh, investments needed for mass public transport to be a realistic option for Australians who are travelling to work, school or the shops but cleaner, low emissions private vehicles will also have to be part of the solution. And unfortunately, Australia lags the world in the take-up of electric vehicles. In 2020, there were almost a million cars sold in Australia and just uh, 6,900 of them were electric. That's a market penetration of barely 0.7% compared to the, uh, the global average of a little over 4% more than 6 per cent in China, around 11 per cent in the UK and the EU, and almost 75 per cent in Nor Norway, which is the world leader. The problem isn't just that we have um, a low rate of EV use in Australia, it's also that there's barely any growth as well. Electric vehicles tripled their market share in the EU and the UK from 2019 to 2020, and in Australia, 6,700 sold in 2019 and 9,900 sold in 2020, a growth rate of less than 3 per cent. As a result, there are just 20,000 registered electric vehicles on Australian roads. This isn't because Australians don't want to drive electric vehicles. Surveys show that a majority of Australians would consider buying an electric vehicle as their next car. So what's the problem? Well, 50 per cent of those same poll respondents say that the purchase cost of an electric vehicle is one of the main reasons stopping them from purchasing one. There are no cheap electric vehicles for sale in Australia. Precisely zero new models are sold for less than $40,000. There are just five models available for less than $60,000. In the United Kingdom, by contrast, there are 26 models in that price range. Uh, this, of course, is the government's fault. So what went wrong? The truth is that one of the greatest impediments to widespread take-up of electric cars in this country has been the coalition government. They've done absolutely nothing to develop local manufacturing capacity. In fact, they gutted it uh, years ago, as we saw with uh, Holden's and, um, and Toyota. <coughs> A very disgraceful period in Australia's uh, history, Mr Acting Deputy President. This was a government that uh, cut financial support and dared Australia's last remaining automotive manufacturers to leave the country. The consequences of that decision didn't just end with Holden. They ricocheted through the automotive supply chains from Adelaide to Melbourne. They were the death of countless small and medium manufacturing and industrial firms, and they ended the working lives of <coughs> thousands of hard-working Australians, particularly in my home state, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President who had jobs they enjoyed and were proud of. Um, and that was for petrol vehicles. The government's record on electric vehicles is much worse. Just last year, Renault pulled its Zoe EV model from Australia, citing a lack of government support. <coughs> There's a lot that could have been done to encourage electric vehicles, provided sub subsidies <coughs> for the development of charging stations, making it easier to import EVs adjust policy settings <coughs> to support their take-up and use. We can even look at manufacturing some components onshore. 
Currently, Australia produces nine of the ten minerals required for the lithium-ion batteries, <coughs> but largely sends these overseas as raw materials. We have a competitive advantage to value-add to these resources and create processing and manufacturing jobs for EV components, especially batteries. But it's hard to do that when we have barely any electric vehicles on the road. The government could have provided support and incentive for local manufacturing capacity. The government has instead done next to nothing. And this is because this government is paralysed on climate change. After eight years of government, they still don't have any energy policy. Depending on the outcome of yet another <coughs> leadership challenge in the nationals, and I think at this point we do know that uh, Mr Barnaby Joyce has been uh, <coughs> elected as the new leader of the National Party and therefore under the conventions becomes the uh, again the Deputy uh, uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of Australia. <coughs> this government is uninterested in uh, climate change as an issue unless they can weaponise it as part of a culture war. Let's not forget that it was uh, the government who ran a scare campaign last election threatening that the introduction of electric vehicles would end the weekend a claim that was uh, shameless as it was untrue. The tragedy is that the uh, energy policy which uh, prioritised Australia's future energy needs uh, would see our government investing in renewables and, st and storage, creating new industries and new jobs while, whilst lowering power bills for Australian families. But in the same way, a government which was uh, <coughs> serious about reducing Australia's transport emissions would support the uptake of electric vehicles that are cheaper for families to run over the long term, which is why Labor has committed to developing Australia's first national electric vehicle strategy. Labor will cut taxes on non-luxury electric vehicles, including import taxes and fringe benefit, benefits tax, to give people a choice and ensure that more Australians who want electric cars can afford them. Labor will cut uh, government taxes on non-luxury electric vehicles, including import taxes, um, to give um, Australians a choice. By reducing upfront costs, <coughs> Labor's electric car discount will encourage uptake, cutting fuel and transport costs for households and reducing emissions at the same time. Labor's electric car discount will encourage car makers to supply more affordable electric vehicles to Australia which will in turn increase competition, drive down price and give consumers more choice. Labor will pursue policy settings to encourage Australian manufacturing of EV components and consider leveraging existing Commonwealth investments in its fleet and infrastructure spend to increase electric vehicle stock. Unfortunately, unlike Labor's policy proposals, this bill will not make a meaningful impact on electric vehicle take-up by ordinary Australians. This bill seeks to uh, disincentivise taxes or charges on the purchase and use of electric vehicles by states and territory. Well, this may <coughs> seem like a good idea, uh, given all I've just said about the electric vehicle market in Australia. The truth, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, is far more complicated. Australian jurisdictions have developed me mechanisms for funding the construction and maintenance of roads and other infrastructure, which assume that most private vehicles are fuelled by petrol. As Australians transition away from uh, petrol vehicles to electric vehicles, taxes like fuel excise will deliver less. Governments will need to transition towards new models of funding road infrastructure, and it's likely that some of these models will include a capacity to recognise the impact of uh, electric vehicles, like all vehicles, uh, have on our roads, bridges and tunnels. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Our aim should be to ensure that our policy settings as a whole support the use of electric vehicles, not that use of electric vehicles should be, for all intents and purposes, free. Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, this bill is a blunt instrument. The measures in the bill would adjust the formula for allocating GST revenue between states and territories to neutralise the effect of any tax, levy or charge imposed on electric vehicles, but not on other vehicles. Where a state or territory sought to impose such a tax, the benefit of that uh, would be neutralised through a reduction in the proportion of GST revenue they would receive. This would be redirected to other states in the normal manner. COVID-19 has seen a significant decline in GST revenues for the states 
at the same time as there is an increased demand for critical services, especially in the health sector. The distribution of GST revenue is generally set by the Independent Commonwealth Grants Commission. <coughs> Adjustments to the GST formula are very rarely made and particularly not to penalise states for using their potential heads of revenue. Changes to the GST formula need to be careful consideration and consultation. Australia needs to support our electric vehicle market. Unfortunately, this bill isn't the way to do that, Mr Acting Deputy President. What we need is the Morrison government and its predecessors have failed to do a real and comprehensive plan to lower the cost of vehicles, encourage a greater range of models to be imported, build the infrastructure needed to support them and grow Australia's local manufacturing capability. That's why Labor is proud to stand behind our electric vehicles policy. Thank you, Senator Merrill. Uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr De Acting Deputy President, I move the question now be put. Well, the question is that the motion moved uh, now be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. No ayes have it. We are a division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. The question we put. Thank you.
Lock the doors. The question is that the question be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Dean Smith. Tell off the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 42, noes 20. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the motion that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt, tell off the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell off the noes.
The result of the division is eyes 10 and noes 41. The question is resolved in the negative. Clark. General business order of the day number 76, Snowy Hydro Corporatisation Amendment, No New Fossil Fuels Bill 2021, number two, second reading debate. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. Now I rise to speak on the Snowy Hydro Corporatisation Amendment, No New Fossil Fuels Bill 2021. We shouldn't have to be introducing this bill today, but we do because in the middle of a climate emergency, the government announced that it will use public money to back a fossil fuel project that will make the climate crisis worse, at the same time as slowing down investment in renewables. Now, not one single energy analyst says that we need to build this white elephant. It will lose taxpayers' money, it will slow the transition to renewables, it will create even more market uncertainty, it will enrich a Liberal donor who owns the land, and it will drive up energy prices. That is quite the combination of bad outcomes in just one decision. Now, the government only wants to build this because Minister Taylor wants to enrich his gas donors, mainly Santos, whose Narrabri gas field would supply the gas should that field ever be fracked, and over the proverbial dead bodies of the traditional owners would that occur. The energy in industry pointedly refused to waste their own money on a gas plant, um, and yet this is a gas-fired power station. Gas is a fossil fuel. Any new fossil fuels are locking us in for catastrophic climate impacts. The Climate Council says it best, and I quote, building a government-owned gas power station in the middle of a climate crisis is the equivalent of asking the Australian public to jump onto a sinking ship without a safety raft." End quote. Now, this bill would stop that public money being wasted on a new fossil fuel gas fire power plant. This bill would prohibit Snowy Hydro from developing, constructing or being involved in the development or construction of new fossil fuel-based uh, electricity generation capacity. It would prevent Snowy Hydro from acquiring, purchasing or otherwise investing in or being involved in acquiring, purchasing or investing in new fossil fuel-based electricity generation capacity. And it would prohibit Snowy Hydro from operating or being involved in the operation of new fossil fuel-based electricity generation capacity. This bill would stop more public money being thrown at irresponsible fossil fuel projects that the market doesn't support, that experts have denounced and that the climate and future generations cannot afford. This bill explicitly does not deal with the fossil fuel assets that Snowy Hydro already owns. We do have to deal with that, and we know we need to wind down our existing fossil fuel generation capacity whilst transitioning uh, those workers into jobs that have a long-term sustainable future. The Greens have a clear position on this. The transition to 100 per cent renewables needs to be completed in the next decade. If Australia is to do its fair share of limiting global heating to one and a half degrees Celsius in the next decade, um, this bill also would not impact on the ongoing business of Snowy as an electricity and gas retailer. Even though we know we have to urgently transition Australian homes and businesses from gas to electric heat pumps and green hydrogen, but what this bill does seek is to prevent the government from making the problem worse. This government has made it clear that it intends to invest in new fossil fuel-based electricity generation in the middle of a climate emergency. But no one wants this gas plant. Since Minister Taylor put the call out to the private sector, not only did they not invest in this project, but they announced a range of other renewable projects. Origin announced a 700 megawatt battery at their Lake Macquarie site. Um, Neon have announced a 500 megawatt battery in the central tablelands, and CEP Energy have announced their intent to build a 1200 megawatt battery at Curry Curry, which is the very site for this proposed taxpayer-boosted uh, gas, uh, gas plant. And yet, despite the private sector uh, seeing the writing on the wall and wanting to invest in stuff that stacks up and will make their money in future as it tackles the climate crisis, this government is pressing ahead. Despite all their protestations about being technology neutral, Minister Taylor has made it clear that he's not interested in dispatchable capacity unless it comes from gas. 
The government has even knocked back a wind farm with storage through NAIF, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, because it's competing against gas. All this talk from the government about technology over taxes is just a hollow slogan. Because when the sector steps up and says we will make up for the shortfall in the form of renewables and storage, the minister says, no, 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 I prefer gas. I'm going to take money that could be going to schools and hospitals, and instead I'm going to use it to force investment in fossil fuels. Well, last week the G7 countries made it clear that not only should we be not subsidising fossil fuels or funding more fossil fuel projects with public money, but that we should have strong emissions reductions targets by 2030, targets that uh, should be at least double what this government is proposing. And of course, we know the opposition doesn't even have a 2030 emissions reduction target. Australia just keeps flying in the face of the rest of the world and flying in the face of the energy market. The public owns Snowy Hydro. We hold 100 per cent of the shares. The government has the power right now to tell Snowy Hydro to stop investing in new coal and gas fire power plants, and that would make this bill redundant. Minister Taylor could tell Snowy Hydro to invest in batteries instead. He could tell them to invest in renewables in the Hunter and La Trobe valleys. But we have a government which is not interested in addressing the climate emergency. It's not interested in keeping energy prices uh, low through renewables, which we know uh, depress the uh, market price. And it's not interested in keeping Australians safe. It's not interested in representing the over 70 per cent of Australians who want us to be a global leader in climate action. It's only interested in delivering for its donor mates and doing nothing to avert a climate disaster. That's why, sadly, we need this legislation. The government has proven itself completely incapable of addressing the climate emergency and dealing with public money responsibly, so it falls to this parliament to hold them accountable. We cannot let the government invest taxpayer money in new gas. We cannot let the government build new gas infrastructure. We know that we must bring down carbon pollution rapidly if we are to have any hope of keeping a safe climate for everyone on this planet and the creatures that we share it with. This parliament must hold the government to that responsibility. And that's why um, we are bringing this private member's bill on uh, for debate today. The notion that you would spend taxpayer dollars to invest in a gas-fired uh, power station when the rest of the world has just said we need to get off fossil fuels and we need to end fossil fuel subsidies, it is just sheer lunacy. And you only have to look at the amount of donations given to this government and, sadly, also to the opposition by Big Gas to work out why that's their position. So much for technology neutral. This government is now boosting for gas, even though renewables will do the job far better, will create more jobs for workers, will help us deliver a safer climate um, and will make money for Snowy Hydro. But no, this government just wants to deliver for its gas donor mates. It is reprehensible that in this day and age they want to spend public money on opening a new gas fire power station that the private companies will not touch with a barge pole because it is an economic doozy. And yet this government just dances to the tune once again of their gas donors. It is appalling. And if we were to do one thing in this parliament, it would be to end those dirty donations from the coal and gas and fossil fuel sector. We might start to get some semblance of a science-based climate policy if that were the case. But right now, um, the money is running the show, and those vested interests are getting the policy that they pay for. Uh, and there's some cushy lobbyist jobs to follow for many of the MPs that leave this building and go into work for those rep bodies, whether it's Appia, the gas lobby, um, or whether it's for those companies directly. It is just a disgusting triumph of private interest over the public interest of this planet and this nation. That's why we commend this bill to the House. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Small. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And here we go again. More alarmism from the Greens, who told us that before the Prime Minister went to the G7 that he would be isolated, cast aside, ignored on the world stage. But instead, the only distance we saw at the G7 was COVID social distancing, because in fact the Prime Minister has been recognised, much like uh, a very solid former senator here from Western Australia, my predecessor in fact, Matthias Cormann, who in travelling the globe 
uh, in order to secure the Secretary Generalship of the OECD, told Australia's incredibly powerful story when it comes to achievement in reducing emissions. And that's so much more important than talking points, than promises, than commitments, than vacuous statements of intent. Achievement is what actually matters, and that is where Australia has a great story to tell on emissions reduction. But at the same time, this is a government that is focused on achieving affordable, reliable and secure energy for all Australian households and businesses. They're the three pillars that we absolutely need in a reliable energy market. We need affordability, we need reliability and we need sustainability. No doubt about that. And that is why this government, because of the impact that power interruptions or significant increases in energy prices have, not only on us as Australian citizens in our houses, but more broadly on the Australian economy through small, medium and large businesses, uh, industries like manufacturing, that we need to see grow in order to diversify the Australian economy as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, they are the people that we target our policies at. That's why we're taking real and practical action to deliver both lower emissions at the same time as we protect our economy, we protect Australian jobs, and we protect, most importantly, the investment that will deliver jobs into the future. As the Prime Minister and the Energy Minister are fond of saying, our approach is driven by technology and not by taxes. We will not willfully tax Australian business into the ground and cast thousands of Australians out of work. We are the party that supports Australians getting on with what they do best at the same time as making the necessary investments in the technologies that unlock emissions reduction into the future. Into the future. We've got a great story to tell here, not only on emissions reduction, but also on our achievements in energy prices. Wholesale electricity prices on the East Coast are at their lowest levels in more than nine years. Nineteen straight months of price falls uh, following the introduction of the big stick by this government. And that's where we see the rubber hitting the road, is what the average Australian experiences out in their home or in their business. And that's what matters to them and that's what matters to us. Household retail prices are 11.2 per cent lower than they were just one year ago. At the same time as not resting our laurels from that great record of achievement, we are making the necessary investments to ensure that reliable and affordable power continues to be available. And that's what underpins our investments in the Curry Curry uh, power generation facility uh, through Snowy. So at the same time as we've got Labor and the crossbench paying lip service to the gas industry, which generates thousands, tens of thousands of jobs for Australians directly and underpins the economic activity through our small businesses uh, and our communities, uh, they're continuing to pay lip service to that whilst we not only support the energy industry, we support the technology that will continue to deliver the sorts of results that have led to Australia being very isolated in achieving our Kyoto commitments and beyond. That's the only isolation that Australia feels at the moment. In fact, we beat our 2020 emissions reduction target by some 459 million tonnes. The latest forecasts show that Australia is not only on track to meet its 2030 Paris target, but to beat it. Over the last two years, our position against that 2030 target has improved by some 639 million tonnes. So what went before was good. What we're doing now is great, and what is yet to come will be even better. Because this government has achieved the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road, not for a week, not for a month, or even for a year but the equivalent of taking Australia's entire 14.7 million cars off the road for 15 years. That's an achievement that when you compare to between 2005 and 2019, uh, our emissions uh, not only fell faster than Canada, New Zealand, Japan and the United States, but in fact 
the OECD average overall. Emissions through electricity generation of itself have fallen to the lowest level since records began, down an incredible 5.6 per cent in the last year alone, and the record levels of investment in renewable energy are continuing. In 2020, some 7,000 megawatts of renewable power was installed in Australia. And that's the difference between a taxing, spending, big government approach by those advocated over there and the record of the Morrison government in embracing renewable energy as part of an affordable, reliable and sustainable energy generation future for Australia. Because that 7,000 megawatts of renewable power installed last year alone in the midst of a global pandemic is more in one year than, uh, under this government than during the six long years of the previous Labor government. So whilst you know, we're often attacked for somehow being anti-renewable energy, more renewables have been installed in the last year in the course of a global pandemic than were installed in entirety under the last Labor government. Australia now has the highest amount of solar generation capacity per person of any country in the world. We have the most wind generation capacity of any country outside Europe. And emissions overall, as I've been clear to point out, are at the lowest level on record from electricity generation. So we've got to keep this momentum going. And that's why the Morrison government has got a clear plan to do so through the Technology Investment Roadmap. Our commitment through that process is clear. Lower prices, keeping the lights on and doing our bit to reduce global emissions without wrecking the economy. And we're seeing the results. Advancing the next generation of low emissions technology is crucial to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement. And that's why our investment in the technology roadmap will maintain a reliable and secure energy supply for all Australians, at the same time as living up to our commitments and delivering on them, most importantly, on the world stage. Our experience has been that when new technologies become economically competitive, they're rapidly adopted by Australian businesses and households. And that's certainly unchanged by the COVID pandemic. So our comprehensive plan to invest in sustainable, renewable and affordable power will ultimately mean that we have uh, power for our Australian households and businesses to do what they need to. We'll have uh, our necessary commitment to the global emissions reduction uh, uh, targets and we will be accelerating the investment in things like hydrogen, carbon capture, uh, soil carbon measurement, and that will unlock uh, the potential for advanced manufacturing, for long duration energy storage, and ultimately support 160,000 new jobs by 2030 and cement Australia's position as a world leading exporter, not only of energy, but of food, fibre, minerals, and advanced technologies. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Small. And the time for this debate has now uh, expired. Um, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business, and I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment, Site Specification, Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to support the government's amendments to the National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment, Site Specification, Community Fund and Other Measures Bill. Labor will still be supporting passage of this legislation to ensure that all traditional owners have certainty and access to legal recourse through judicial review. Labor acknowledges that radioactive waste management is a complex policy challenge that requires the highest levels of transparency and evidence, while balancing the need of the community to benefit from treatments for diseases like cancer. Accordingly, Labor will act in accordance with scientific evidence and with full transparency broad public input and best practice technical and cons consult consultative standards, taking into account the views of traditional owners to progress responsible radioactive waste management. 
The Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources is responsible for establishing a national radioactive waste management facility, which I'll refer to as the facility, under the Gillard Government's National Radioactive Waste Management Act 2012. Under the existing National Radioactive Waste Management Facility Act, the minister has the power to nominate a site that has been volunteered by a landowner and the process is subject to judicial review. The government is proposing amendments that reinstate the ministerial site declaration process in the current act as proposed by the opposition and as originally contemplated in the 2012 legislation. Uh, also to deem certain land taken to have been nominated and approved under the act being the three shortlisted sites of Lyndhurst, Napandi and Wallabadina, and thirdly, to allow for judicial review of the ministerial site declaration aspect of the process. The amendments include compensation provisions to ensure beyond doubt that existing rights to compensation are maintained. The current government amendments, if passed, will mean the minister will make a site declaration regarding one of the three presently shortlisted sites which has been nominated and approved or any other site which is subsequently shortlisted. The traditional owners, the Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation and the Andy Manatha Native Title Holders and all stakeholders will then have the ability to undertake a judicial review of the ministerial site declaration. The community fund of $31 million will remain as part of the legislation. Labor's primary concern with the original bill, which compelled Parliament to make a site selection for the National Radioactive Waste Management Facility, which was presented by this government, was that it removed judicial review. This was also the primary concern of the Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation. Labor has been consistent on this. We wouldn't support passage of this legislation unless, unless the traditional owners were comfortable with it. Finally, the government has come to the table on this. Labor insisted over many months that the BDAC be consulted in relation to the current government amendments before they go before the parliament. This happened last week. These amendments are a good compromise, which maintains the ability for judicial review, at the same time acknowledging the work that has already been done in shortlisting the three sites to get the process moving ahead in the interests of all Australians. Concerns had been raised by the BDAC regarding the deeming of the three sites and whether this would restrict the government in future from nominating other sites outside of the three listed. Labor clarified this with the government, who have since confirmed in the explanatory memorandum, recognition of the three shortlisted sites confirms the sites as being nominated and approved under the Act, but does not limit the minister from approving new nominations. The minister may declare any approved nomination as a site and is not bound to declare one of the three shortlisted sites. Given this commitment in the explanatory memorandum, the Bangala people do not oppose the amendments as they are confident the revised bill provides the legal recourse they need to ensure their voices are heard. Labor has also consulted with the Andy Manatha, who have been assured that Labor would never allow the government to declare Wallabadina against the wishes of the community. That is why Labor is supporting these amendments. Labor supports the community development package of up to $31 million, which will be available for the host community to contribute to its economic and social sustainability. This package includes $20 million, a $20 million community fund to provide long-term support for the region, $8 million in grants for four years from 2019-20 to strengthen the economic and skills base of the host community, $3 million from the government's Indigenous Advancement Strategy, which will support the delivery of an Aboriginal Economic Heritage Participation Plan. The question of a permanent storage facility for low-level radioactive waste has been an ongoing issue for 30 years, with decades of reports, studies and tests. The scientific and technical advice is that a national facility is required for Australia to meet its international obligations to manage our own nuclear waste. The Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, the national regulator, has made it clear that permanently leaving the waste at Lucas Heights is unsustainable. National radioactive waste is predominantly the byproduct of nuclear medicine. Australians depend on nuclear technology for medicines used in the diagnosis of heart disease, skeletal injuries, as well as a range of cancers. 
One in two Australians will use nuclear medicine in their lifetime. ANSTO can deliver over 10,000 patient doses of nuclear medicines to more than 250 Australian and New Zealand hospitals and medical centres every week. So it's no surprise that Australia's radioactive waste has built up over 60 years. Currently, Australia's radioactive waste is stored in more than 100 locations around the country. There will come a time where the main storage space at Lucas Heights will run out of room. There is a capacity to extend the storage capacity at Lucas Heights, but ANSTO have made clear that they would rather use that space for scientific endeavours rather uh, than as a waste facility. In their submission, the department claimed that the ANSTO facility would be completely full by 2030. The proposed national facility is expected to be op in operation for 100 years and will permanently dispose of low-level radioactive waste and temporarily store intermediate-level waste. Low-level low waste is made up of paper, plastic, gloves, cloths and filters, which contain small amounts of radioactivity and which require minimal shielding through during handling, transport and storage. Labor is concerned that, to date, the government has been unable to provide any assurances on progress towards establishing a permanent facility for inter intermediate level waste. We note that the community will expect a clear plan for a permanent facility to safely secure intermediate waste. It is hard to understand why, to date, so few resources have been allocated to the creation of a permanent intermediate level waste storage facility. In the absence of such resources or planning, the government should explain why the existing intermediate level waste should be moved from one temporary storage facility to another. Labor will continue to hold the government to account and press for the department to explain how it plans to establish a permanent underground repository for waste of this nature. It's important that this legislation pass to progress this important issue, which has been treated like a political football up until now, as nuclear medicine is part of modern health care and a storage site is necessary. Opponents of specific site selection will rightly have the opportunity to have their day in court. Labor is supporting this bill to provide certainty to, to traditional owners and to break the stalemate on this critical issue for Australia's security going forward. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam, Acting, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise uh, today to speak on behalf of the Australian Greens and uh, my constituents in South Australia, who, of course, are outraged that once again what we see is the two big parties working together to dump on our state. Now, if you ever wanted to see an example of what happens when Labor and Liberal get together, they've got more votes on the eastern seaboard than they do in South Australia, and they dump on SA. That's what they're doing here today. South Australians are frustrated at this debate. It's gone on for so long, but they're frustrated that every time, rather than putting in the work, rather than coming up with permanent solutions, Labor and Liberal gang up together and decide oh, well, we don't want the nuclear waste in our backyards, so we'll stick it in South Australia. We'll stick it in communities that don't want it. Now, this process has been a shamble from the beginning. The consultation process in relation to these three listed sites has been a debacle, mishandled over and over again. And, of course, the different ministers in charge of it from time to time. Every, every time you get a new minister, you get a list of new promises, only which are to be broken, consultations rubbish, and the locals in South Australia get ignored once more. And what, what are we seeing today? Right now, as we're voting uh, and debating this piece of legislation, we've seen another rolling of leadership in the National Party. But first of all, when Mr Canavan, Senator Canavan, was in charge of this portfolio, he didn't care about where the waste went, as long as it wasn't in his backyard in Queensland, oh, let's just dump on SA. Then we had Mr Pitt. What has he done? Oh, just dump on SA. And I bet your bottom dollar Mr Barnaby Joyce will do the exact same thing. Just like he wants to take all of South Australia's water, he thinks we should have all of the country's nuclear waste as well. Not our Deputy Prime Minister, I'll have you know. 
This bill is a disgrace. It is an affront to community consultation. It is an affront to the best available science, and it is an affront to the promise, the long-held promise that this country would get serious about a long-term permanent solution to dealing with the waste that we do have. Now, of course, we have a responsibility. We create nuclear waste. We need to store it properly. It is, of course, incredibly toxic. It's why it is difficult to do. It is also why you don't see the Prime Minister advocating that they build a nuclear waste dump in his electorate, where Lucas Heights actually is. Oh no, couldn't have it in the Prime Minister's backyard. You've got to dump it in South Australia instead. Actually, the safest place to be keeping, and the scientists tell us this over and over again, the various inquiries that have been undertaken, is to leave it where it is. And that would be for the intermediate waste in the Prime Minister's backyard, in the Shire, in Lucas Heights. But of course, that's not what we're debating today because the big parties and the big states think it's all very cute and easy to dump on little old South Australia. As I mentioned at the outset, Madam Deputy President, the consultation process that led up to this piece of legislation has been a debacle, an insult. If you wanted to run community consultation, this is not the way to do it. The First Nations communities in all three of these selected sites have been treated appallingly. So thankfully, one of the amendments that is going to be moved is to at least restore some type of judicial review because uh, the process has been so bad. The incompetence of the ministers that have been managing this for a number of years now under the National Party have treated the local South Australian First Nations communities terribly. Now, we were first told in relation to the proposals to build a national nuclear waste dump, that this would just be for low-level waste. Oh, don't worry. We'll put this facility out in the, in the outback where uh, no one will really notice. It'll be low-level. Doesn't matter. Let's run a process to consult. Doesn't really matter what the response is. We'll still do it. Oh, we'll pay you off too, millions of dollars. Of course, as this process has gone on, it's now been acknowledged that he's not going to just store low-level nuclear waste. This is actually going to be storing, for a temporary period of 100 years, intermediate-level waste, above ground. So anyone who wants to stand in this place today and argue that it doesn't matter, this is all just about low-level waste, the type that you find in basements in hospitals, well, that is just not true. Because part of this proposal has now morphed into storing intermediate level waste. And the best available science, world practice, international standards say this should not be happening. You shouldn't be double handling this level of waste in this manner. And this is all because the government has been dragging its feet on establishing a properly independent and expert inquiry about the whole nuclear cycle in Australia that would give proper advice as to what to do with the more toxic and dangerous intermediate level waste. But of course that hasn't happened. And so now we have intermediate level waste tacked on to this proposal not permanently stored, it will be above ground, and no one knows what will happen next. International experts have warned Australia that this is not OK. International bodies have said this is not best practice, 
and yet there is no plan from this government in what to do with it. And of course, we all know what happens in these situations. You get approval for the project as it is now. You don't consult properly. You pay off the communities, hoping that they'll forget and hoping that everyone else will forget too. Well, we won't forget. South Australians are sick and tired of being dumped on like this by the Labor Party and the Liberal Party, the National Party and the big states on the eastern seaboard. Now, if you wanted to do the best practice, if you wanted to follow the science in relation to this, you'd put in place a proper plan for dealing with this intermediate waste. Have yet uh, uh, that is just not happening. And of course, the other issue in relation to all this is how is this dangerous, toxic stuff going to get to South Australia in the first place? Well, it's going to be driven on our roads in big trucks, shipped from Lucas Heights in the Prime Minister's backyard all the way through around and into South Australia. And we're going to be doing that on boats. It's going to be loaded on and off in South Australia's port towns. But of course, no one in Wyala, no one in Port Augusta, no one, on, no one in Port Pirie has been consulted about having this toxic stuff arrive on their front doorstep. There's been no proper community consultation. There's been no safety plan discussed as to how this toxic and dangerous waste is going to be transported to any of these three sites. This has been a disgraceful process, and still the South Australian community are left in the dark. How is this going to tra be transported? How often are we going to have trucks and ships full of nuclear waste coming into our state, coming into our towns? What are the people of Wyala meant to do? Not to mention the towns and communities where this dump is built. And of course, one of the sites, Madam Deputy President, that is listed by the government in this piece of legislation, in their amendment, is in the heart of the Flinders Ranges, a jewel in the crown of our state. Now, the Flinders Ranges are spectacular. They are beautiful. It is nature at its very finest. It is loved by South Australians. It's loved by the local First Nations people. It's loved by people right around the world because of its special and unique characteristics. And today, what we're voting on is a piece of legislation that suggests this government could build a waste dump in the heart of the Flinders Ranges. And what do we see? Labor voting with the government. It's just a disgrace. Now, it doesn't go to the Flinders Ranges, the other sites close to Kimber, in some of South Australia's best, finest, prime agricultural land. And what happens for, with the product that's created and grown out there? It's shipped overseas, it's exported. With a superb reputation of being clean and green. But of course, senators and members of parliament from Queensland, New South Wales, and Victoria don't give two hoots about the reputation of South Australia's grain industry, our clean food and wine industry, our pristine environment. No, no, no. They just don't want to dump in their backyard. Well, South Australians don't want it either. And especially when you haven't even bothered to put in the legwork 
to run a proper process, to follow best si available science, to do world's best practice. You just want to tick and flick, done, 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 like the revolving door of the leadership of the National Party. And it's no surprise that minister after minister after minister responsible for this debacle have all been ministers of the National Party, far more interested in their own jobs, far more interested in being at the top of their party's ticket, far more interested in being deputy prime minister than they are about making sure we handle this toxic and dangerous waste properly. Mr Joyce doesn't give two hoots about what happens to this waste as long as it's not in his backyard. The Prime Minister, whose electorate is right where this nuclear waste is created, doesn't want it there. Surprise, surprise. So dump it in SA and everyone will forget about it. Well, we're not going to. We're going to fight this. We want a proper process. We want independent expert advice, not special favours from national ministers. And we want our state's reputation of being a clean, green food, wine and tourism industry protected. And it's only the Greens who are standing up for this in our state in South Australia. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, to be honest, I'm not going to address the nonsense that we've just heard from Senator Hanson Young. It, I mean, it really does reveal why this country has spent 40 years discussing this issue, uh, something that has proved to be terribly difficult terribly intractable, and, and, and that contribution from the Greens just reveals why, when you sink to the base politics of these issues, they do become difficult. You need to discuss the science, you need to work with communities, you need to consider the best interests of the Australian people and the needs of particularly um, the, the disposal of medical radioactive waste. And, and that is what this very, very long, extensive, scientific, community-oriented process has done. And I want to pay tribute. I, I, I want to be positive about this. I want to pay tribute to Mr Rowan Ramsey, who happens to be in the gallery today, uh, the, the, the member for Gray from the other place. Uh, Rowan has been, sorry, uh, uh, Mr Ramsey has been a staunch advocate of this process of the community in his electorate that bravely, bravely put their hand up to be part of this process in the face of uh, uh, extraordinarily negativity from other places. And uh, it, it is extraordinarily brave, both what you have done, uh, Rowan, and what the Kimber community has done uh, in, the face, in the face of uh, opposition from those who don't want to engage, who don't want to be productive in this area. And I'll pay tribute, and I'll pay tribute to those opposite. It's good to see that we have support across the chamber for this proposal. It's an uh, extraordinarily positive step forward that we can finally move this process forward. This is an absolutely vital piece of national infrastructure. It plays an absolutely crucial role in the nuclear medicine industry and in our capacity to drive innovation in this area into the future. Uh, I, um, I don't want to speak too long on this bill, but I do want to just note that I was chair of the Senate Economics Committee, which held uh, an inquiry into this bill, and it was an opportunity to look at these, uh, to look at these issues in detail. That Order. is an absolute nonsense. In fact, the committee heard from traditional owners. I will take that interjection. It look, we looked at safety. We looked at security concerns. We looked at alternative site proposal. 
We looked at native title rights and interests. We looked at local community views and agricultural considerations. It was an extraordinary thorough process. It has been going on for many, many years, and the Senate Economics Committee was just a very small part of that. We received 105 submissions, including many more form submissions. And I just wish to note, and, and this is being reflected um, now in the decision, hopefully, of this chamber in a, in a short period of time, that there is actually a broad bipartisan consensus that we must manage our own radioactive waste. It has been accumulating now for over 70 years, um, uh, largely as a byproduct of essential nuclear medicine and research. We need to provide an appropriately effective solution for the management of radioactive waste for future generations. Uh, this bill gives effect to the commitment made by successive governments and ministers, including Senator the Honourable Kim Carr, who is in the chamber, and uh, Senator Matt Canavan, uh, and to the Australian community to establish a purpose-built national radioactive waste management facility. This will uh, dispose of Australia's domestically produced low-level waste and store Australia's intermediate level waste for a period of time sufficient for the government to establish a permanent intermediate level waste disposal facility. Now, what is this facility actually for? It's critical to our country's medical, scientific and technological advancement, in particular to the continued production and supply of nuclear medicine that, on average, two to three of us will need at some point in our lifetime, two in three of us will need at some point in our lifetime. Most of us will need nuclear medicine for things such as heart, lung, liver or brain scans, treatment of cancer. Some 80 per cent of Australia's radioactive waste stream, 80 per cent, is derived from the production of nuclear medicine, which is currently stored in something like 100 locations around Australia. Now, as I've said, this has been going on for around 40 years. Uh, it's been a very difficult process. It's, it's, it's caused the undertaking of numerous inquiries, numerous processes, and it's good to finally see some real progress in the right direction. And finally, uh, and I will finish up here, I just think it's really important that as part of the, the inquiry process, we heard from the community of Kimber, and uh, I on a personal note, and I know uh, Senator Gallagher, as uh, the deputy chair um, at that point on the Economics Committee, was truly grateful for the input we received from a wide variety of stakeholders to that committee. It was a very productive process. Uh, I, I particularly want to thank those from the community of Kimber who put their hand up, stuck their neck out, and who hopefully will finally get some sort of a conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Ayres. Thanks very much, um, <clears throat> Madam uh, Deputy President. Well, <clears throat> I, I want to make a couple of comments uh, about this bill. Um, La Labor will support this bill, subject to, subject to the adoption uh, by this chamber of a series of amendments. And I want to come to those amendments uh, in a moment. Um, but we're here at this time because uh, the management of this process uh, has been entirely mismanaged by a succession of National Party ministers. Uh, the government should not be afraid uh, of judicial review, of proper scrutiny and a proper community engagement over this issue. Now, as has been commented on by a number of the other speakers, uh, this facility will principally be to deal with waste produced by uh, produced at Lucas Heights uh, by ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. And that facility is a core part of Australia's uh, technological, uh, science and research, uh, medical infrastructure, but also a core part uh, of what should be our growing industrial capability. The facility at Lucas Heights can deliver over 10,000 patient doses a week of nuclear medicine to more than 250 medical centres right around Australia. Now, Australians rely upon nuclear medicine uh, for all sorts of conditions, 
Uh, it's instrumental for diagnosing heart disease, skeletal injuries, as well as a range of cancers. It's estimated that there are about 650,000 of these procedures every year. One in two Australians, one in two Australians will benefit uh, from nuclear medicine produced uh, at Ansto in Lucas Heights. As an official of the AMW, I saw this important and skilled work uh, up very close. Uh, members of the AMW and a series of other unions are uh, you know, over a thousand people, from tradespeople, skilled technicians, scientists, administrative workers, operate that facility. Um, I, was, um, I was actually appointed to a panel that reviewed the safety of that facility um, by uh, Senator Carr, the former minister, uh, and saw up close just how vital that facility is to Australia's future, not just in a medical sense, but if we're actually to build capability in this country for our science, for our technology, for um, the future of our industries, that is a vital facility. And its safety and its security and its future viability are critical. The waste from that facility has been building up for the past 60 years. At the moment, that waste is stored in more than 100 facilities around the country, with most of it stored in drums at the Anstow facility in Lucas Heights. Well, well, that is not a sustainable position. Anstow believes that their storage capacity will be filled by 2030. They have a lease until much later than that, or an arrangement until much later than that. And there are certainly more productive uses of space at that nuclear facility uh, than creating further storage capacity. A permanent and specific nuclear waste facility is a core recommendation from our PANSA, the nuclear safety regulator. It's consistent with our international obligations under the Joint Convention on the Safety of Spent Fuel Management and on the Safety of Radioactive Waste Material. It's clearly the most sensible approach. However, the establishment of a world-class nuclear waste facility is obviously difficult and complicated. Uh, it requires leadership, uh, deft management, a commitment to transparency uh, and to community engagement uh, and to technical assessment. But more than that, it requires trust, competence and a capacity to follow through on the promises that are made to particular communities. That's why it was Labor that legislated the National Radioactive Waste Management Facility Act in 2012 to outline a process for the establishment and operation of the Australian National Radioactive Waste Management Facility. The existing Act gives the Resources Minister the power to nominate a site that has been volunteered by a landowner through a process that is subject to judicial review. This bill, as originally drafted, would have obviated judicial review. It would change the mechanism of selection from a ministerial declaration to being specified through legislation, and that of itself excludes judicial review. We don't support the removal of judicial review from this process. It's critical to building community support. It's critical to legitimacy. A decision as permanent and controversial as the establishment of a nuclear waste facility has to be properly scrutinised. So the amendments will reinstate judicial review and they will strengthen existing rights to compensation. We've been consistent on this side. We've said that we won't support the passage of legislation unless the traditional owners um, are confident that those rights, in terms of judicial review, are restored. Those amendments are the product of consultation with the Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation. They are confident that the revised bill gives them the legal recourse they need to ensure their voices are heard. It's that uh, that's uh, developed a position within the Labor Party that we ought to support this legislation. 
The fact that this bill has been presented in the way that it has, in the sort of shambolic approach that it has, is entirely a product of mismanagement by the National Party uh, of this portfolio. They are entirely focused upon themselves, and we've seen more evidence of that today. Unable to distinguish between the national interest and the interest of the National Party. How we manage our natural resources and how we ensure that their benefits are felt by the entire Australian community requires careful judgment and effective policy making, and that is beyond the succession of National Party ministers who we have had in this place and over in the other chamber. The National Party has delivered a series of resource ministers who just simply aren't up to the challenges of their portfolio, unable to balance the competing interests that go with the resources portfolio and with the agriculture portfolio. They are only interested in posing in interviews in Sky After Dark, going for the most reactionary audience that they can find, rather than the complex challenges of running a government that makes decisions in the interests of all Australians, including South Australians. In 2015, there was a call for nomination of potential sites, with 28 applications received and six sites shortlisted. A revised process was established in late 2016, and a suitable site was volunteered near Kimber. And so it fell to Senator Canavan, the sort of cosplay coal miner, Mr Maybelline himself, to oversee the delicate process of nominating a repository under the provisions of the Act. The Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation, which holds native title over the adjacent Pinkawilinini National Park, claimed that they are unable to perform an adequate heritage assessment ahead of Nepandi being nominated. And I'm very grateful to Senator Rusden for her, for her uh, correction of my uh, very poor South Australian pronunciation. They claim, they claim that Minister Canavan assured traditional owners that land neighbouring the site would not be excluded from a ballot of the local government area to determine whether the proposal had community support. But when the ballot came, when the ballot came it effectively did exclude native title holders on the basis that they weren't residents of the local government area. Strangely, Somehow it did include 36 non-residents who had property interests that were in the local government area. The Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation challenged the ballot right through to the federal court. Ultimately, they were unsuccessful. They held their own ballot 100 per cent against the proposal. So when the government claims that this proposition has broad community support, it's worth considering who the government means by such a term. It is a stretch to call the 62 per cent yes vote broad community support. Now, the facility now has unanimous opposition from traditional owners in the region. It's not hard to see why an Aboriginal community in South Australia would be sceptical of a nuclear facility. Managing these concerns requires careful judgment, thoughtful consideration and a commitment to engaging with the community, the very least a process that doesn't exclude sections of the community. But then Minister Canavan's final act in his portfolio, before resigning from Cabinet because of his baffling support then for the member for New England in the last Cabinet spill, in the last leadership spill in the National Party, remember that? It occurred on the day that the parliament had been convened together to commemorate the victims of the bushfires, the 2019-2020 bushfires. The National Party spent that day focused on themselves in a leadership spill that was ultimately fruitless. They have done it again today. Um, he formally chose the Nepandi site on his last day. In a reshuffle, his job was handed to Minister Pitt, whose views about nuclear energy have been consistently out of step with the broader Australian, with the broader Australian community. He is one of those guys who is so reactionary on energy policy, uh, so opposed 
to advances in renewable energy, uh, so opposed uh, so to lower power prices, to lower emissions and to more jobs that would flow from investment in renewable energy that he's committed to taxpayer funding for coal-fired power, a bloke who's so reactionary that when he's challenged about renewable energy he goes to the recourse, the comfortable recourse of the old Australian reactionary, which is to start talking about nuclear power uh, that would make our electricity more expensive, more waste challenges. Uh, and so this portfolio has been left in Minister Pitt's hands. I welcome the decision by the government to support uh, new amendments to the bill that will restore uh, judicial review. The intended outcome of the government's original legislation would have removed procedural fairness for the government's critics. Those on the other side who drafted this bill should reflect on how the removal of those basic rights correlate with a long history of dispossession and exclusion. Government senators in their own report recommended that the government repair their relationship with the Bangala with the assistance of a mediator. That's a sensible recommendation. It should have occurred in 2016. The bill before us really is a sum of the mistakes that the government has made over the long eight years it's had the capacity to fix uh, this set of issues. Uh, the original legislation put the country on a path to resolving it. The government has bungled this uh, every step of the way, um, all because I think Senator Canavan was too busy getting measured up for his monogrammed high vis. Uh, performing in the sort of, to the sort of sky after dark audience than actually taking the job of ministerial responsibility seriously and building the broad community support uh, that he promised. Um, when, it, when it comes to the resources portfolio in this country, it is clear whose interests are being served. It is clear who gets listened to and who doesn't whose concerns are considered and who is ignored. I just say this finally, that the decision by the government to adopt the, recommended, the, the uh, amendments recommended by the Labor Party, that is a welcome development. Australia clearly needs this facility to be built. Uh, it needs it to be built in an environment where there is proper, uh, proper judicial review proper consultation, proper transparency, a proper commitment to the national interest that is served by maintaining our capacity, uh, particularly at Ansto, uh, and, uh, and we're trying to return to a proper orderly process of ministerial responsibility. Senator Thorpe, are you seeking the call? Yes. Thank you, uh, Acting President. I must, it's good. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I must stand and contribute to the debate on this very important bill. Before I continue, I want to pay my respects to the Bangala and Adnamatna elders and say thank you to their people, who are the traditional owners of the lands affected by this bill. Thank you for raising your voice so clearly throughout the campaign against the radioactive waste dump on your country. I hear you, the Greens hear you, and this place must hear you. I know that the voices of community have been sidelined many times in this process, and I thank you all for staying strong, staunch and proud. The Greens oppose this bill, and we call on our fellow senators today to oppose this bill. The government has for many years now been trying to push a permanent waste dump for low-level radioactive material and a site for long-lived intermediate level waste on the traditional lands of either the Adnamatna or the Bangala people against their clearly expressed opposition. It is disgraceful. The originally proposed 
Wallabadina site in the Flinders Ranges on a sacred women's site has been opposed by the Adnamatna community, led by staunch elders determined to protect country and culture. And Labor support this, mind you. They fought a long, exhausting fight to protect their country. In December 2018, the then responsible minister, Senator Canavan, ruled out the site for the dump and the community could finally take a breath again. The proposed amendment in front of you today paves the way for this sacred site to be again considered for a radioactive waste dump. Sacred site into a radioactive waste dump. That is, that's the colonial project right there. The oppressors are at their dirty game again. The proposed amendment paves the way for absolute destruction of country, people and sites that have been there for thousands of generations. You fellas have only rocked up over the last 200 years. My heart is heavy today thinking of the pain this must cause the Adnamatna community, how betrayed and disillusioned they must feel. Shame. Time and time again this Liberal government has changed its approach in this important matter because they know it does not have community approval. We know, again, Labor talks about consultation with blackfellas. They think that that means consent. It's not consent. You can run around saying you consulted with blackfellas anywhere you like, but that does not mean consent. Now they are backtracking on their promises again. How can we or anyone believe in the word of this government? The amendment, in fact, puts all three, sh three shortlisted sites back on the table including the Lyndhurst as well as the Napandi sites, both in Kimba. The Napandi site was one Minister Pitt wanted to specify in the original bill amendment. None of these sites have the consent of the traditional owners. Seriously? You all talk about having mates that are black and that you can get advice from them and that everything's okay, but I can guarantee you now none of these traditional owners want their sacred sites desecrated. None of them. That's the part you obviously don't hear, Labor and the government. Though this Liberal government has always stressed that it won't impose a nuclear waste dump on any community, that is exactly what is happening. So they say one thing and stab you in the back the next. It makes me so angry that the so-called community consultation, not consent, via the Kimba community ballot did not even include the Bangala people despite their explicit request. This ballot went ahead without including the Bangala native title holders on the basis that the Bangala do not pay council rates and only ratepayers considered worthy members of the community were allowed to vote. And does that mean that we weren't or Aboriginal people weren't in that community? What were they considered? The Bangala people weren't even contacted as part of this so-called consultation and had to reach out themselves again and again to make sure they are heard. If that's not discrimination, then what is? The Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation engaged a private independent electoral company to conduct its own ballot with its members to determine the Bangala community's support for the waste facility at Kimber. And what happened? What happened with that ballot? Unanimously no. All of those traditional, traditional owners got together and they said no to the waste dump. Does anyone want to hear that or pretend that they consulted? This was a result of the corporation that went to the minister 
for consideration and inclusion in the process to assess community sentiment. But it would appear this has not been heeded by the former Minister Canavan or by Minister Pitt, who is putting forward the bill we have before us today. Or is it you just don't care? How do you feel walking into all of your offices with your big, deadly thousand-dollar dot paintings? Does it make you feel good? Do you have your hand on your heart while you're stabbing us in the back and digging our graves? How does that feel? Maybe, say, maybe think about that next time you look at your dot paintings, because you certainly don't care. You're not genuine people or senators or people representing the people. How can anyone say the community has been consulted and considered under these circumstances? This is shameful, it's outrageous and disrespectful to tra traditional owners, not just in that country but everywhere. It just shows your colours, both of you, Labor and Liberal. Show your colours. Now they are putting before us a bill which proposes three potential sites for the dump. We know where those sites are and we know how significant those sites are to, to traditional owners, the people who have been here since time began. Remember, you fellas rocked up only 200 years ago and you have been working out how much you can destroy since you got here. It's take, take, take. All for money and power. This is a sneaky way to avoid further debate about this controversial issue. Because you're putting forward an amendment that says, oh, the traditional owners can go to court. What supports do they have to go to court? Labor? Are you going to get out your dollars out of your pocket or hand over some of your corporate donors? to support those traditional owners to fight the system in court? You know what the, the uh, hopes are of that happening? How dare you pretend you support us? The Liberal government, we know, will just push through with their agenda anyway. I say no. The Bangala people say no. The Adnamatna people say no. And I call for all those senators who want to keep their dot paintings to also, also say no. Or well, if you want to stand for an acknowledgement to country in this place, say no. Otherwise, sit down and stop pretending that you're here for the first people in this country, because you're not. You have your own interests in this place, and it's to continue the colonial project that has committed genocide and ecocide against the first people in this country. So we say no. We say no today, we say no tomorrow, and we'll continue to say no, and we will put up a fight to continue to fight against the destruction of our country and our water and our people. Radioactive waste is an intergenerational issue. It's not something you just put in the bin and walk away and everything's lovely. It's something that lasts longer than any of you in here and any parliament. It lasts forever and it's something you never take out of the ground. If you knew blackfellas and you knew our story, you know not to even take that stuff out of the ground in the first place. We need to change a lot of the ways we do business in our nation and in this place. We need to start with respect for those who have been here the longest and with the deepest understanding that we are inheritors of the past and shapers of the future. This new approach should start today, if you've got any go in you and if you want to keep your dot paintings up. It should start today, and it should be clear, and it should be unequivocal rejection of this fundamentally flawed and deeply disrespectful government bill. Finally, 
How can the government and Labor, waving their little Aboriginal flag around and saying that they're you know, First Nations friendly, how can you acknowledge the traditional owner's country that you're on? How can you do that when you destroy country, when you support a bill that will destroy sacred women's sites? Sacred women's sites. You can laugh up there. You know, that's what I expect from the patriarchy, right? Colonisation of this country brought the patriarchy. The old white fellas that are laughing and heckling me in the background, they're the problem with this country. Patriarchy is violence and colonialism is violence, and that is what we're dealing with in this bill. And Labor, if you want to be friends with us, then you should stand up and vote against this bill as well, because the traditional owners collectively have said no. And that's where I'll leave it because we'll continue to fight and Labor stand behind, stand in front of the picket line and fight against the blackfellas you say you support. Senator Ferraventi Wells. Thank you. So, Senator Sil John, yes. I just want to seek your guidance, Chair. We had some interjections during Senator uh, Thorpe's uh, speech. Her commentary was referred to by the individual in the gallery as bullshit, and I'm wanting your well, direction didn't. as to how appropriate an interjection such as that is from a member of the gallery. Well, I didn't hear it, so I can't rule, uh, rule upon it from where I was sitting. Well, I'm happy to remind members of the gallery that they're not able to contribute, but I didn't hear it. Uh, Senator Thorpe, you have a point of order? Well, a point of order, uh, I did hear that comment. Uh, and if there were a bunch of blackfellas up there that said that, they'd be thrown out the door with security. So I would like them reminded, the patriarchy sitting up there, that they cannot do that in this place. It's my workplace. Uh, Senator Thorpe, it's not a point of order. I have reminded the gallery, uh, in accordance with Senator Steele Johns uh, and Senator Hanson Young's suggestion, and I, don't, I disagree with your imputation of what I would, not, would or would not have done in those circumstances, and I find that personally offensive. Senator Friend of Wells. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this important piece of legislation which has been years in the making. Can I say at the outset that I support nuclear power? However, before embarking on any future policy of nuclear power, we must first sort out disposal of our nuclear waste. This is the vital first step of that process. Every hospital is a radioactive waste disposal site. Nuclear medicine is vital to the well-being of so many in the community, and it will continue to save many lives into the future. We all know someone who has benefited from nuclear medicine. 85 per cent of Australia's radioactive waste results from nuclear medicine, which on average one in two Australians will need in their lifetime for diagnosis or treatment of heart, lung, muscular, skeletal conditions and certain types of cancers. But radioactive waste is produced not just in medicine, but from a variety of other practices such as industry and research, including facilities such as ANSTO, CSIRO, the Department of Defence, hospitals and universities. The radioactive waste is currently spread across more than 100 facilities throughout Australia, including at five sites within 200 kilometres of Kimba, the site of the proposed waste storage facility. Storage in a national facility will mean that the waste will be consolidated into a single, safe, purpose-built radioactive waste facility, consistent with government policy and international best practice. The National Radioactive Waste Management Facility Program is at a critical juncture in, which, in what has been a 40-year effort to identify a community to host a facility. Importantly, it provides Parliament with a say in this important national infrastructure, rather than the decision about the site loca location resting with a single minister. 
The bill also contains an amended definition of controlled material to provide clarity as to the type of waste which may be stored at the facility. Thus, it aligns with other domestic legislation and international obligations. The new definition does not expand the type of material that can be stored at the facility. Rather, it covers all types of waste that will be held at the facility, but at this point expressly excludes high-level waste and spent nuclear fuel. This facility is designed for Australian waste only, namely waste that is used in Australia, generated by activities in Australia or sent to Australia under contractual arrangements relating to the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel. The facility will only be designated for and large enough to store Australian waste for approximately 100 years. It will then be monitored for 200 to 300 years afterwards. Near-surface disposal at ground level is a commonly adopted and safe solution for low-level waste, and such repositories are standard in many countries, including the United Kingdom, Spain, France, Japan and the United States. All waste will be fully immobilised and then placed within multiple layers of protection to ensure safety for workers, visitors to the site and the surrounding community. The facility will be designed and engineered to the highest of standards, with multiple safety barriers ensuring it is prepared for and resilient to all credible scenarios. The government has established the Australian Radioactive Waste Agency, which will lead the process to deliver the facility at Kimba. The agency will be independent of, but will work closely with, existing waste holders such as ANSTO, CSIRO or the Department of Defence. It is important that a dedicated agency does this work to build radioactive waste management practice and capability in Australia, but be independent from existing waste producers. Questions have arisen as to why an existing Commonwealth site was not chosen to store the waste. In 2017, 42 Commonwealth-owned sites were assessed and the department did not identify any sites suitable for hosting the facility. In relation to ANSTO, in my home state of New South Wales, its functions relate to science and medicine production, and the Lucas Heights campus was never intended to be or licensed as a long-term waste management facility. ANSTO has advised Arpanza that it plans to move its radioactive waste holdings to the national facility once it is developed, and Arpanza has accepted those plans in principle. Australia's facility will be a world-class, purpose-built, state-of-the-art facility operated in an open and transparent way in line with international best practice. All radioactive waste at the facility will be safely shielded, so radiation levels even close to stored or handled materials will be well below regulated safety levels. As is the case at Lucas Heights, workers and visitors will not require protective clothing. Australia has a uniform national radioactive waste classification system, which is based on the International Atomic Energy Agency guidelines and adapted for the Australian situation. Low-level waste emits radiation at levels which generally require minimal shielding during handling, transport and storage. 92 per cent of the radioactive waste produced by, by ANSTO is low-level waste made up of paper, plastic, gloves, cloths and filters that contain low level of radioactivity. Intermediate level waste is largely associated with the byproducts of nuclear medicine and emits higher levels of radiation that require additional shielding during handling, transport and storage. Australia does not produce high level radioactive waste. A high level waste facility would require a separate investigation to determine technical requirements and other needs. This, however, remains an issue for the future, but it must be tackled because it behoves Australia to manage its own waste. Shipping our plastics overseas was a case in point. The move away from multiple storage sites for the same class of waste is aligned with international best practice for the long-term management of radioactive waste as recognised by the Commonwealth Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Regulator, ARPANSA. The government has committed to intermediate level waste being temporarily stored at the facility while a permanent disposal pathway is developed, an absolute must. 
It is anticipated that it will take several decades to site and develop an intermediate level uh, disposal facility. The role of the waste management function is to coordinate with waste holders, and producers, regulators, international counterparts and policy makers to develop agreed pathways, strategies and management practices for Australia's radioactive waste from its production through to its disposal. This function will lead the development of a permanent disposal pathway for intermediate level waste. This involves a major program of research and development activities, and while no deadline has been set, this process is expected to take years. Regrettably, there are those who just simply are opposed to anything nuclear. They forget that, on average, one in two Australians will need nuclear medicine in their lifetime. Cessation of all activities that produce radioactive waste would be counterproductive and damaging to our society and the economy. Even if it were viable for Australia to cease producing nuclear medicine, doing so uh, would not provide a solution for our legacy waste, which has been accumulating for over 70 years and still requires a permanent facility. Defence is not a significant producer of radioactive material. Therefore, activities relating to the defence of Australia will result in very small amounts of radioactive waste being sent to the facility. Australia has no nuclear weapons capability. Before I conclude, I would like to make some comments regarding nuclear power. The time has come to consider nuclear power. If we are to be ecumenical on all power sources, then nuclear needs to be in the mix. There is a certain hypocrisy about those opposed to even contemplating consideration of this issue. They are happy to go to Europe and the UK and have no qualms about benefiting from nuclear power supply on tour. They will happily sip champagne or good Italian red wine whilst adopting the NIMBY principle, not in my backyard for Australia. In summary, nuclear power generation creates different levels of waste. However, before we contemplate storage of high-level waste, it behoves Australia to successfully deal with low and intermediate waste to demonstrate that in future we would be fully able to safely store any waste resulting from a nuclear energy cycle. Senator Carr. Thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, could I? Uh, indicate that uh, I'm very pleased to be able to support this legislation and um, perhaps uh, acknowledge the work of the Senate Economics Committee and Senator Brockman's referred to this. But I also want to particularly thank the Deputy Chair, Senator Gallagher, uh, for their work that is undertaken in examining this bill and the detailed uh, studies that were related to it. Uh, can I also thank the department? Uh, it's uh, prior to the last election, uh, and without breaking any conventions, uh, the caretaker convention allowed me the opportunity to consult with the department about the matters that relate to the community fund and other matters. Um, while I may not uh, agree with every aspect of the draft bill as it was then, uh, I, I do want to acknowledge that the um, department uh, treated me as the shadow minister very well and I think answered every inquiry I made in regard to the policy issues related to the fund and, and the site selection processes that had been undertaken to that date, including the community consultation processes that had been undertaken. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, this um, is a bill that, in fact, has taken 40 odd years. The process that began with the 1978, I want to emphasise that, the 1978 meeting of Commonwealth State and Territory Health Ministers and State and Territory Ministers that asked for the Commonwealth to coordinate a national approach to the management of radioactive waste and the development of relevant codes of practice. And what uh, concerned me in the consultations that I undertook in these matters, uh, as a former science minister, the um, failure of the previous attempts to develop uh, an effective strategy here is something that I felt very deeply. Because there are times when we have genuine national projects, national interest projects, that go to 
the welfare of the entire nation. And this issue is one of those. We simply cannot understand the importance of the nuclear technologies that this country uses without understanding the need to deal with the safe disposal of the byproducts of the enormous benefits that come from the use of those technologies. And frankly, since the 1970s, this country has failed to face up to those responsibilities. Despite our international obligations, despite the extraordinary advances in those technologies, and despite the ubiquitous uses of those technologies, we as a nation have failed to deal with the consequences of the use of those technologies. And so this bill provides us with an opportunity to begin, hopefully, the next phase of meeting those international and national interest responsibilities. See, for decades, a panzer has warned us that it's just simply not tenable to keep storing waste at Anstos facility at Lucas Heights and at the various other sites around the country. It's simply not tenable to have nuclear waste left in filing cabinets. It's simply not tenable to use nuclear technology throughout industry to have a situation where one in two of us are relying upon the benefits of nu uh, nuclear and radiopharmaceuticals for health purposes, where one third of all procedures used in modern hospitals involve radiation and radioactivity, and where, what, 500,000 doses a year are produced by ANSTO and not deal with the consequences of that. Now, we've been faced with a situation where we've got something just short of 1,000 cubic metres of low-level waste uh, in the country at the moment. Dating back in Syro sites in Port Melbourne, and soil, uh, sites, uh, you know, gloves and plastics and filters and other industrial equipment. And we've had some 3,700 cubic metres of intermediate level waste from radio pharmaceutical production. We simply have been told for far too long that the facilities at Anstow simply are not able to cope with it and that sooner or later they'll be exhausted. We can't have a situation where uh, we are faced with uh, one proposal after another being defeated because it can't meet the various requirements of both the science and the politics of the development of such a facility. Now, it struck me that the idea of the reverse auction was the appropriate way to go. That is to, for the 22 sites that were in fact proposed, that provide opportunities that meet the scientific criteria, and that's why the Academy of Science strongly supports these particular sites uh, that meet those criteria, uh, to provide the communities with the opportunities to engage in a proper process of consultation and to provide the necessary social infrastructure to support community development at those sites. And the $31 million that's provided here certainly helps in that proposal. The capacity, however, to understand the reach of nuclear technology means that these methods can't be held up all the time or forever, as they have been throughout the various measures. And at the back of the Senate report, there is a list of various activities that have been undertaken throughout that. Uh, period of the last 43 years in an attempt to find a solution to this fundamental national problem of dealing with the byproducts of the nuclear manufacturing 
capabilities in this country. And whether it be through the use of facilities in the measurement in mines or measurement even in this parliament we use it, you know, the illuminous signs that we use in this chamber, the security at the front desk we use nuclear facilities, uh, nuclear technologies. We uh, use it in, in civil construction uh, and so many other ways. The amendments the government has proposed removing the most contentious element of the bills since it was first released goes some measure to dealing with the questions that remain outstanding. And I trust that uh, the judicial processes don't lead to further delays. I note that in regards to the consultation for Indigenous uh, communities that the uh, matter there in terms of Wangara people, the native, there are no native titles issues in regard to the site specific in this bill. Um, that, however, that, and as the report makes clear, the Senate report makes clear, the native titles has been extinguished at those specified sites. The Aboriginal heritage, uh, either tangible or intangible, may still be present. And the land is voluntarily nominated by owners for selection of the site for the facility and that the processes for acquiring additional land to extend the site for the purpose of establishing an operating facility at all whether road access are included in the consultation process. They are, of course, matters in terms of the electoral system that went through a judicial process to the point of the federal court full bench. A point worth emphasising. There has already been a judicial review process of the balloting process itself. So the determination that others have to have further legal challenge to this is entirely consistent with this. The amendments that the government's moving, I understand the Labor Party is not pressing their amendments on that matter, but that will provide uh, for passage of this, this legislation and provide for a further level of judicial review. The $31 million from the community fund is still part of the legislation. That, of course, provides for support, for community support, $20 million, $8 million over four years to improve skills base, and $3 million for further Aboriginal economic heritage plan. A total of 45 jobs for this site. Now, on top of that, there's 35 jobs at the Australian Radio Waste Agency. That's uh, an extraordinary economic opportunity that comes through this process as well. Now, they might seem small steps, but they're important ones. And while I know that those who have a hostility to nuclear energy and the nuclear fuel cycle will be unhappy about any aspect of this, there are rigorous safety precautions built into this proposal. And as far as I can tell, that's why the Academy of Science is so strongly supportive of it. All the rigorous scientific basis to site selection and processes have been satisfied. This is, as I say, a matter of genuine national interest, and that 40-year search for a permanent site may well be able to be dealt with properly. The national safety standards laid down by the International Atomic Energy Agency are being met and monitored by the national but by a PANSA. Now, PANSA is supposed to keep the national inventory in terms of our waste. They are not doing a very good job of it. They are not providing proper scrutiny on what's happening in private industry, in our universities and at the state level. The PANSA itself has 140 barrels left over from its days as a Commonwealth Radium Laboratory. That will be presumably moved to this site. But a PANSA has to do a better job in terms of its monitoring of the, the, our inventory on these issues. If it wants to act as the world-class regulator, it has to actually make sure it regulates the entire industry, including that at the state and at pri the private sector. And the endeavour will only succeed if all parts of the, the government the department, the agencies, the regular work together in a common interest and handle this matter properly and in a manner 
that is able to maintain our global reputation in terms of nuclear research and our capacity in terms of the manufacturing of radiopharmaceuticals, where we ought to be world leaders. ENSTO is one of the great gems of the Australian research community. I have long been a strong supporter of ENSTO. You cannot rely on this being used as a the storage site in tin sheds on wooden stilts using drums for the storage of waste. A PANS in the past has made it clear that that licensing requirement will come to an end. And so has itself made it also clear it simply cannot provide the room in the future for the store as a storage facility. It is totally inadequate as a site for the storage of waste materials. Totally inadequate. On scientific grounds alone, it should be rejected. So those that say just leave it where it is are ignoring the fundamental principles that's required in terms of our national and international obligations for the proper storage of waste materials. We as a parliament have an obligation to act now, to decide now and to be guided in making this decision in what is genuinely a national interest concern. And it is a matter that is long overdue and given that it's now 40 odd years since we started on this journey, it is surely timely that we do so. Senator Still John. Thank you. Uh, to talk about the history of and management of radioactive and nuclear materials uh, in Australia, we must uh, talk about race. We must talk about racism. We must talk about the reality of colonisation and of stolen land and of the systemic and purposeful exclusion of First Nations people from decision-making processes from the very beginning of the existence of the country now known as Australia upon this ancient continent. I had the opportunity a couple of years back to visit the Songlines exhibition uh, when it was uh, hosted by the National Museum here in the ACT. And as part of that exhibition, uh, there was uh, an incredibly powerful um, co-located piece of digital immersive art which took you into uh, the first person experience of uh, a traditional owner. Um, that was uh, affected by the Maralinga uh, nuclear testing. Um, many First Nations people were not informed uh, that the tests were going ahead. And this art exhibition took you through their perspective and lived experience uh, as the mushroom cloud rose high into the sky. And then took you on a journey to hear directly from the voices and lived experiences of survivors, speaking about what it was like to hear the noises and uh, see the smoke and the mist move through the towns, and then to watch old people lose their sight, it had an incredible impact on me. Now, I'm from WA, and uh, our state has a long history. Um, with these particular debates around the storage of nuclear waste. Um, it is often, it has been in the past, uh, proposed many times uh, that such a facility be hosted in Western Australia. And every single time, just like every single time this proposal is put anywhere in the country, there's a common thread, there's a common dynamic. And that dynamic is white people rocking up into a community and saying, 
Guess what, everybody? We've got the most toxic and deadly substance known to humanity. It's currently being stored a bit close to where nice, rich white people live, and that's a bit worrying for the nice, rich white people who vote for us at elections. Would you mind if we took this awful, toxic substance, which we dug up and developed, despite the fact that you shared with us stories going back tens of thousands of years about the urgent need to keep it in the ground, would you mind if we just took it and dumped it on your lands? And while we're at it, would you mind if we also served as a global nuclear dumping ground? Surely that would be okay with you. Because, you know, we've said there's going to be all these protections and all of these things we're going to do to make it safe for you. And you know that every time in the past when we've come to you and said, hey, we've got this idea, there'll be all these protections in place. We've always lived up to our promises, haven't we? That is the common thread. We've got some stuff that we don't want in our backyard. Let us put it in yours. And this time is a real kicker, because this time what is proposed is to take the material stored at the Lucas Heights reactor in, the Scott, in Scott Morrison's electorate in his backyard and put it in South Australia, put it on traditional lands uh, through a process which has excluded traditional owners. Now, these are only conversations that are able to be had in this country because of the continuing existence of systemic racism and the differential power that exists in this nation between white people with money and black First Nations people without. Another common thread of these stories is black people, First Nations people, pushing back, banding together, calling for support from allies in the broader community and shooting these proposals down, despite the fact that in this country it is reflectively expected that you as a black person will defer, that you as a First Nations person will be quiet and sit down, and maybe, if you're lucky, you know, produce a bit of art that we can put on our walls. Oh, isn't that pretty? Oh, we're the longest con we are hosting the longest uh, continuing culture in the history of humanity. And oh, yes, let's roll that out, particularly in international spaces. But when the rubber hits the road, and it's decision-making time, you are meant, as a First Nations person in this country, to shut up, sit down and let the process go ahead. And if you're consulted, you're lucky, and that consultation is considered consent. And any deferral from that is uh, responded to with derision and dismissal. And we have had this afternoon in this very chamber an example of that. I sat here as Senator Thorpe the duly elected senator for Victoria, my honoured colleague, gave her perspective, her contribution to this debate as the Greens representative on First Nations issues. And she spoke about the views of First Nations owners. And she spoke about the nature of the injustice. And she spoke about the risks to sacred sites. And she spoke the truth of the history. And from the gallery, what did we hear? An old white male voice utter the words, bullshit. Now I looked to my right and I wondered who that might be. Never seen the guy in my life before. Ladies and gentlemen, who was it? No other than Owen Ramsey, the member for Grey, in whose electorate uh, these dumps are being proposed. Point of order. Chair, uh, it's a reflection on someone else, even though he got the person's name wrong. It was not a statement of fact, and you've actually already ruled on it. Senator Stewart John, I've already order. ruled on it. 
that I did not hear, I did not hear it, and you're impugning a member of the, no of the other house. Withdraw that. That is what he said. Standing up there, standing up there, he ruled my colleague's contribution as bullshit, because he forgot that he is not in the House of Representatives, and that while that might pass over there, this is the Senate, the Federal Senate of Australia, and you have no right, as a member of the House of Representatives, to come into this chamber and heckle my colleague from the gallery and rule her contribution to be bullshit. This is her workplace, and it is completely John, unacceptable Senator behaviour. Senator I have dealt with the matter. I ask you to move on. And it is an example of exactly the point that I am making that structural racism exists in this country, that there is an expectation upon First Nations people when their sovereignty is violated, when their country is trashed, when this awful substance that white people don't want in their backyard is shipped off to their lands, there is an expectation that First Nations people defer, sit down and shut up. And when a colleague of mine refuses to do that, you get heckled from the gallery. That's what it looks like. Now, as noted in the co contribution of my colleague, Senator Hanson Young, and I must acknowledge the work that her and her team have done uh, in opposing this legislation, uh, she made the observation that it seems to have been, I think, uh, South Australia's missed luck uh, now to have been identified to be the site uh, of this unnecessary waste dump. And it is something South Australia and Western Australia share a certain history as being selected uh, by the other states of the Federation to host these facilities. And the Greens in Western Australia also share a history of opposing such developments. I want to pay tribute here also to Giz Watson, uh, to Robin Chappell, uh, to Scott Ludlam uh, and to uh, Rachel Seawitt, who have all uh, in their time uh, contributed greatly to the anti-nuclear movement in WA and made sure that it had uh, a voice in state and federal par uh, parliament, whether it be uh, for the, against the Ranger, uh, jo the Pangea, sorry, uh, resources uh, venture, uh, whether it be uh, many of the other forms that that same project took. Uh, Greens have been on the front lines of those campaigns and opposed them every step of the way. Uh, it also needs to be noted, as was noted by my colleague, uh, that the process uh, that has gone through to identify uh, Kimber particularly as one that has excluded traditional owners. And the real kicker, of course, which is that our national peak body, the Australian Radiation uh, Protection and Nuclear Safety, Safety Agency, has ruled uh, that the intermediate level waste facility at Lucas Heights is secure and in line with best practice for the storage of nuclear waste. So our own body says where it is now is where it should be. We know that international best practice tells us that the number one thing you should not do with radioactive waste is double handle it. And yet that is what this project would entail. Now the reality is that nuclear waste, as I've said, is one of the most toxic and dangerous materials in existence. That is why the safest place for uranium and nuclear uh, byproducts is in the ground, having not been taken out in the first place. And yet it is the want of both sides of this chamber over many decades to bow to the pressure of the mineral in an alternative universe uh, where there is a need for nuclear power in this country uh, and where the member for New England is a fit and proper person to be Deputy Prime Minister. In conclusion, let me say that the continuing reality 
of the way in which First Nations people are treated in these discussions is an ongoing national shame to this nation. What we are seeing here is a can being kicked down the road through First Nations communities. We are seeing the Prime Minister uh, get this stuff out of his electorate and into the backyards of all South Australians and particularly traditional owners. It is a proposal that we in the Greens oppose, and proudly so. And we will continue to work with traditional owners. We will, consider, we will continue to listen to First Nations voices uh, and support folks to oppose this proposal at every step of the way. Thank the Chamber for its time. Senator Small. In Deputy President, and at the outset, let me say that, like most of my colleagues on the government benches, I don't come to this place to stereotype and to divide by any means, but let alone how someone looks. And yet the arguments in this very important national conversation, which, as Senator Carr rightly pointed out, are approaching some four decades in the making. Instead, today we've heard people described as white and as black, and therefore it follows they hold particular views. And I think that's an outrageous affront to the rights of Australians to determine their own world views, to exercise the liberties and choices that we would consider to be uh, in accordance with fundamental values. So let's talk about what we're actually doing with this important national conversation. And what we're actually doing is bringing uh, legislation before the parliament to allow a site to be specified for a national facility to enable some $20 million uh, to, to flow through a community fund and provide support around uh, the local community where this facility does eventually uh, become uh, constructed and provide clear links between the operation of the Act and the relevant constitutional heads of power. These are important steps in what I consider to be uh, an essential step for our nation as we seek to develop a, a nuclear industry, because I'm a big supporter of a nuclear industry, not only for its potential in power and generation in time, but also for the benefits of nuclear medicine and a sovereign capability that, frankly, allows us to participate on the world stage in this way. The need for a national radioactive waste management facility has been recognised for decades, and finally, this government is getting on with the job of getting it done. The operation of this facility will greatly improve the safety and security of radioactive waste management in Australia. In addition, it will bring science and technology together to allow Australia to join some of our key international partners at the forefront of the nuclear industry. There have been unsuccessful efforts to identify a suitable site in the past. But this proposal allows for the permanent disposal of low-level waste and temporarily to store intermediate-level waste until a suitable permanent disposal facility could be constructed. That's expected to take several decades, in part due to the intransigence of parties like the Greens, who won't engage in a reasoned and rational discussion on matters of national importance. This is a project which can be used as an important precedent for supporting the creation of a nuclear industry here in Australia, where we are well suited to deal with the challenges and the complexities of handling nuclear substances due to our impeccable track record of high safety standards in this space. It's not well known, for instance, that we've had three nuclear reactors operating in Australia uh, on and off for some decades. That is a track record which speaks to our capacity to, to lead the way in the development of a nuclear Order, industry. Order, Senator Small. You'll be in continuation when debate resumes. It being 2 p.m. Questions without notice. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. Senator, who is the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia? The minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Reynolds. Um, Michael McCormack, uh, until other swearing-in processes are in place. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Order. Order. 
Senator Green, a supplementary question. Who's going to be on the Thank you, Mr. President. Is Mr. Morrison's preference for net zero by 2050 the position of the Morrison Joyce government? Senator Reynolds. Uh, the position has not changed. The Prime Minister overseas and, uh, again, the Foreign Minister yesterday uh, has made it very clear. Order. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When asked whether the Nationals' party room would be supportive of net zero, uh, Mr Pitt said, and I quote, I think they'd be unsupportive. Is it Deputy Prime Minister Alex Mr Joyce's intention to make the Nationals opposition to net zero emission part of the coalition agreement? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr President. Thank you for the question. This government's been very clear that we want to get to net zero as quickly as possible. This is a global problem in need of a solution that works right across the world. Uh, we need to make net zero practically achievable for us all, and we are taking action now to get the technologies right that enable us to get there. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Minister Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is not only securing our country's economic future, but has ensured that more Australians are in work today than ever before. Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for the question. And in doing so, I of course acknowledge uh, that he is an employer. He knows what it's like to have sleepless nights, and he also knows what it's like to be able to embrace the Morrison government's policies uh, to ensure that he is able to expand his business and employ more staff. Mr President, the Morrison Order. government's plan for Australia, our economic plan, it is giving businesses the confidence they need to employ more Australians. And we saw this last week when the Labor force figures for Order. May Order. were handed Senator down. Cash, please resume your seat. I, Senator Watt, I'm going to be strict on you this week. You have incessantly and continuously interjected. It's only Monday at 2.05. I need to be able to hear Senator Cash. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And only just last week, what we saw with the labour force figures being handed down was that unemployment in Australia dropped by 0.4 points to 5.1 per cent. And in fact, that is lower than when Labor was last in office. When they were last in office in August 2013, it was 5.8 per cent. We also saw employment figures that well exceeded the market expectations, with 115,000 more Australians in work in the month of May. What we've also seen is seven months of continuous employment growth, and there are now 130,000 more Australians in work than we had prior to COVID-19. We also have record female employment, with 6,255,000 females in work across Australia, and we have 97,500 more females employed Prior that more than prior to the pandemic, we also have, Mr. President, record male employment with 6,870,200 in work across Australia, and that's actually 32,900 more males in employment than prior to COVID-19. We've also seen Australians putting up their hands and saying they have confidence in the labour market with the participation rate rising 0.3 percentage points to 66.2 per cent. So, Mr President, we're putting in place the right economic policies to help Order. businesses to employ Senator Cash. more Australians. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. And because I'm sure the minister's not done yet, can I ask how this government is backing small businesses and Australian employers to create more jobs, not only now, but into the future? Order. Order. I'll call Senator Cash when, I, when there's silence. Senator Cash. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And again, as Senator Small knows, as a small business person himself, the Morrison government's economic plan is backing businesses and it's given them the confidence they need to take on new staff. Mr. President, we know that businesses create jobs, not just government, but businesses. Governments put in place the policy frameworks for businesses to lever off, to prosper, grow, and to create more jobs for Australians, which is certainly what we are seeing under our government. Our expensing measures and our lost carryback measures. They're helping businesses reinvest in themselves. We're backing those businesses who have the capacity to invest in themselves. We're saying to them, invest in your business, grow your business and employ more Australians. We also see business confidence now at a record high, and we're also seeing business investment continuing to grow. And what this shows is that the Morrison government is putting in place the right economic framework, the right economic policies across Australia to help businesses prosper, grow, Order. and Senator create Tash. more jobs. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How is the government supporting Australians of all ages to gain new skills and therefore secure jobs now and into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, our government is backing Australians to gain, in particular, new skills right across the economy. The Morrison government invested around $7 billion in skills last year to help Australia's pipeline of skilled workers. In this year's budget, we have continued our support to back Australians to upskill and reskill, and in particular, we have expanded our boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy, providing an additional $2.4 billion, and which has now seen more than 157,000 apprentices come on board and find a place in around 60,000 businesses across Australia. That's a good thing, Mr President, putting in place the right policy incentives so that businesses are able to take on a new apprentice and create new jobs for Australians. We're also expanding access for Australians to free or low-cost training by again working with the states and territories and increasing capacity in our job Order, trainer Senator fund. Cash. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. When asked whether net zero by 2050 is a position of the Morrison government, the Minister for Foreign Affairs said on Insiders on Sunday, and I quote, it is the clear position that the PM has articulated. Is net zero by 2050 a position of the Morrison-Joyce government? Yes or no? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President, and I thank Senator Keneally for her question. Indeed, as the Prime Minister has made clear, it is important for Australia to drive towards net zero emissions, to play its role in terms of the development of new technologies, to invest in technologies, not taxes, as those opposite would have, uh, have, to make sure that in doing so, Australia, which has been such a crucial leader in relation to energy sources in the past, continues to be a crucial leader in the delivery of energy sources now and into the future. That's why, Mr. President, that's why, Mr. President, Whilst Order. at the G7 and associated meetings, the Prime Minister was furthering on the policy commitments made in terms of the Order. pursuit of hydrogen hubs around the country, the pursuit of the target, the stretch target to achieve hydrogen delivered at $2 per kilogram, and to make sure that we have strong international partnerships in that regard. The Prime Minister Order. pursued agreements whilst overseas and signed them with Germany and Singapore for hydrogen cooperation with those key economies and key investors Order. in Australia, Senator as Green. we have done and pursued with Japan as well. And it's this type of investment, this type of investment by coalition governments that has enabled Australia to reduce its emissions, not with the taxes of those proposed opposite. Order. Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Keneally on a point of order. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Relevance. The, the question was fairly tight and clear. Is net zero a position of the Morrison-Joyce government, yes or no? I can't instruct the minister the terms in which he or she must answer the question. As long as the minister is directly relevant to it, and I think the minister is clearly being directly relevant to it, there's a chance after question time to debate, debate ministers' answers. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, Australia beat its Kyoto-era targets by some 459 million tonnes. Australians' emissions are down over 20 per cent 
from the period 2005 to December 2020. And that's compared with an OECD average of 6.6 per cent. This is what achieves a pathway to net zero by achieving real emissions reductions through real investment in real technologies. Order. Order. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Payne also said that net zero by 2050 is, quote, the broad position of the Australian government and, quote, a sensible position. Is net zero by 2050 a position that was agreed by the Morrison McCormick cabinet? If so, will it be revised by the Morrison Joyce cabinet? You bet your bottom. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, it is a sensible position. It is a sensible position. It is an important position for Australia to play our role, but most crucially for Australia to ensure that we continue to drive the investment and attract the investment in the technologies that will get us towards net zero, but do so whilst protecting the jobs and businesses and livelihoods of Australians. And that will for all, for all, forever remain the coalition government's priority, the, projection of, the protection of jobs and businesses across Australia, ensuring that we make sure those businesses can operate with the technology, with the support, with the investment. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mr President, uh, uh, the point of order is direct relevance, and I understand the position you have previously articulated. Senator Keneally's question, though, was a direct question about what the position of the Cabinet was. Uh, and the, 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 the minister, the, the minister saying, you know, giving us a long lecture about how you might approach a target, that when the question is only whether or not the target is, is his government's position. I mean, we are we are having a discussion about direct relevance on a question to the leader of the government in the Senate about what right, the Senator government's Wong, I've, position I've, I've, is. I'll add you to remind the minister of the second part. I, I thought the minister engaged with that at the start. He's got 16 seconds remaining, but he is also entitled to address the quotation that was used in the question and remain directly relevant to the question. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I was asked whether it was a sensible position, Order. and I said— Order. Senator Keneally. I'm sorry, direct relevance. Uh, the minister says he was asked if it was a sense sorry. of position. He was not. Sorry, he Senator was asked if it was a position I allowed, of his government. I allowed, I allowed the Leader of the Opposition to, to restate the question in some detail. Um, the, 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 the minister is entitled to address any or all parts of a question. Senator Birmingham. I was asked whether the position, as articulated by the Foreign Minister, that it was a sensible position is the government's position. Of course it is the government's position, Mr President. Of course it is, and the government is determined to make sure Order. we continue Senator to Birmingham. drive investment Time for the into has expired. The... Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In an op-ed in The Australian in February, Nationals leader Barnaby Joyce wrote, and I quote, the Nationals have always oppo been opposed to a net zero target. If the Nationals supported net zero emissions, we would cease to be a party that could credibly represent farmers. Will Mr Morrison rule out abandoning his preference for net zero emissions by 2050 in any revised coalition agreement? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, the Prime Minister has made clear the government's position. I am confident the government's position in relation to supporting investment in driving towards net zero and seeking to achieve that, in seeking to achieve that as quickly Order. as is possible and practical, Order. whilst not applying taxes like those opposite would, whilst instead investing in the technologies that are necessary to get those outcomes, Order. remains indeed the position. Now, I note the new leader of the Nationals was asked about this very matter in his press conference prior to, uh, prior, just immediately prior to question time. And Mr Joyce made clear that he'd be consulting with his party room, having discussions, having discussions Order. with the Prime Minister. But I assure the Order Senate and Senator Keneally as well, Mr President, the government has made clear and the Prime Minister has made clear Australia's position in international discussions to the Australian people. That remains the position, Mr President. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to Australia's outstanding Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. 
can the minister outline to the Senate what the Morrison government has done to ensure superannuation works harder for all Australians? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Scar Senator for this very Ayers. important question. Mr. President, the Australian Senator superannuation Ayers. system manages over three trillion dollars in Senator retirement Reddick. savings on behalf of 16 million Australians. Australians pay around 30 Senator billion dollars a year Watt. in superannuation fees, more than 27 billion. Uh, more than the $27 billion uh, million dollars that households spend on energy bills and the $12 billion that they spend on water bills. These on, those on this side of the chamber are ensuring that superannuation works harder for all Australians. All Australians, Order. all reforms since coming to government, have been putting billions back into the pockets of Australians' retirement, giving Australians choice and making the superannuation system transparent for the first time, protecting your super, capping fees on low balances and reuniting small and inactive accounts to active ones, putting members' interests first, removing inappropriate insurances from young people that erodes their balances. And now I'm very proud that we have passed the Your Future, Your Super package, opposed by those opposite, that will create efficiencies, reduce costs and remove duplication in the superannuation system. The package is the Morrison government's next step towards modernising and improving the superannuation system to ensure that it works harder for all Australians. Treasury estimate that this package will add around $17.9 billion to Australians' superannuation balances over the next decade, and it will do so in four ways. When you change job, your superannuation will follow you. A new online super comparison tool covering performance and fees will make it easier to find the best super fund for you. There will be clear standards for performance, and when clarifying that funds that funds have to act in your best financial interest. For too long, some funds have relied on people not knowing what they're up to. With the Morrison government's reforms, they won't be able to get away with the rip-off any longer. Senator Hume, yeah. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate what the government has done to ensure Australians are not forced, forced into duplicate accounts? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. The Treasury estimates that around 6 million multiple accounts are held by 4.4 million Australians. Now, to address this, from 1 November 2021, when you change jobs, your superannuation fund will move with you. And if you don't know your superannuation details, your employer will check with the ATO to find your active super account. So no more accidentally doubling up your fees, doubling up your insurance premiums and losing money to super accounts that you didn't even know existed. It's important to note, Mr President, that thanks to the coalition government, you still have choice. You will always have choice. Your super fund will now move with you, but you have the option to change that fund at any time. If your fund is underperforming, you can seek a fund with lower fees. You are able to do this. Your employer can't stop you, because, and nor will this measure. Treasury estimates that this change will increase superannuation savings by around $2.8 billion over the next decade, straight back into the retirement funds of hardworking Australians. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate what the government is doing to hold underperforming accounts or funds to account? Senator Hume. Mr President, super funds have an important job, and that is to grow Australians' retirement savings. Though all too often, when a fund has underperformed, members either don't find out about it or they don't know that they're underperforming. They've been able to hide behind the skirts of the good performing funds. In fact, around $100 billion of Australians' money is in underperforming superannuation products, and around 3 million superannuation accounts are in underperforming superannuation products. The Productivity Commission estimates that once your future, your super measures kick in, approximately 25 of the current 80 or so My Super products will fail the performance test. Mr. President, the Labor Party may have introduced superannuation to Australia, but by goodness, it's taken a coalition government to make it work in the interest of members yeah. rather than super fund managers. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Order on my left. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. The proposed changes to Standard 3 of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission Regulation of 
2013 have been labelled by the Law Council as unnecessary and cumbersome and inconsistent with the objects of the ACNC Act. Others say these regulations will have a chilling effect on the lawful policy advocacy by charities. They, are buried, they will bury them in red tape and stop charities from working to improve the lives of Australians. Why is the government making these changes? Why shouldn't the sector see this as an attack on the, uh, as an attack on the ability for them to advocate? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. I thank uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Seward for um, for her question. Um, it, <laughs> it is always nice to get uh, to get a detailed policy question, although although sometimes um, although sometimes when uh, when it is particularly precise detail, uh, it uh, it can be a challenge to be able to provide the granular information that the senator may wish to uh, to receive in response initially. Uh, Mr President, uh, look, I'll take the Senator's question on notice and, uh, and provide a swift response to the Chamber for her. Senator Seward, a supplementary question. I thought that was a fairly simple question. It was about why are you doing it? The government claims this is implementing the recommendations of the ACNC expert panel, when the panel actually explicitly recommended that that standard be repealed. How is this implementing the recommendation if the council said or the expert panel said it should be repealed? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, th thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, for Senator Seward, but I don't have a copy of the recommendation uh, in front of me, uh, or, uh, or indeed the detail in terms of the uh, in terms of the Order. response. Um, I am happy to provide for the senator as much information as, uh, as I can on notice in relation to the specific issue that, uh, that she has raised, uh, and will endeavour to do so as promptly as we can. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. The proposed changes allow the ACNC Commissioner to make judgments on potentially unlawful activities by charities. If a charity breaks the law, shouldn't it be dealt with under the criminal law and, in, fa in fact, under Standard 5? Senator Birmingham. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, I mean, certainly, if laws are broken, then it ought to be handled under criminal law. Equally, uh, if laws are broken in the administration and operation of a charity, then I would imagine that uh, that Australians would expect there should be consequences for the operation of the charity itself as well. Uh, so, uh, so, Mr. President, uh, again, I'm happy to provide further detail in responding to Senator Seward, uh, given I don't have full information on, uh, on the specific issues she's raised before me. However, Order, I, I appreciate Seward. Senator Seward uh, would like to debate the issue right now, uh, and I apologise to her that, uh, that I don't have uh, the information that she would wish uh, to detail right now, but I will undertake, as I have, to make sure I provide those details back to the Chamber. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today the Prime Minister held an emergency National Cabinet meeting with the sole agenda item being the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Liberal New South Wales Premier Berejiklian has said she will request more supply of vaccines from the Commonwealth, saying, and I quote, if we had more doses of Pfizer, we could get them out through our New South Wales state government mass vaccination hubs. Why has the Morrison government failed to ensure enough supply of Pfizer doses in New South Wales, which is now facing a new COVID-19 outbreak? Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank Senator for the question. Uh, Senator is correct. There was a national cabinet meeting held this morning with the primary uh, issue on the agenda, the national vaccine rollout, Mr. President. Uh, and, at, and at that meeting this morning, uh, the Coordinator General of Operation COVID Shield, L Lieutenant General uh, Fruin, provided each state and territory uh, with planning projections of Pfizer and AstraZeneca doses for their jurisdictions uh, over the remainder of this year, Mr. President so that the states and territories can effectively plan their vaccine rollout, Mr President. The Coordinator-General confirmed that um, 
Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccinations uh, allocations are being provided on a proportional population basis so that each state and territory uh, uh, to each state, to each, uh, uh, Mr. President, and the government uh, remains on track to offer every eligible Australian uh, a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine by the end of 2021. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Victoria's acting premier James Molino has warned the country is headed into winter without enough supply of COVID-19 vaccines and has slammed the national vaccine rollout as an, and I quote absolute shambles. Can the minister guarantee that the Morrison government will supply sufficient doses to meet demand for each week through July? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator, for the question. As I've just indicated, uh, state premiers and territory leaders were updated this morning on the supply projections for COVID-19 vaccines out to the end of 2021. Mr. President, uh, the state leaders uh, agreed that they would continue to prioritise uh, Category 1A and 1B and the, uh, vac uh, people seeking vaccines during that period of time, Mr. President. Uh, and so, uh, so, so, Mr. President, uh, we, we will continue to work cooperatively with the states and territories on the national vaccine rollout to ensure that Australians, uh, as we've indicated, have the opportunity to get a first dose of the vaccine by the end of 2021. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. When New South Wales and Victoria are experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks and the Morrison government's vaccine rollout is an absolute shambles, why is the Morrison-Joyce government more focused on rolling each other than rolling out the vaccine. Senator Colbeck. Order. Order. Mr. Mr. President. Order. Senator Colbeck, I'll ask you to resume your seat till there's the chamber extends a courtesy of silence to you on both sides. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as is clearly demonstrated by the Prime Minister calling a national cabinet meeting this morning to specifically discuss the vaccine rollout, demonstrates the Prime Minister and the government's focus on the vaccine rollout. That was the point of having the meeting to discuss with the states and territories the rollout of the vaccination process, Mr. President. And we will continue to uh, maintain that focus, Mr. President. The Prime Minister will continue to maintain that focus. The whole purpose of the discussion this morning was to ensure that the states and territories had the information available to them that they needed to coordinate the supply and, and the rollout of the vaccination process so that every Australian who wants a vaccine by the end of the year can get one. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to Senator Reynolds as Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Minister, in 2011, the Productivity Commission estimated a national disability insurance scheme would cover 411,000 participants at a co gross cost of $13.6 billion when fully implemented. A half a percentage point rise in the Medicare levy was introduced in the 2013 budget to help fund it. It is now forecast that the cost of the scheme will rise to a staggering $30 billion plus by 24-25, with a projected 530,000 participants costing more than Medicare costs for the whole nation and could blow out to $130 billion by the 2030s. Minister, what is the government going to do to rein in the cost of the NDIS so that it is sustainable and affordable to taxpayers? Order. The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question, and I also thank her for her passion and commitment uh, to this extraordinary, globally unique scheme. The Australian government is ensuring that this, this world-first scheme, uh, and remember, it is, this is a scheme for people with significant and permanent disabilities, and we are doing everything we can to ensure that that continues for many generations to come. 
Today, there are 450,000 Australians on the NDIS, 50% uh, of those for the first time. And as Senator Hanson has said, that is a significant increase over what was anticipated in 2011, both in terms of the number of participants and the average cost of uh, the packages. So we've, not only have we seen more people enter the scheme, which again I think says so much about the goodness in Australians, their, their heart and their ability and their commitment to pay for this, but it also does mean uh, that we have sustainability issues now with the scheme, Senator Hanson. So the average payment per participant has increased by almost 48 per cent over the last three years alone, and that is a 12.5 per cent increase every year, which, as all of us in this chamber know, is not a sustainable growth trajectory uh, for the taxpayers into the future. Now, the NDIS will always be fully funded under the Morrison government, which is why over the last two budgets alone we have made a commitment of an additional $17.1 billion—$17,000 million to actually fully fund the NDIS over the forward estimates. And this takes the total investment in the NDIS to $121 billion over the next four years, which, as Senator Hanson has said, will make it more expensive now for taxpayers Order. than Medicare. Senator Reynolds. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Unlike other government benefits, there is no means testing of recipients of NDIS assistance. Is it fair that people on other benefits are means tested while people on NDIS, regardless of income or wealth, are not? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator Hanson, for the question. Uh, it's important for everybody in this chamber uh, and also for those watching or listening to realise that the NDIS is a social insurance scheme and it is not a welfare scheme. The NDIS is a way of providing individualised support for people with disabilities, their families and also their carers. This means support provided are related to a person's disability and the support that they need, and it's not uh, directly related to their capacity to pay for support. Now, the NDIS was based on the principles of fairness and equality, meaning that your postcode or your socioeconomic circumstances or your means to pay for medical reports should not matter. But sadly, today it still does, and we have much work to do together to actually make sure that that's the case. For example, in the Senator's own home state of Queensland, the average plan budget is $76,000, while in Brisbane, has expired. $88,000. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, I've been advised that under current arrangements, sex worker therapy, that's prostitutes, could cost the taxpayer anything between $400 million and $2 billion each year. Minister, if this is correct, what is the hourly rate for this service? Because I've got the current price guide and I can't find where it costs an hourly rate for it as a, a prostitute. So could you please advise, is that, could that be the cost to the taxpayers and, why are, and what are Order, we paying Senator an hour? Hanson. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, again, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, my predecessor, the Minister for the NDIS, has already uh, discussed this issue at some length and clarified the government's position on this. We do not believe that the use of taxpayer fund, NDIS funds should be used for the service of a sex worker because we don't believe that is in line with community expectations. Nor should we, the NDIS pay for what might otherwise be considered an ordinary living expense. We do recognise that people with disability should be supported to have control over and choices about access to service that pertain to their sexuality to enable them to live an ordinary life. However, should an NDIS participant feel that they need to purchase such services, it should be purchased using their personal income. Reasonable and necessary support must come, we believe, with some boundaries. And I notice that this has uh, bipartisan support and that Mr Shorten has Order. recently endorsed Senator the Reynolds. government's approach Time on this the position. Answer has expired. Senator Van. Thank you. And my question is also to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. 
Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting people with motor neurone disease through the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Mm. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Van for his question on this most important of issues, and one that I know unites everybody in this chamber. Today is Motor Neuron Disease Global Day, and on today we recognise and we also shine a light on motor neuron disease, a cruel and unrelenting degenerative disease. MND is represented by a blue cornflower, which is a symbol of hope, a fragile appearance but hardy in nature. This morning I attended the MND Global Day event here in Parliament House. There I had the privilege to hear Sharon and Peter share their personal journeys with MDS. Seven-year-old Harrison did a wonderful job speaking on behalf of his mother, Sharon, who no longer is able to personally to share her story. Sharon shared her journey since diagnosis at the age of only 34 on her life, her work, her aspirations for herself and a family. Sharon herself described her journey with MND as a nightmare, a journey in which she is seeking as much control as possible so she can provide as normal a life as possible for her husband, Adam, and for her sons, Harrison and Hayden. Peter spoke of the need for hope despite being diagnosed with MSD and how he could maximise control of his life and also the quality of life for him and his family. Now, hope for a cure still remains so elusive, which means we must keep working together to ensure that people with MND and their families have quick and ready access to the supports they need. And this is why NDIS has prioritised people with MND to seek access for the supports that they need, with claims now being completed within five days. The NDI continues to work with the MND associations nationally to ensure that people have the flexible and timely supports, Order. in particular Senator AT, Reynolds, that they need. The answer has expired. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I was, uh, I'm sure everyone would join in welcoming uh, uh, Neil Danaher getting an AO last weekend. Can the minister explain the importance of timely and flexible access to assistive technology and resources for those with MND? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, and again I thank Senator Van uh, for the question. As we all know, the degenerative progression of MND is rapid and it is unrelenting. They call it the thousand-day disease. So, therefore, more flexible assistive technology options is absolutely essential, particularly access to loan equipment to ensure people with MND uh, can get the AT that they need as soon as they need it. Now, I congratulate the MND associations in Australia who are leading the way to provide assistive technology loan libraries for their members. These schemes Order, have been Senator so Chairman. successful that the NDIA last week released an RFI to test. Sorry, Mr. President. I'll, Senator Chisholm, I called you to order already. Senator Reynolds. So on, on an issue like this, a bit of respect at least. Order. Order. So these Senator, schemes order on my set order. Please resume your seat, Senator Reynolds. I've asked at the start of question time for people to restrain themselves, and I've also reminded senators that when I use their name, I expect them to remain silent for a while. Senator Reynolds. Thank you. And I again congratulate the uh, Australian MND associations for leading the way in this space to provide assistive technology loan libraries. The scheme has been so Order. successful that the NDI Time is now looking to do that for expired. children. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what other resources are available to support people with MND and their families, including planning for end of life? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. While the blue cornflower does symbolise hope for people with MND, the sad reality still is today that MND is a terminal illness. So it's important, therefore, for people with MND, their families and their carers to have access to sensitive information and helpful information about the journey that lies ahead. This is why Order. I also Order Senator Chisholm. You're free to I have I haven't called you to order, Senator Reynolds. You're free to continue. 
This is why, this is why today I also announced the release of an end-of-life guide for people living with MND. Being able to plan ahead can reduce the stress for not only those with MND but their families and carers to give them more control over the remainder of their lives. It is not something any of us like to think about, but this planning is important. And can I congratulate MND Australia and also Department of Social Services who have provided the resources uh, for Order. this Senator sadly Reynolds. necessary guide. Time for and the thank answer you. has expired. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Last week, the minister was asked why the Morrison government failed to secure an early agreement for Pfizer vaccines when it had the chance some 12 months ago. The minister took this on notice. So today, Minister, can you inform the Senate of that? Your answer, please. Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Stirl, for the question. You're correct. I have taken the question on notice. Uh, and a, an answer to that question is being prepared and will be provided to the Chamber. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Order. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr President. Can the Minister confirm that by the time Australia took delivery of its first shipment of Pfizer, at least 44 other countries had already begun inoculating their citizens with Pfizer? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, Australians would recall that what, what occurred in this country is that we took a very deliberate approach to the rollout and the approval of vaccines. We didn't, as happened in many other countries, Mr. President, have emergency Order. approvals for the vaccine rollout. We waited and, and, and asked our approval agencies to fully approve the vaccines before we started administering them. We took advantage of the experience in previous countries, in other countries, Order. to understand what was happening with the vaccines and for that data to be utilised as a part of our approval process, Mr. President. So we took a, a process. We took a process where Senator we could Ayers. be able to say to the Australian people that we have undergone a full and thorough assessment of each of the vaccines before they were approved, Order. Mr President, and I think that that was an appropriate thing for us to do. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thanks, Mr President. Order. Minister, how many sorry, Pfizer Senator, doses— Sorry, stop the clock. I can't hear Senator Stirl. That's unusual, isn't it? You, Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr President. How many Pfizer doses per week will the Commonwealth guarantee from today until the end of July 2021? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, that information with respect to the number of doses available of both Pfizer and AstraZeneca was provided to state and territory premiers uh, as a part of the National Cabinet meeting this morning, Mr. President. Order. I, Mr. Order. President, I am happy. I am happy to provide that information to the uh, to the chamber, and I will come back to the chamber as soon as possible with that information because that information hasn't been given to me Order. off the back of the National Cabinet meeting this morning. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the Morrison government's commitment to ensuring more older Australians can live at home for longer? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thank you to Senator Henderson for the question. Mr President, the Morrison government has a strong track record of supporting senior Australians and it has been strengthened through our $17.7 billion investment in aged care announced in the budget. The government understands that many senior Australians want to live at home for longer and we are boosting entry-level support services with an additional $112 million in investment in the Commonwealth Home Support Program. The latest allocation of funding will provide more access to a range of high demand care services including meals, transport, social support, respite, gardening and cleaning for older Australians, their families and for their carers. Mr. President. The recent budget includes $6.5 billion to deliver an additional 80,000 home care packages and will reduce the wait list and give more seniors the opportunity to live in the comfort of their home for longer. 
As part of this allocation, 40,000 home care packages will be delivered in 2021-22 and a further 40,000 in 2022-23, which will make a total of 275,598 packages available to senior Australians by June 2023. Mr. President. Our commitment and investment is already paying off for senior Australians. Between December 2019 and December 2020, home care packages increased by 19 per cent to 173,495 packages. As of 31 May this year, Mr. President, I'm happy to report that 189,369 people have access to a home care package. Mr. President, this government is committed to showing senior Australians the care, dignity and respect they deserve. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate how senior Australians in rural and regional areas, including regional Victoria, will benefit from this record investment? Senator Colbeck. Order, Senator Thank you, Colbeck, Mr. President. Senator O'Neill, I'm going to insist that, that the completely inappropriate interjections that are always in breach of standing orders don't start before the minister gets to their, seat, their feet to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. I thank Mr President. Senator Polly. Uh, the Morrison government's $17.7 million billion investment in aged care includes more than $630 million to improve the access to quality aged care services for senior Australians in regional, rural and remote areas, including special needs groups. Mr President, this targeted investment will support communities identifying as being most in need. To ensure Commonwealth Home Support Program services remain accessible to all eligible senior Australians, providers are required to be as responsive as possible Order. to requests from senior Australians and their carers Senator for short-term or ongoing home support Senator services. Seawitz. To access services, senior Australians, their family or carers can con contact My Aged Care for advice to arrange an assessment of their aged care needs. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline the government's long-term plan for aged care through the recently announced $17.7 billion investment in the budget? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thank you, Senator Henderson, for your question. And you're right. The government recently handed down a $17.7 billion package to deliver once in a generation reform of age, the aged care sector in response to the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety Senator from the report recommendations. Senator Mr President, this package announced in the budget is the largest investment in aged care and the largest response ever to a Royal Commission. Mr. President. Order. The focus through our aged care reforms is to ensure senior Australians have access to high quality and safe services are empowered to have more control and their choice of their care arrangements and are treated with the dignity and respect they res deserve. Mr. President. Every year, under a coalition government, home care packages are up, residential, uh, residential home care places are up, and Order. every year Senator aged Colbert, care funding time is for the up. Answer has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister explain to Australians who, for the last 15 months, have been unable to visit dying loved ones overseas, have been stranded overseas and have been separated from their children, why the Prime Minister gets a leave pass to visit Cornwall and pay respects to his ancestors? Order. The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, well, if Senator Watt really thinks that was the purpose of the Prime Minister's visit, then he pays even less attention to what's going on than I thought was actually possible. Mr. President, as the Prime Minister Order. made Order clear, and indeed sides. as I've referenced in this chamber, as Senator Payne Order. has referenced in this chamber, you'd have thought Senator Watt Senator might have been Watt. listening on any of those occasions. The Prime Minister, whilst at the G7, Order. secured the Australia-UK free trade agreement. Please resume your seat. Um, I, I am not particularly annoyed at the lack of respect shown to me, but this place will become unmanageable if I call senators to order and they don't even have a modicum of respect for the standing orders. 
Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, the Prime Minister secured the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement yeah, yeah. of huge importance to Australian farmers, of huge importance to Australian businesses, of huge importance to ensuring that Australians continue to enjoy the opportunity of more jobs, of more economic Order. growth, the sorts of things that our side Senators of politics Aaron has McKim. delivered for them. Those opposite want to demean the opportunities created by trade and such agreements. They want to demean the opportunities created by the discussions the Prime Minister had, for example, with President Biden and Prime Minister Johnson about the opportunities to talk about the strategic challenges faced in our region and around the world. Very serious challenges, very important discussions that, of Order. course, saw during that, uh, during that time the NATO countries meet and issue statements in relation to China and the challenges we face. The Prime Minister, as well, took the opportunity to engage in bilateral discussions with a number of his different counterparts. Already in this question time, if Senator Watt had been paying any attention, I referenced the fact that hydrogen agreements were signed during the recent trip with Germany, with Singapore, decarbonisation agreements Senator signed. That's it. And this is why Senator Watt Order. doesn't actually remember any of these things, because he doesn't shut up during, during the debate. Order. He doesn't ever listen to any of it. Motormouth Murray over Senator there Watt. just doesn't know Senator when to be quiet, Watt. Mr President. Order. He doesn't know when to be quiet. He won't pay any attention Order. to the achievements. He won't pay any attention to what's accomplished. Time for the answer has expired. Order. I repeat again, it's going to be a particularly long week if it is this noisy. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. Question. We've obviously touched a nerve. <laughs> not mine, Senator Watt. Not yours, you're reflecting Mr. on me. No, Senator no, Watt. He's not, he's Why not. did the Prime Minister pretend this was an unplanned side trip when we know that he had already commissioned the St Cavern Local History Society to research his family tree? Wow. The Prime Minister wouldn't be telling fibs now, would he? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, Mr. President, I, I reject the premise of the question, but Order. Mr. President, you would think, Order. in the midst of a global uh, pandemic, all right, that's Senator Birmingham, please. Senator Watt, I can't hear a word Senator Birmingham is saying with you screaming across the chamber like that. Senator Wong on a point of order. Great relevance in the midst of a global pandemic, maybe hanging out, going or going off to on a Senator side Wong, trip to visit your ancestors. Order, quite Senator not Wong, a please resume your seat, Senator Wong. That is not a point of order. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of a recession, in the order. midst of a recession, order. you've got a situation where our Senator government. This government Order. has helped to ensure Australia's Order. health outcomes Senator are some Birmingham. of the best Senator in the Wong. world. Senator Australia's Wong. economic outcomes are some of the best in the world. You'd think that those opposite might care about the jobs of Australians and want to ask questions to it, about that. But no, they don't. You'd think they might care about the security of Australians and want to ask questions about that. But no, they don't. Do they come in from all of the different meetings and discussions the Prime Minister had when he was overseas and ask about any of those? No, they don't. They're just obsessed with the pettiness. They're obsessed with the smear. What they want to do, of course, is try to win the next election on smear, not policy. Well, we will stand on policy. We will stand on a record of record jobs, of economic growth, of keeping Australians safe, because they're the things Senator that matter Watt. to Australians. Order, order. Senator Wong, you used the term in reference to an individual that is unparliamentary. I ask you to withdraw. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. When Australia was on fire, Scott Morrison ran off to Hawaii. When his vaccine Order, rollout Senator fell apart, McGrath. the Prime Minister or Scott Senator Morrison McGrath. went sightseeing in Cornwall, something no other Australian can do. Why is it that when the going gets tough, Mr Morrison goes on holiday? Senator Henderson, I'm going to ask though, order. I have asked order. I am trying to call those on my right to order, Senator Watt. I have asked those on my left to respect the standing orders during answers. I will ask those on my right to respect the standing orders during questions. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it's the Senator for Smear over there and the opposition tactics completely laid bare. Their tactics for the next election order. are just all about smear, all about denigration. 
They're not going to bother bowling up any policies. They won't ever come clean on whether or not they'll implement lower taxes for Australians. Indeed, we know that taxes will end up being higher Order. for Australians. They won't talk about the substantive issues that Australia faces. They will just engage in the type of dirt digging and smear that they think might get them a cheap headline. Well, on this side, we will continue to stand on our record. We are proud of the fact that Australia's economy is bigger now than it was pre-pandemic and that we are the only economy in the advanced world to have achieved that outcome. We are proud of the fact that more Australians are in jobs today than was the case prior to the pandemic, and we were the first advanced economy in the world to achieve that. We are proud of the fact that most of those jobs coming back have gone to Australian women. We are proud to see full-time jobs Senator coming back, Birmingham's and that lot don't seem to care. The answer has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Order. President. My question— Order. Senator Wong, Senator Hughes is on her feet. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Could the Minister update the Senate on how the childcare system in Australia is supporting women's participation in the workforce? The Minister representing the Minister for Education and Youth, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hughes for the question and for your passion and commitment uh, for the childcare sector. Supporting the economic security of women is a key and enduring priority for this Morrison government. This is, why, this is why we are addressing the barriers to women's workforce participation through record childcare funding. This funding sees $10.3 billion being spent this year, including $9 billion to subsidise the fees set by childcare services. In 2018, the Morrison government overhauled the childcare system to introduce one child care subsidy, offering more support for families with lower incomes who needed it and, and also basing hours of subsidised care on family activities. Three years on, Australian families remain the beneficiaries of this government's child care policies. And in this year's budget, we went further. We announced an additional $1.7 billion to further help Australian families with more than one child, five and under, in those years that are the toughest on the hip pocket for families. By increasing the subsidy for families with a second Senator or third child, five and under, 250,000 Australian families will be better off. This support, uh, will, this support will assist second income earners in a family, often women, who want to return to work and work additional hours. Women's workforce participation has reached a record high of 61.8 per cent under this government, and that is something we are incredibly proud of. And we continue to put in place measures to support women who choose to work or to work more hours in the workforce. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What benefits will families and the broader economy experience from the Morrison government's childcare measures? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President, and thanks again, Senator Hughes. This one budget measure alone will support around 250,000 Australian families each and every year, and these are the families who need it the most. These families will benefit for up to $183 per week for their second child and any further child in the family under five and who is also in care. This means that these families will be better off by $2,260 per year. That is a great outcome for these families. We are also removing the annual cap on subsidies of $10,560 a year, which, is cu which currently only applies to families earning over $189,390. This measure will benefit around 18,000 families and means no family will have an annual cap on their childcare subsidies. Our targeted Order. measures Senator Reynolds, tackle workforce time for the answer has expired. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the government's record childcare funding has delivered access to childcare services and supported economic opportunity since first elected? Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, thank you very much again for the question. Today, over 280,000 more children are in childcare. And women's workforce participation has reached a record high, as I've said, of 61.8 per cent in March of this year, which was up from 58.7 per cent when Labor last left office. And let's never forget, when Labor were in government, fees went up 53 per cent, including a one-year spike of 14.5 per cent. And now, under Labor's so-called universal childcare, a family earning a half a million dollars would receive 50,000 of taxpayers' money for two children in full-time childcare. This universal childcare means they, they really don't care if parents are working to be eligible and they don't really have faith in parents actually deciding what is right for their families. Again, Order. just Senator remember, Reynolds, under this government, we have kept— Senator Reynolds, has expired. Senator Reynolds was— um, Senator Farrell jumped beforehand, um, and the leader of the um, well, Senator Birmingham. Can I ask that further questions be placed on notice? Sorry. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Watt? Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Reynolds and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Green and Keneally. Well, I, more than anyone in this chamber, I think, knows how good a place regional Queensland is. I spent an awful lot of time in there, many family members there, and even just over the last five years I've got to see the fantastic industries, the fantastic people, the fantastic natural environment that regional Queensland has. But for all of that benefit, regional Queensland also has significant challenges. Uh, it needs more jobs. It needs more job security. It needs a government that once and for all will tackle the scourge of casualisation and labour hire that is endemic across regional Queensland. It needs re infrastructure and regional Queensland it needs health services. Now, if you thought that there was any political party represented in this place that would be more concerned about those issues and what regional Queensland really needs, you would think it would be the National Party. You would think it would be the party that holds itself out as being the voice of farmers, of being the voice of regional communities, of being the voice and the advocate for all of those kinds of issues that I've just talked about. But what we've seen over the last few days, particularly today, is the worst rerun of a television program you can ever imagine. That's right, we had yet another Nationals leadership squabble. I've lost count of how many leadership squabbles there have been in the National Party, even in the five years that I've been here. We were reflect reflecting before. We've had the Abbott Truss, Turnbull Truss, Turnbull, Mc uh, Turnbull McCormack, or was there someone in between? There was the Morrison McCormack. Now we're back to the Morrison Joyce. There's probably some combination in there that I can't even remember. There's been so many changes within the National Party because they are so obsessed with fighting themselves rather than doing anything about any of those issues that I've just listed that are of real concern to people in regional Queensland. Where are the National Party when we actually need more jobs in central Queensland or anywhere across Queensland? Where are the Nationals? when we need something actually done about casualisation and labour hire in the mining industry. You can't count on the Nationals to be there. They're too busy dressing up for their next leadership challenge. That's what the Nationals are spending their time on. The Nationals have just become a bunch of babies, a bunch of children, squabbling over a toy. It's like Barnaby's on the one hand with one hand on that toy. I want it, I want it, I want it. And then you've got Michael McCormack. I want it, I want it, I want it. You've got Matt Canavan in between trying to pull one leg out. Senator you've White, got Bridget McKenzie pulling Senator another White, off. I remind you to refer to uh, other senators and MPs by their correct titles. Thank you. You've got every Thank you, Madam Deputy President. You've got every member of the National Party and every senator from the National Party in there squabbling, trying to pull the toy of the National Party leadership apart. All the while, regional Queenslanders are left in the lurch, looking for jobs, looking for job security, looking for an end to casualisation and labour hire, looking for decent health services, looking for infrastructure, all the kind of things 
that the National Party should actually be focusing on. Now, to give their credit, the outgoing leader of the National Party, Mr McCormack, joined by the member for Capricornia, Michelle Landry, today admitted that people in regional Queensland don't want to see the Nationals have another leadership challenge, especially in the middle of a pandemic. But that's exactly what Mr McCormack and Ms Landry's colleagues have served up again today. When regional Queenslanders are wondering when they're going to get their vaccine from this government, instead they get another leadership challenge. When regional Queenslanders are wondering when the National Party will finally do something about casual and labour hire, casualisation of labour hire, they get another leadership challenge from the National Party. And that's what we know lies ahead, because it happens every six months or so. We have leadership after leadership challenge in the National Party, while all these issues in regional Queensland get ignored by the party that claims to represent them. Now, it's all coming to a head, of course, over what this government's policy is around emissions. Uh, if, if anyone knows what this government's position is on net zero emissions is, please come and explain it to me, because I certainly don't know, and I don't think anyone in Australia knows either. We've got the, we've got the, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, claiming that he wants to get to net zero emissions preferably by 2050. We've got the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson out there saying that, we, that Mr Morrison has already committed to net zero emissions by 2050. But of course, we've got Mr Pitt and any number of other National Party members saying that's not the government's position. And in fact, when we were asking Senator Birmingham uh, and other ministers about this today to, to, to agree that the government's position is to get to net zero emissions by 2050, preferably, who was sitting over there shaking her head but the leader of the Nationals in the Senate, Senator Mackenzie? The Nationals have not signed up to this. Thank we do you, not Senator know what White, the government's your position time is. Has expired. Senator Byrne. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Chair. Um, how quickly those opposite forget about uh, squabbles and changes. I, I seem to remember uh, some Prime Ministers, was it Rudd, Gillard, Rudd? Some squabbles over that side too, over some similar sorts of. Uh, Issues, I, I suspect, but I'm glad, very glad, that Senator Watt has asked a, about jobs, because I think it was uh, very telling, you know, with the um, what we just saw with the uh, our most recent jobs figures, which I'm just pulling up now for Senator Watt, but he's sadly left us. So it was easy to see that employment surged in by. 115,000 jobs in May to a record high. And these are across regions, these aren't just in the big cities. Full time employment rose 97,500 to a record high. The unemployment rate fell by 0.4 per cent to 5.1 per cent in May. And the participation rate rose by 0.3 per cent to 66.2 per cent. So it's very clear in answer to Senator Watt that we are creating jobs, whether in his regional Queensland, whether in regional Victoria, where I am the proud senator of. We are creating jobs in record numbers that that side of politics has never, ever been able to do. Now, he was also asking uh, about our vaccine rollout strategy. Well, it's a, it's a very good question, and I'm happy to be able to um, update him on some of those numbers as well. Well, as well as you know, the goals about net zero zero by 2050, because as those opposite know, the only target of the Paris Agreement requires is a 2030 target, which we have, and we're yet to hear from those opposite about what theirs is. And so, while the, this morning the leader of the opposition was ducking and weaving about what your 2030 target would be we have committed to and, achieve, and uh, on our way to achieving our, net, uh, our targets for 2030. And we have runs on the board for this. We beat our target for Kyoto by, um, I think the number was 439 million tonnes, I think it was, Madam Deputy President. I'd have to, uh, I'll come back to the House, uh, to the Senate if, if I'm wrong on that, but I believe it was about that. 459, thank you, Senator Rennick. So that's why our approach is, is working. It's driven by how, not the when. And this is the problem. There is no one that can tell us how to get to net zero by 2050. The technologies that will get us there don't currently exist. 
Now, other countries may be able to say that because they have powers such as Nuclear. what was that other one that uh, we Nuclear. talk about a lot on this side? Nuclear, Nuclear power. Now, that may be something that we have in Australia in the, in the future, but we don't currently have it now. No more than we have. No, no more than we have hydrogen power in commercial quantities. And I'll take any interjection that, uh, that Senator Ayres wants to give us, but uh, Madam, Deputy uh, Madam Deputy President, you might want to pull up those interjections, that being your job. So we are doing so much with being able to pull together, pulling down net, our net zero emissions. Our vaccine rollout is going exactly as, as it should be. We are being able to manage the economy better than those opposite ever could. So I think it's very clear that it, you know, from that side of politics, particularly Senator Watt and Senator Ayers, love to come in here and chuck around little jokes and, and you know, slurs on those on this side that rarely get pulled up. But can their side of politics claim any goals at all? What are they going to do with, with Paris? What's your Paris goal? What's your roadmap? You're just going to use renewables? You're only going to put up more wind towers, more solar panels? We're not hearing anything about the details on that. Yep, and the, the response that your side gives us has the same effect on me, Mr. Senator Ayres. Bores me to tears and makes me yawn like you just did. So I think it's easy to um, say— Senator Van, I would remind you not to reflect on other senators. You can speak about senators— I was making an observation, person. Madam And you, may, you make President. it to the chair, not directly to senators. Please continue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we have no doubt that you will we'll give us that, Senator Ayres. But uh, I, I thank the opposition for their time and, and, and Senator Ayres for his entertainment, and I look forward to it being, being returned in kind. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Ayres. Well, may we say, Australians all let us rejoice. Uh, but I'm sure the response from people all around the country is going to be, it's going to be, must we? Really? Rejoice? Um, eight years of tired, dysfunctional government with no plan for the future with a track record of the lowest productivity growth in 50 years, no plan on climate and energy. What have we had? As Senator Watts said, we've had Abbott and Truss, we've had Turnbull and Truss, we've had Turnbull and Joyce, we've had Turnbull and McCormack, we've had Morrison and McCormack, and now we're back with Morrison and Joyce. Eight long years of tired, ineffective government, entirely focused on itself, entirely focused on itself. This government has become much worse under the current Prime Minister, Mr Morrison. Its tendency for secrecy, its obsession with marketing, its requirement for spin at all costs, its capacity for deflection. When the country needed something more, when the country needed leadership to fix this tired old mess of a government, who did the National Party turn to? Who did the National Party turn, on, turn to when we really needed to focus on the interests of regional Australians? Well, they've given us poor old Mr Joyce. And why isn't there anybody in the National Party here in the Senate in here defending Mr Joyce? Why isn't there anybody in the National Party on their feet in this debate? I'll tell you why. Because they are all on the telephone. They are all on the telephone, ringing around, interested in the only jobs that they have got any interest in at all, their own jobs. Where's Senator McKenzie? She's in there lobbying to make sure she gets a job out of this. Where are the other National Party senators? In corridor meetings trying to make sure they squeeze something out of this tired, incompetent government in terms of jobs for themselves, the only jobs that they are interested in. I mean, poor old Mr Joyce, his Christmas message. As a backbencher, he was still putting out Christmas videos 
In Christmas 2019, he had this sort of deranged beetroot faced video that he sent out from some paddock out the back of Walker, and he said, Look, I just don't want the government anymore in my life. I'm sick of the government being in my life. Well, not anymore. He's going to get plenty of the government in his life. He's going to get plenty of it. He's looking forward to the big salary. He's looking forward to the ministerial cars. He's looking forward to lots of staff and to throwing his weight around, throwing his weight around all the corridors of Canberra. But I tell you what, the people who miss out, like always, are going to be the people of regional Australia. And poor old Darren Chester, first to Ms. get the uh, chop. Senator Ayres, poor old Mr Chester. Thank you. Poor old Mr Chester, former Minister Chester, we're told. The only decent person in that bunch of clowns looking for a radio. The only one who's shown any decency over the course of the last eight years of this miserable, incompetent government. He's first to get the chop because the people surrounding Mr Joyce are going to make sure they get what's coming to them out of this leadership change. Well, Mr Joyce left with very serious allegations surrounding him uh, during the short period that Mr Turnbull was in office. They have not been satisfactorily dealt with, despite finding that the allegations brought by Ms Marriott that she was forthright, believable, open and genuinely upset, the National Party in its investigation into itself said unable to make a determination. And what's driven this change? Well, I tell you what, again, it's all about climate change like it always is. The only thing that this is going to do is improve the old podcast industry. I'm not sure whether it's weatherboard that's been deleted or iron. But, but poor old Mr Joyce, it'll be very Thank interesting you, to Senator see whether he Ayers, continues your his time podcast. Has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, and what a time to be alive. It never have before the forces between darkness and evil been more clear than here today. What we've had today here is nothing but a session, a bile session of putrid personal smears. A putrid personal smears talking about a fantasy target of net carbon, net zero uh, emissions by 2050. Net zero 20 emission, uh, emissions by 2050. And we've got Senator Watt, who's got the audacity to come in here and talk about regional Queensland. Talk about regional Queensland and somehow blame the Nats for everything that's gone wrong in regional Queensland. Well, let me tell you something, acting, acting Madam Deputy President. State Labor is responsible for the destruction uh, of Senator regional Rennick, Queensland. Senator resume your seat, please. Uh, Senator McCarthy. In of order, uh, you are the Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator McCarthy. Sorry, Senator Rennick. Apologies I was for that. You in the full Apolog apologies, of apologies to for that. Go. And you know, wh where do we start? You know, when it comes to regional Queensland, what what we've got here is state Labor government who sold privatised nearly all of the assets that the state government owns: Queensland Rail, uh, Golden Casket, the forestry plantations, the Port of Brisbane. Six times earning, they sold the Port of Brisbane a monopoly to six times earnings, a 99-year lease. And they wonder why the state of Queensland is going broke. But what I want to know is how exactly. I'll tell you what our policy, by the way, is when it comes to energy. It is cheap and reliable energy that is going to create jobs in the manufacturing sector, not in the inputs, not in the cost sector of creating energy. No, 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 no. We had the world's cheapest energy when Labor came to power in 1990 from the world's best coal. But that's all been destroyed thanks to mismanagement by the Queensland Labor government mismanagement by the Queensland Labor government and the fact that they now subsidise foreign companies to come to Queensland. They pay foreign companies to come to Queensland and generate renewable energy. Now, Queensland coal-powered fire stations and gas power stations have the potential to generate 13 gigawatts of energy a day. The most Queensland's ever used is 9 gigawatts. In order to meet their 50 per cent target, they are going to add another 20 gigawatts of renewable energy despite the fact that they don't need it, because we already have sufficient supply to meet demand. But what they're going to do is they're going to drive our energy that the Queensland owned, the last thing the Queensland Labor government didn't sell, the Queensland owned energy uh, companies 
Uh, they are going to drive them into the ground. And last year was the first year that the Queensland energy companies lost a billion, one and a half billion dollars because they had to get turned off all the time while the foreign-owned renewable companies had the opportunity to make money. Had the opportunity to make money. Now, you know, if, if, and the other thing is all, all this, you know, wonderful talk about net zero 50, blah blah blah. You know who's doing the heavy lifting in this country when it comes to reducing emissions? Are our farmers and the reduction in land use. Now, I just want to quote some figures here across Australia of how much money is being invested in reducing carbon emissions. In New South Wales, there's $630 million being invested in reducing carbon emissions. Uh, in Victoria, a measly $15 million. ACT, nothing. Uh, in WA, $109 million. In Northern Territory, $38 million. But in Queensland, there's $886 million being invested in buying back land locking up land, agricultural land, in order to reduce carbon emissions. And do you know where the bulk of that is? In my turf, the Darling Downs in the southwest, where we've got 523 million. That's almost as much as the entire amount of New South Wales and more than the rest of the other states can combined. So this is typical. Walk the walk, talk the talk. Labor love to talk the talk, but they never come to walk the walk, all these inner city people that want to reduce emissions. So when are they going to start riding their push bikes to work? When are they going to stop taking aeroplane flights? When are they going to turn their air conditioning off? Rather than pushing farmers in southwest Queensland out of jobs, when are they going to actually start walking the walk for a change instead of dictating to everyone else on what should happen? And as for meeting 2050, why should this country be subservient to other nations? Who can well remember the Hawke Keating government when Hawke took the states to the High Court in 1983? to block Franklin Dam, the Franklin Dam, the building of the Franklin Dam. Now, had that dam been built, that was carbon-free energy. And you know what Tasmania did for the rest of the 80s? They voted against Labor. And you know what ta how Tasmania is going now? Since they have allowed more dams and weirs to be built, they're the second grow uh, strongest economy now in the country, thanks to building of dams. But do we see that in Queensland? No, we don't. What's the state government doing? They're ripping down our own dams. They're ripping down Paradise Dam. That's a carbon-free source of energy if they put a generator on the end of it. But no, 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 no. They're happy to pull down Australian-made, Australian-owned clean energy and then pay foreigners to actually produce energy that, after all, isn't all that clean because it's come up with solar panels and batteries and wind turbines that can't be recycled. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, I rise to take note of the answers given by uh, Minister Reynolds to questions without notice asked by Senators Green and Keneally uh, relating to the new Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce. So let's just look across, this, you know, across the chamber at this crew. They're unable to roll out vaccines. They're unable to roll out quarantine. But Nationals rolled out the grand old man to put in yesterday's man. What, a, what an indication of where this crew is up to. Now look at these sorts of questions that we have now in front of us. Now, this, at the day when we've got this crisis, again, uh, reoccurring with COVID-19 cases, where exposure sites across New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, on a day when an emergency national cabinet meeting has been convened, on a day where the premiers of multiple states, both Liberal and Labor, are sounding the alarm about a shortage of Pfizer vaccines, the coalition government thought it was a good time to have a leadership spill again. The government can't roll out a vaccine, as I say, to save a life or the lives of Australians, but they are experts at rolling out their leaders. It was only February of last year that the Nationals last had a spill motion. So as the Australian people are wondering what their elected members of parliament and senators have been doing in the last 18 months. Well, in Canberra, you'll, you'll be very surprised. What they've been doing is looking after themselves. The Australian government, as people were curious about by the federal government, about can't organise a vaccine rollout, can't organise a quarantine system, can't grow wages for Australian middle class, predicting wage decline in Ford estimates. And now we know one of the reasons why. Because one half of the coalition government has spent the last 18 months plotting and scheming among themselves. Instead of doing the job they are paid so handsomely to do to come to Canberra and do. Today I'm thinking particularly of Australians living in regional communities. 
areas where the Nationals are supposed to be represent this place. I'm thinking of coal miners in the Illawarra, the Hunter, and in Queensland, who are being shoved into labour hire jobs on lower pay without any entitlements or job security, while the Nationals come to Canberra and masquerade as the coal miners' friends, all the while voting for a bill to overturn the federal court's decision that labour hire coal workers are entitled to basic employment rights. The Nationals voted to strip those rights away. Now, I'm thinking that workers and families in regional areas depend on the agriculture um, sector, that there should be good paying, secure jobs in sectors like horticulture in our regions. And instead, under the National Party, these jobs are reserved for exploited migrant workers. In fact, just last week, the Liberal National Government announced a new agricultural visa aimed at importing and exploiting workers from Southeast Asia. And that visa reportedly will be less regulated than the Pacific Seasonal Workers Program. The British know that these schemes are exploitive. That's why they just negotiated with the Prime Minister to get an exemption from it. Last week, I met with a Taiwanese woman named Kate, who was paid just $4 an hour picking oranges on a farm in Renmark, South Australia. She said, I quote, I went dumpster diving to find food in, uh, in recycle bins at supermarkets when I didn't have enough money. This is the sort of economy that the Nationals promote in regional Australia. When bad employers can't pay migrant wages $4 an hour and force them to eat out of the bin, how are Australian workers in regional communities supposed to get a decent paying job. Of course, the exploitive nature of mining and agriculture isn't the reason we have yet another Nationals leadership spill. It's just a petty internal politics. To restore yesterday's man in a position he has already proven himself until, uh, unfit at, once, or for, at one point. As yet another sign of the tired, bloated, incompetent government and it's failed to turn around and make sure that regional Australia and all Australians during this most difficult period have proper leadership, considered leadership, and a leadership that is focused very much on making sure that Australians are better off, not what they've proposed, but Australians are being, going to be worse off. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seaglet. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer, well, should I say non answer, from the Leader of the Senate, representing the Treasurer in this place, for his non answer on my questions about Statement 3 around charity law. And I'm deeply distressed that he couldn't answer it because this Statement 3 will have a significant impact on charities in this country and make no mistake. The government knows, because it's been told, and I'll read out some quotes in a minute from some of the organisations that will be affected, the government knows it's going to have an effect on charities in this country, which is exactly why they're doing it. It's exactly why they are trying to browbeat, bully, threaten charities into not taking up advocacy, into not doing their work. The Community Council of Australia, in its submission to the draft, the exposure draft of Statement 3, says the proposed changes to the ACNC governance standards will diminish our democracy, exactly what the government wants to happen. They will silence some charities by creating fear about potential repercussions. They will impose new limits on staff and others involved in charities and their capacity to express a view. They will impose significant new regulatory burdens on many charities. Keep them busy doing regulation, the very thing the government said they were trying to cut, but keep them busy, keep them busy trying to, with new regulations, new bureaucracy. They will not achieve their policy purpose. They will diminish the capacity of our communities to voice their concerns. They also point out that threatening increased enforcement action against charities that, they, that support public campaigns and protest action is not going to make government stronger, quite the contrary. 
and I sincerely and truly support that statement because good policy is made with the advocacy of people at the front line, of the advocacy of civil society. And that was acknowledged in this place when the laws were passed around the ACNC in 2013, and specifically written into that law was the capacity for charities to advocate, to take up the case to government when they've got it wrong or not putting in place good policy to particularly campaign for the most vulnerable in our community, to particularly complain and advocate for good environmental protection. And let's face it, this is what the government's at. They don't want people raising these issues. That's why they're trying to change Standard 3. Now, in the EM on this Standard 3, on the draft Standard 3, the government claimed that they're implementing the recommendations of the expert panel on the ACNC, looking into how, in fact, they could improve the law. And they said repeal statement three. So they're, damn, they're, they're not telling the truth in their EM because they were recommended to remove standard three. Yes, to improve some elements of the law, because all, I'm not saying that some of it could not be improved, as was pointed out by the expert panel. But what this government's doing is taking the opportunity to browbeat charities to make them frightened to speak up, to in fact put in, put in summary, uh, sum, sum, summary charges when they're not proven. They're trying to curtail actions and take action against charities for something that's not proven, trying to make the ACNC a commis a commissioner, the commissioner make judgment what's unlawful or not when they have the criminal law where charities have broken the law, and they have Statement 5. This is blatantly an attack on charities. The implications of the, of the proposed changes will have, as many organisations have said, a chilling effect on the work of charities in this country, exactly what the government wants. The government have been aiming to wind back and undermine charities again and again and again. And they've got form here. They have, used to have gag clauses, gag clauses in funding agreements with charities that said they couldn't speak out. They could, they could support the most vulnerable, provide services, mop the brow, as they say, but not advocate for policy change. This is exactly what the government's doing, trying to deliver on their long-term aim to gut charities, to silence charities, to gag charities and stop advocacy. That's what they're on about. The charities know it and it's ha it is already having a chilling effect. Have a read for those that are interested in what the Law Council says. It's very questionable whether this is constitutional or not. And I bet if this gets through, and I'll do the ha my hardest to stop it getting through, if it does get Thank through, there will be a constitutional Seward. challenge. Your time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. <clears throat> so um, are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as followed. General business notice of motion number 1133, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, for today, postponed to the 22nd of June. General business notice of motion 1134, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, for today, to the 22nd of June. General business notice of motion 1141, standing in the name of Senator McKim, for today, to the 22nd of June. General business notice of motion 1142, standing in the name of Senator Dodson, for today, to the 3rd of August, 2021. And general business notice of motion number 1149, standing in the name of Senator Billick for today, postponed to the 22nd of June 2021. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 on today's order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to. I oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Senator Smith. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. 
Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator I move Smith. that leave of absence be granted to Senators Askew and Chandler from the 21st to the 24th of June 2021 for personal reasons. Thank you. Yes, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. <clears throat> I believe the business of the Senate will be debated later. I'm just double checking on that. Is that correct? No? Okay, well, we'll come back to that. I'll start with um, general business. Notice of motion number double one, uh, triple one nine, standing in the name of Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice a motion number 1119 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Act 2020 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business. Oh, beg your pardon, sorry, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy ahead. President. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. I'll call the clerk. A uh, bill for an act to amend the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Payments and Benefits Act 2020 and for related purposes. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Thank McKim. Deputy President, I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Waters, I've, I'm calling them in order. Yes, it's business of the Senate, so sorry yeah, I for said the confusion I'd leave that. earlier. I'd come back to that. <clears throat> so uh, I'm now doing general business notice of motion number 1135, standing in the name of Senator McLaughlin and others. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I ask that a general business notice of motion 1135 relating to paramedics be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being yes. <clears throat> uh, I'll now move to General business, notice of motion number 1139, standing in the name of Senator Giacconi. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Before asking the motion be taken as formal, I inform the Chamber that Senator McKenzie and Senator Van will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1139 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1146, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Madam Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1146 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. So the question is that, gen uh, sorry, Minister, yes. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The poultry uh, panel standards and guidelines are currently under development by an independent expert panel. The most recent draft version has been provided to stakeholders for comment. Over 900 comments on this version have been received. The independent expert panel is reviewing these comments and considering changes to the standards and guidelines as necessary. Thank you. So the question is, the motion is moved. Double one four six, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, we'll now go back to uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of 
Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I ask that de uh, business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I, be aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. I ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. <clears throat> Order. So the question is that general business, a uh, bigger pardon, business of the Senate, 
Number one, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The eyes shall move to the right of the chair. The nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the eyes, and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the nose. Order, there being 28 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1127, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank, uh, oh, thank you, Deputy President. And I ask that general business notice of motion number 1127 regarding the Murray-Darling Basin be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator O'Neill. I move the motion. So the question is the motion. Oh, beg your pardon, uh, Senator McLaughlin. The question be divided so I can vote differently on parts of the motion. Um, and how are you asking it to be divided? I ask that A, B, and D be put separately to C. Uh, Senator McKenzie. Uh, I also ask the question be divided and that we divide separately on A, B, C and D. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> order. order. Uh, I'll deal with Senator Roberts and then I'll go to the minister. Senator Roberts. So I seek leave to make a short statement. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you were seeking a division. If you resume your seat, Senator Roberts, I'll come back to you. Oh, okay. No, minister's happy to hand over to you, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Uh, One Nation does support completing the Murray-Darling Basin plan in principle, so we agree with A, B, and D. South Australia is owed 460 gigalitres, 450 gigalitres, with 70 gigalitres already underway. However, One Nation objects to C. New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland have given up enough water. The farming community has been decimated by what has been taken so far. Enough is enough. Why would anyone think taking water from 2,000 kilometres away in Queensland to fix salinity in the lower lakes makes more sense than using the water that is right there now, right there, flowing through man-made drains straight out to the sea every time it rains? This is madness. Fresh water flowing into the Southern Ocean is killing the seagrass beds while the Coorong that naturally received this water is dying of hypersalinity. This is what Senator O'Neill wants to continue. This is madness. Turn the drains back around and leave the family farms alone. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Deputy President. The government is committed to working with uh, the states in a bipartisan manner to support the implementation of the plan through the recovery of water through $1.33 billion off, uh, dollars of off-farm efficiencies, $234 million for the Murray-Darling Community Investment Package, 
all while ruling out further buybacks that cost jobs and hurt our regional base and communities. The Coalition will be opposing part three of the motion as it's based on an incorrect interpretation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, as well as a misrepresentation of Minister Pitt's uh, for September 2020 media release on the government's commitments to working with the Basin States in putting communities at the heart of the plan in its implementation. Right, we're just going to go through them individually. So that's A, B, C, and D. Senator Patrick, your to make a short statement. Uh, yes. One of the things I like about the Murray-Darling Basin is it does turn the Senate into the state's house, and we see all the different perspectives, and that's very rare. But uh, the fact of the matter is that there was an agreement to the plan, uh, and that included the 450 gigalitres. So you can't walk back from that now. That is an important element. Uh, it was something that South Australia negotiated before it ceded powers to the Commonwealth in relation to this, and it can't be, uh, it can't be rescinded. Uh, we, we need to support the plan in full. Uh, Senator Patrick, I do appreciate we're in a division, but it is appropriate that you speak from your seat. Um, Senator Hanson Young. It is? Beg your pardon. My error. Sorry. <laughs> He's just not in here enough to know. Beg your pardon. I apologise. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, the 450 gigalitres is absolutely essential for the survival of the Murray-Darling Basin, and it has been promised in the plan and promised to South Australia. Now, what I am worried about on what it, uh, is what on earth is going to happen now that Barnaby Joyce is the leader of the National Party. This is the bloke who told South Australians, if you want more water, move to Queensland. That is the bloke that is now the Deputy Prime Minister. Shameful, absolutely shameful. South Australians are going to be worried that the Deputy Prime Minister of this country thinks that South Australia doesn't deserve any water, let alone the 450 gigalitres. Senator Davey. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. The National Party will be supporting sections A and B as statements of fact as written. Uh, we do not support section, uh, section C as it is a misrepresentation of the facts and certainly a misrepresentation and a misquotation of the very press release as asserted. Uh, furthermore, we do not support <laughs> section D because it is a misrepresentation of what is in the Basin Plan. The Basin Plan, as written by Minister Tony Burke back in 2012, said that the extra 450 must be based on no negative social and economic impacts. And it has been shown time and time again that there will be Known uh, that there will be negative social and economic impacts. In fact, all basin ministers, including South Australia, agree to a criteria, and that must be respected. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Wong. Thank you. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. I, I think Wong. I think the Senate well hasn't taken long, has it? We saw what Barnaby Joyce said, Senator Mr Joyce said about the Murray Darling ban and about the four fifty gigalitres. He said you have not got a hope in Hades. Not a hope. Well, it's pretty clear the way in which the National Party is going to operate now <laughs> under Mr Joyce. And South Australians will remember will remember Mr Joyce telling people to move. We'll remember Mr Joyce telling South Australians the way to deal with water uh, shortages in the Murray-Darling was for them to move. And they will remember uh, the, what, the contribution that was just made, where the National Party uh, uh, essentially undermined uh, what has been a bipartisan position uh, on the Murray-Darling plan. And I look forward to Senators Birmingham and, Sen and, Sen and Ruston doing the right thing and making sure you deliver what you said you would. Uh, thank you. I'm going to put the motion. I'm just going to check. Senator McKenzie, is it still your wish for A and B to be put separately? I'll... Okay. So um, the question is that uh, general business notice of motion 1127 uh, in the name of Senator O'Neill, A and B um, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? 
I believe the eyes have it. I'm now going to put part C. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1127, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill, part C, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1127, standing in the name of Senator Neil Part C, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Smith as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 29 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to part D. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1127, standing in the name of seven, Senator O'Neill, part D, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Whips. One minute. Four minutes. I'd ask senators to stop calling out across the chamber, please. Lock the doors. 
So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1127, standing in the name of Senator O'Neill, Part D, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 52 ayes and six noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 1137, standing in the name of Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson. Um, I seek leave to amend general business notice motion number 1137 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? Uh, uh, there was a no there. I'm happy to put it again. but. So I'll put it. Uh, do you just want to seek formality to amend again, Senator Hanson? Right. I seek leave to amend General Biz Business Notice of Motion Number 1137 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted to amend? Yes. Thank you, Senator Hanson. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Uh, so the question is that General Business. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson. I move the motion that as amended. Uh, Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Minister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Critical race theory is predicated on the belief that the laws and institutions of our nation are inherently racist. This theory is patently false, discredited and without any basis in fact. <clears throat> the national curriculum, which is open for consultation, is agreed by consensus between the Commonwealth and all states and territory education ministers. Uh, the federal government will reject any changes to the national curriculum that would give effect to critical race theory within the national curriculum. Uh, Senator Fruki. Thank you, Madam De Deputy President. Looks like Senator Hanson. Uh, Senator Fruki, what are you seeking? Sorry, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Fruki. 
Looks like Senator Hansen has been watching a little bit too much of Fox News and Sky News lately. Hard to imagine you know much about critical race theory, but know this. We will not stop fighting against systemic racism. We will not stop fighting for people who are marginalized and discriminated against every single day. And no much how much Murdoch media rubbish you regurgitate here and bring in your petty attacks, you will not stop us. You can jump up and down here with your hate-filled stunts, but out there on the streets, tens of thousands of people are marching against systemic racism. And shame on this government for voting for this motion, because that's what it looks like you're going to do. You will be condoning racism, and you will be condoning far-right oh, politics. Yeah. Oh, Murdoch yeah. media mouthpieces in here will not dampen our movement for anti-racism. In fact, it will strengthen it. Thank you, Senator Fariki. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Is the granted leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank Gallagher. you. Uh, Labor will be opposing the motion. It's long-standing practice that the Australian curriculum, the national curriculum, is developed by education experts, not by senators, and not by motions in the Senate. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1137, as amended by Senator Hanson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1137, standing in the name of Senator Hanson, as amended, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 30 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 1140, standing in the name of Senator Walsh. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1140 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? <coughs> Now move to general business notice of motion number 1147, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1147 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Oh, there's a. Yeah. Deputy President. So much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I uh, believe the noes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute.
order. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved to suspend as moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 28 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 1148, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 1148 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. I move the motion. So the, oh, the minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute, Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Australia has been a trusted energy supplier to our trading partners for decades and we will continue to be under this government. The government will continue to support businesses and commercial sectors of the economy that are critical to our export wealth, our energy security, our economic prosperity and the employment of hundreds of thousands of Australians. 
unilaterally withdrawing Australian production will not reduce global demand for those products and will harm Australia's economic interests, energy security and cost Australian jobs. Senator Roberts. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Although this motion has an element of truth, it is the Greens' contradictions of science and lack of integrity that ruins it. One Nation agrees that donations from the pharmaceutical, banking and energy industries seem to be distorting government policy. The millions of dollars in donations shame the Liberal, National and Labor parties for accepting that money. The public is rightly cynical about the Morrison government's mul multiple decisions that make no sense, including the current attack on responsible lending laws, the billions spent on the largest vaccine trial in history, the continued loss of hundreds of billions of dollars in tax revenue that multinationals don't pay. This is what happens when the Morrison government accommodates a conga line of lobbyists trying to extract the maximum benefit from their political donations. Madam Acting Deputy President, there are many honest and productive Australian energy companies working in traditional proven energy, reliable energy, effective cost-effective cost energy and needed to keep the lights on when the Greens' unreliable and expensive wind and solar policies Thank are you, trying Senator so hard Roberts. to turn the them off. Has expired. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, Labor will be opposing this motion. And again, if we actually deal with this part of the program, these are exactly the sorts of motions that have led to the um, reforms that we're seeking to implement. Because if you want a debate about renewable energy, if you want a debate about energy policy, if you want a debate about donation reform, then allow the chamber to debate it. What you do, you do it time and time again, is bring these motions to force a vote, to put out your social media, and everybody knows if you want positive action on renewable energy or energy policy in general or donation reform, you're going to need a Labor government. Don't bring motions that seek to divide when we should be working together in the interest of the country to make a difference and actually get a good energy policy and get donation reform. Order. Order. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 1148, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, the noes have it. Uh, Senator Waters, I only heard one voice. Uh, I'll happily put it again. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1148, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bell for so one minute. Uh, lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 148, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawet as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
Oh, could the senators just sitting up the back corner there just turn around? It's hard for the whips to do their count. Thanks, Senator McGrath. Order, there being 10 ayes and 42 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Dunham. Thank you. Uh, I just Ms. called uh, Senator Dunham. What? If, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dunham. Madam Deputy President. At the request of Senator Birmingham and pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as a prevent motion 1135 being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. So the question is, the motion is moved by uh, Senator Dunning be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, this is for 1135. Those against? 1135. Uh, so the, uh, the motion has been agreed to. Um, Senator Faruqi? Deputy President, I seek leave to have general business notice of motion number 1138 considered no, Senator as— Senator Faruqi, I thought you were seeking okay, a point so of order this about this motion. Uh, so, Minister, you are now moving that motion. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1135 is moved by the minister standing in the name of Senator McLaughlin and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I, Madam Deputy President, I seek leave to move motions number 1139 and 1140 uh, and that they be determined without amendment or debate. So the question is that this motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, I beg your pardon, you were seeking leave, weren't you? Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Gallagher. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motions number 1139 and 1140. So the question is that general business, the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Um, Senator Gallagher. I move motions number 1139 and 1140 and ask that they be put separately. Thank you. So the, we'll do 1139 first. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1139 standing in the name of Senator Ciccone be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of minister. Uh, table uh, the statement relating to 1140. Thank you. So the question is, uh, Senator Roberts. I seek leave to table a short statement on uh, motion 1140. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1140, standing in the name of Senator Walsh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1140, standing in the name of Senator Walsh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 10 ayes and 42 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative and Senator Fruki was seeking the call. Um, I seek leave to have general business. Notice of motion number 1138 considered at formal business today. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is not granted, Senator Fruki. That concludes um, formal business. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson. General business notice of motion number 1143 considered at formal business today. 
Is leave granted? Uh, leave is not granted, uh, Senator Wishful. So. Make a very short statement of just 30 seconds. Uh, no. Sorry, Senator Wishwilson. Sure, to contingent notice, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? To suspend. Senator Wish Wilson, just before I put the question, order, are you seeking to suspend to make a statement or to put the motion? Um, if, I might suspend to make a statement if that gives me five minutes to make a statement. Well, it's your Deputy call President. to make, not mine. Okay, I'll to seek advise. to suspend to make a statement. Yeah. Uh, I believe um, leave has been denied, Senator Wish Wilson. Contingent, pursuant to contingent notice. Yes. So yeah. you've now. Question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I uh, believe the noes have it. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order, lock the doors. So just remind senators that we're voting to suspend to allow Senator Wish Wilson to make a short statement. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Wish Wilson to suspend be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 10 ayes and 42 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. That now. Oh, it hasn't come up. Beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, sorry, it's. 
It's the old division I just called. I'm still waiting for it to refresh. So order. So the question is, uh, the, re the result of the division is 10 ayes and 42 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Come up, so perhaps you give me a piece of paper with the result on, please. Order, there being 10 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Now, that now concludes formal business and we'll move to the matter of public importance. I'll just allow senators to uh, clear the chamber if they are not wishing to pursue to be in here for the remainder of this. We will just pause momentarily while the chamber clears for those who are not participating in the debate. I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 28 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate is determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rice proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It being so, I understand informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I will ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise today to contribute to this debate, and the reason that I do is because last week I was very concerned sitting in here and listening to a contribution in this place by Senator McGrath that called for in an absolute spray and attack on our public broadcaster for Triple J to be privatised and sold off. Advertised, sold off on Gumtree, Senator McGrath called for. Ads on the ABC and a number of other veiled attacks on our national broadcast. Now we know, we know, we know that this government has had the knives out for the public broadcaster from day dot. Right back when Tony Abbott promised no cuts to the ABC, only 12 months later to bring in massive cuts to the public broadcaster, and it has never stopped since then. We heard in the National Liberal Party room only a couple of sitting weeks ago, members of this government standing up and attacking the chairperson of the ABC, attacking the hard-working staff of our public broadcaster. And then, of course, there's Mr Kroger, the former president of the Liberal Party, going on Sky News and demanding that Ita go, Ita Buttrose, the chair of the ABC. Now, these attacks are just absolutely unfounded. They are um, <laughs> they're the stuff of boys' locker room. They are uh, petty. And of course, it sends <laughs> the message to uh, some of the knuckle draggers in the Liberal National Party that they might want to hear to beat up on the public broadcaster, beat up another woman in charge, beat up on uh, facts, news and public interest journalism. But of course, what we've got now is members in this place, members of the government, senior members of the team in this Senate, calling for Triple J to be sold off. Now, is this the platform that the Morrison Joyce government are going to be taking to this election? And what does Mr. Joyce think about selling off Triple J, putting ads on the ABC, and this attack on the public broadcaster? Does Mr Barnaby Joyce, the new Deputy Prime Minister, think that regional Australia want to have ads on their ABC? I think not, Mr Acting Deputy President. And what's next? Paywalling iView? I mean, that's where this leads. 
And what you've got from this government is cut after cut after cut, attack after attack after attack. And then once the ABC is struggling, they go, oh, well, we'll just sell it off, oh, just like everything else. So well, there's going to be an election, either the end of this year or early next year, and the Morrison-Barnaby-Joyce government are telling the electorate that they want to sell the ABC and fill it, fill it full of advertising, paywall, ABC iView, flog off Triple J. And I don't think Australians are going to be very happy about this at all, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Australians love our national broadcaster. They know that when they need trustworthy news and analysis, when they need information in times of crisis, what do they do? I tell you what, they don't turn on Sky News. They don't open up their Murdoch rag. They turn on the radio or they turn on the TV or they go to ABC online and they hear directly what they need to hear from the trusted source that is the national broadcaster. During the summer's bushfires back in 2019-20, we know that Australians relied so much on the information that was coming from the national broadcaster in terms of those emergency warnings. What's, what does this government want to do? Oh, so in between a warning about a bushfire, they're going to run an ad, probably from Harvey Norman. And in the midst of this pandemic, who has the Australian people in the community turned to to know what's really going on with COVID-19, the vaccine rollout, the safety information, the health information about this health pandemic? Well, thank goodness they weren't listening to members of the National Party or the Liberal Party who don't even believe the science and the health advice often. No, they've been turning to the ABC and listening to Dr Swan because they trust the information that is coming from the public broadcaster. Now, as we move towards the election, let's be very, very clear. If you want to protect the public broadcaster, if you want to save the ABC, if you love Triple J, then you've got to vote this mob out. The attacks are not even veiled anymore. They are blatant. They are unhinged. The personal vitriol thrown towards Ita Buttrose as the chairperson of the ABC from men in the Liberal National Party is just appalling. Is there, a, is there a strong woman in leadership that this government doesn't like? Another woman to tear down, just like they did Christine Holgate, and now they want to do it to Ita Buttrose. And they can't stand strong women, and they can't stand facts, information, and the public broadcaster having the support it does from the Australian community. Um, Barnaby Joyce, now being elected as the deputy prime minister, is he going to? go around regional Australia spruiking this platform as advocated by Senator McGrath? Ads on the ABC, paywall on ABC iView, selling off our ABC radio stations to the highest bidder, filling our emergency news with ads and advertising. And there's a reason that this government doesn't like the ABC, and it's because they don't like scrutiny. It's the reason this government doesn't like the public broadcaster. It's because they don't like being asked tough questions. We know, because every time the Prime Minister gets a tough question from somebody in the press gallery or a journalist out in regional Australia, he attacks them. He dismisses it. Oh, that's just Canberra bubble. No, it's a question about your ability as a leader of this country, Prime Minister. It's your responsibility, if you want the top job, to answer the tough questions. 
But rather than being upfront, rather than telling the Australian people what he really wants to do, rather than being accountable and transparent, the Prime Minister lets the attack dogs in the Liberal National Party run riot about the ABC. Now, if you want to protect the public broadcaster, if you love the ABC, if you think that regional news needs to be independent, if you love Australian music, if you love knowing what's really going on, if you want access to emergency services information instantly, when it's needed, at hand, then you've got to protect the ABC. And that means voting this mob out, making sure they can't get their claws into any more of our public broadcaster. The Liberal National Party like to kick the ABC and use it as a punching bag. Well, thank God there is such strong will within the Australian community to protect our public broadcaster, to protect news, to support and demand accountability, and thank goodness for Ita Buttrose, who's standing strong in the face of such disgusting vitriol from members of the Liberal Party, from members of the National Party, from members of Mr Morrison and Mr Joyce's team. You, know, you might think the Liberal Party bully boys have, um, have got their way with Ita. Well, I tell you what, she eats men like you for breakfast, mate, and she won't be, she won't be cowering at your attacks on the ABC. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Triple J should be sold, and there should be ads on the ABC. Simple. Because when we get to the model of the ABC, and it's very important to understand the history of, of where the Australian Broadcasting Corporation comes from in terms of its commencement as back in 1932 as the Australian Broadcasting Commission, and further back in history as the National Broadcasting Service in 1928, you understand that it was established to, to fill a gap in the market. Because we're talking about a period of Australian history where the media was just emerging, uh, that the cricket scores weren't broadcast live uh, from, from Lords, they were actually sent by telegram. And, and the, the radio wireless operators would, would read out the telegrams as if there were live scores being replayed uh, from, from London. Now, the media market has moved on since then, Mr Acting Deputy President. That was you know, 90 years ago. Since then, we've seen this wonderful thing invented called the internet, which means every device like this, Mr Acting Deputy President, is a device for us to, to seek news, to, to be a purveyor of news, to transmit news and to, be, and to give an informed opinion on the world. I mean, I was uh, during a particularly boring part of the Senate where one of the Greens was speaking before Mr Acting Deputy President, I was reading uh, The Times online and The Daily Telegraph, seeing the latest that's happening from, from overseas in terms of, of, of what's happening over there. Very, very, very important. And what we find is this very patronising approach from those on the left who think there has to be a taxpayer-funded national broadcasting service. There actually doesn't have to be a taxpayer-funded national broadcasting service. In my home state of Queensland, uh, back in the 1920s, we had uh, taxpayer-owned butcher shops. We had, uh, even in, in, in the town of, of, of Babinda, there was a, a government-owned pub. Society has moved on since then, and the failure of the ABC and of the board, including the chair, is a failure to understand how Australians get their news and that there is a plurality in the media market. And for the ABC to constantly and consistently portray themselves as being the sole arbiter of all that is right and justice in this world is just an example of this, this poor, sanctimonious approach that they take to people who do live outside the Canberra bubble. Now, what the ABC failed to understand, especially 
when they understand when they don't understand those on the centre right of politics, is that I don't want a right wing ABC. I don't want a left wing ABC. If there is to be an ABC, it should be an impartial national broadcaster. But sadly, the ABC consistently fails to understand that people voted for Scott Morrison as Prime Minister. People like Scott Morrison as Prime Minister. And the ABC just don't get that. And when I ask the question, name one conservative commentator or journalist on the ABC, and the left go feral and they go, oh, you know, why are you asking that question? It's because, because consistently there are no conservative commentators or journalists on the ABC. I just want one. One conservative commentator on the ABC. Just please, just one. Just give me one. And the fact the ABC consistently failed to do that shows to me that they are snubbing, snubbing those quiet, aspirational Australians. So the question must be, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, is then why should the taxpayers pay for it? Why should the taxpayers pay for a, for a, a national broadcasting service uh, that, that fails to consistently appreciate how most Australians live their lives? Now, I'm someone who actually is a fan of the ABC. I like the ABC. And I think the ABC should be reformed to save itself. I think we need to sell or off their inner city headquarters, sell off Ultimo, that, that grand palace that would make a, would make a German <laughs> prince blush, uh, you know, sell off the headquarters in Brisbane and Sydney and move all of the staff out of, out of the CBDs to the suburbs. And Queensland would love to see the ABC staff based in you know, Beanley or, or Birkengarry or um, you know, further west of Fargaminda, somewhere like that. Get out of the, the CBD. And, and that will help those staff realise that that latte bubble is not how most Australians live. <coughs> Secondly, I do think the ABC, there should be a review, excuse me, um, <coughs> there should be a review of, of the Charter and, and the Governing Act, and there hasn't been a detailed review for some time. And that review should look into what is the purpose of a taxpayer-funded national broadcasting service, and if there is to be one, should there be ads on it? I think there should be ads on the ABC. There are ads on the SBS, and, and certainly the quality of programming on, on, on SBS has not been diluted in, in any way or form. But also, Triple J should be sold, because it goes to why was the ABC set up in the first place? It was set up to fill a gap in the market. Now, the Triple J, uh, Triple J sorry, is, by all accounts, I'm told, a, a, a successful radio station that, that garners towards a particular demographic, especially those 15 to 25. And funnily enough, those between the ages of 15 and 25 actually have quite a lot of money to spend. So you'll find that advertisers will be very keen to, to, to advertise on, on Triple J, and it could be self-funding. So why don't we just sell it off and let it be self-funded, and you'll still have that quality music that, that those opposites seem so, so obsessed with. But it would mean the taxpayers aren't funding Triple J. And the third point of, of how we should reform the ABC, and this goes to, to the recruitment of, of, of their staff. And there are many fine and good people who work at the ABC, and, and I, acknowledge, I acknowledge that. But there is a group think that has taken over that organisation that has got particularly worse. Um, these are staff who, who, who sort of work together, they're lovely people, but they think the same. They think the same in terms of how, how Scott Morrison um, is not, should not be Prime Minister. It's this, this Scott Morrison sort of derangement syndrome. They can't believe that Bill Shorten didn't win the last election and that Scott Morrison somehow is Prime Minister. And they've never, ever come to terms with that. And we see that um, most particularly, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, with some of the recent programs. I'm just going to mention Four Corners a couple of weeks ago, uh, where Four Corners um, attacked the Prime Minister because he has a friend and this friend has some, you know, as I think the Prime Minister, well, I will say, some, some wacky views. And the Prime Minister was very strong in, in, in condemning the views of, 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 of QAnon. But what the ABC failed to mention 
in this program, where they had someone on this program, is that one of the key witnesses was, is a serial conspiracy theorist who has twice been detained by the fixated persons unit of the Queensland Police and admits he took part in the TV program to politically damage Scott Morrison. So here is the ABC uh, allowing, quite frankly, a nut job to go on their so-called premier current affairs program and, and attack the Prime Minister. But of course, the ABC didn't say, oh, this person's been twice detained by the Queensland police because, quite frankly, they're a nut job. They put them up on, on a pedestal. And this is what the ABC fails to understand, that those on the centre-right of politics are sick of you. And it is very dangerous for you in the ABC. Because why should the taxpayers of this country continue to fund an organisation that continually, continually derides and sells down those of us who have centre-right views. And I can tell you that the thought leaders in the centre-right community around Australia are also sick of the ABC. And so the ABC needs to reform itself. And the challenge is for Ita Buttrose to understand that the centre-right of the politics are con and continually and increasingly questioning the role of the ABC in modern society and are actually questioning whether there is a need for the ABC. Now, in my, my maiden speech, I said if the ABC didn't reform itself, it should be privatised, but there should be a rural and regional broadcasting service. And so I, I repeat that today. I think it is time for the government to look into the ABC to whether it should be halved. We should have a rural and regional broadcasting service, and we sell off the rest. Because if the ABC won't reform itself, well, on behalf of the taxpayers of Australia who put up billion dollars a year into this organisation, we want value for our money, and we're not getting it at the moment. Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this matter of public importance. In doing so, I wasn't quite sure just then if I was sitting here in the Senate or a Young Liberal branch meeting or even Senator McGrath's living room listening to him shout at his television. Just, uh, anyway, perhaps it's best to let uh, Senator McGrath's contribution speak for itself rather than me unpacking it line by line. Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, the ABC has a long and proud history at the heart of the Australian media landscape. It is consistently one of our most trusted institutions, with 72 per cent of Australians agreeing the ABC is their most trusted source of news and current affairs. During the depths of the COVID pandemic, 61 per cent of Australians tuned into its digital platforms, showing that it really matters when accurate, timely information really matters, Australians turn to the ABC. It's an incredibly valued and impactful institution. Its flagship current affair programs have shaped news coverage, driven significant policy change. Children's content like Bluey has become an international phenomenon. Despite the assertions of some of those opposite, the ABC is not some ivory tower in the inner cities. In regional Australia and in regional South Australia, it is more important than ever. Often the ABC still is the only provider of vital local content. It keeps Australians connected with their communities and the broader nation, as shown by their weekly reach among regional Australians being 49.5 per cent in 2019-20. The ABC also saves lives in times of disaster. We've seen it time and time again, and during the black summer bushfires in my state, we saw it also. South Australians tuned into the ABC to get the vital and critical information they needed to keep their families safe. If that's not relevance to regional South Australians, I don't know what is. Despite the clear importance the ABC holds to Australia and Australians, including the regional South Australians that Senator McGrath was talking about before, it has been subject to burdensome efficiency measures and ideological driven cuts under the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison, Trust, Joyce, McCormack and Joyce governments. I think I've got the mayor, but, but under all of those governments. In 2020, they were facing an $83 million cut in funding, forcing them to operate on increasingly fine margins and putting enormous strain on their staff systems and failures. I sat there in estimates as the minister tried to deny they were making these cuts, but they were. They were in black and white, and they were confirmed by the CFO at the time. 
These cuts meant that 250 staff could be facing the sack. There was an enormous amount of talent, passion and knowledge on the line from our national broadcaster. And of course, it's not just staffing which is under threat when the Liberals enforce these brutal cuts. It's programs like the flagship 7.45 a.m. radio news bulletin, which was uh, cut after 81 years on air. Many other iconic programs have faced reduced episodes and resourcing. With every one of the eight long years that has passed since Tony Abbott's false promise of no cuts to the ABC, this Liberal government has embarked on brutal cuts, which leave Australians with less and less service from their loved and cherished national broadcaster. Senator McGrath has come in today, openly called for the ABC to be privatised. Openly made that call. It's not veiled, it's not hidden. That's what he wants to see. A member of the Liberal government, uh, quite high up on the Senate ticket, if my memory serves me correct now, calling for the ABC to be privatised. These are calls which go deep within their ranks. But let's imagine if they were privatised and their board were suddenly responsible to delivering a profit to shareholders. Will they still broadcast the important emergency information, ad-free, that keeps Australians safe? Will they invest in valuable Australian-made TV over cookie-cutter television content produced overseas? Would they still have local journalists in regional areas, or would, like some of the commercial networks have done, just have centrally produced news grabs filmed in other states? A privatised ABC would be a disaster. It would be a disaster for all Australians. And of course, something that is often lost in these discussions about the future of the ABC is Triple J and how these absurd calls from Senator McGrath to see it privatised would impact young Australians. And it's no real surprise to me that these calls to privatise Triple J are coming from those who haven't been uh, particularly relevant to their target market for several decades. Triple J is the incubator of unique and experimental Australian music. South Australian artists like George Alice and the most recent Unearthed High winners, Teenage Jones, all featured on Triple J, leading to broader commercial success. And it's just not, not just Unearthed, it's also the other Australian musicians and bands and artists who get that valuable airtime on Triple J, which leads to other commercial opportunities, which wouldn't have been there otherwise. And it's not just music. Triple J is also home to exceptional reporting through the HAT program, produced, reported and broadcast by young people for young people, covering topics which impact young Australians. Australians who often feel ignored by this Liberal government and often feel ignored by the other networks. In just the past few months, the team at Hack has produced stories on consent reforms, the failure of online dating platforms to address sexual harassment and assault, and in-depth reporting on how the federal budget impacts young people. These stories matter to young people. Having relevant content produced for them, by them, matters to young people. And without Triple J, it's unlikely they would be able to have access it. And particularly under a privatised Triple J, it's hard to see how this content would continue, how this support for our budding Australian artists would continue. Very few institutions in Australia have the reach and impact amongst young Australians that Triple J can boast. Most of us would have tuned into it when we were young. Actually, maybe I'll reflect on that looking around the chamber. Certainly some of us would have tuned into Triple J when we were younger. There we go. There we go. A broad, broad cross-section of this chamber tuned into Triple J when we were young. So shouldn't we stand for them now? Shouldn't we stand for them now? Shouldn't we stand for them now when they continue to provide that vital service to young Australians? Of course, it's not just the youth who would be affected, but kids too. Ads on the ABC would be a disaster for the children who tune in afternoon after afternoon. Do we really want our kids exposed to ads while they're watching play school, putting on the Gruffalo after school, having a snack, being exposed to anything from junk food advertising, games, toys, gambling, ads from the private sector that we can't necessarily control? With corporate advertising on the ABC, there would be a slippery slope, a slippery slope, and our kids could be some of the most affected. The ABC produces some of Australia's, actually the world's, 
best children's programming. Like countless families across Australia and my household, Kangaroo Beach and Bluey are absolute staples. And I'm grateful that my three-year-old can turn on the TV and find age-appropriate, educational and engaging content. It's hard to imagine any of these shows getting the investment required and therefore the reach if it weren't for the ABC. And that developmentally appropriate content on television is absolutely critical, and it's really critical particularly for vulnerable kids and vulnerable kids who don't actually have access to some of the commercial content, who can't afford Netflix, who can't afford other pay-per-view providers. It matters to those kids. It matters that that's on the, on the ABC. But of course, it's not just our ABC which is under attack from this government. Community television in my state of South Australia and Melbourne and Geelong is also being systematically attacked by the Liberal government. Community television is incredibly important to South Australians and Victorians. It contributes so much to our communities and is facing a rapidly approaching end thanks to this Liberal government. During the pandemic, community TV was there for South Australians and Victorians, especially people in my state of faith who couldn't go to their services because they were closed down because of the pandemic. They provide incredible training opportunities, job opportunities. I've spoken to volunteers from Channel 44 who got their start as a volunteer at that station and then were able to use that to go on and get work commercially. But instead of valuing this asset, the Liberals want to kick it off air. They want to kick it off air when it costs them nothing to keep it on air and they have no plans to replace it. They're kicking community television off air to replace it with static. And it is absolutely unacceptable. It's an ideologically driven attack on community TV from a government and a minister which holds a callous disrespect for those who make it and watch it, just like they do with the ABC. They attack precious community assets that matter to Australians, and we won't stand for it. Senator Steele, John. Thank you. In making this speech today, I'd like to, to dedicate it to that wonderful organisation, the Friends of the ABC, um, and uh, particularly to my mate in Western Australia, Margot Webb, um, who uh, recently uh, chased me down and gave me the forms and information to become uh, a member, a friend of the ABC, um, and also to get me to become an official member of an organisation here in the Parliament, which I had assumed I was already a part of, which is the Parliamentary Friends um, of the ABC. I was uh, lucky enough to spend a bit of time chatting to a couple of regional heads of uh, the Friends of the ABC organisation that were uh, in the building for a, a Parliamentary Friends of the ABC event. Um, and I put to them some of the ideas that uh, have been, been circulated recently in relation to the future of our national broadcaster, particularly the idea that is floated by uh, some in the Liberal Party and in, in the national spaces, uh, that it be separated um, and that a, a rural and regional broadcaster be created and the rest of it sold off. Um, and the president, I think it was, of the New South Wales regional chapter um, was quite angry with that idea. And I was, I was quite surprised. I said, you know, why? What would be the problem for, uh, for that with you? And she said, well, one of the greatest challenges that we have as country people um, is that the people in the cities don't always seem to understand us. Um, and we being isolated in rural and regional communities, don't get the opportunity to connect and engage with what's happening in uh, metro and other areas of the country. And so the fact that the ABC serves both uh, the rural and regional communities and the metro communities uh, allows it to act as a bridge between the two um, and ensure a continuation of shared understanding. And she said it was... <laughs> She said to me it was actually quite offensive to assume that any particular content on the ABC wouldn't be relevant uh, to, to rural and regional communities. Um, because actually, people in rural and regional communities like to know what's going on uh, in other parts of the country too. Um, and then we had a very interesting conversation about how uh, certain political parties in this place uh, seem to function to reduce 
uh, rural and regional identities and communities down to a flat parody of what they actually are for political purposes. And I said to them, well, enough about the National Party. Let's get back to the ALP um, and to the ABC more broadly. On the question of our national broadcaster, um, I've got to say I love it. Um, and there are so many people in our community that feel the same. As somebody that came to Australia from the UK, I now I hide my accent well, um, but it was uh, something that allowed me to begin to develop my identity as an Australian person and, and to connect with the community that I joined. I, I remember so fondly, obviously, a play school um, and, and all, of, uh, all of that. Also, uh, for anybody watching along at home, there was a series the ABC did when I was a kid called um, Ace Lightning, which was a early um, kind of uh, attempt to uh, meld together a children's program and like a computer animated thing, which I absolutely loved and rewatched recently and remembered and realized how utterly terrible the graphics were by modern standards. Um, but between that and the educational portions of ABC programming in the morning um, on the TV, uh, that, was, that was it for me, really. I, I consumed it all, loved it all, um, and found it, yeah, an, an amazing source of knowledge and information and connection to community and to the world. Um, and it struck me then, uh, even as a kid, that it seemed to be you could go to the ABC, whether on the radio, listening to a, a radio national program, um, at night on the beach in Rockingham listening to a story about thylacines. Um, I think I was probably eight at the time. Um, or whether it's, uh, you know, the children's programming in the afternoon um, or, you know, sitting on Pop's knee watching Late Line when it was technically bedtime. Um, that it was somewhere that you could go where there wasn't the noise. You know, you could actually just go and engage with the information. Um, now, in this job, um, I've discovered that that is so much the case. Um, if you put the ABC next to any of its commercial equivalents, uh, there's just no comparison. I mean, putting aside the, the gross, horrible, spewing stuff that comes out of a channel like Sky Often, um, trying, to, trying to consume their content uh, is uh, really actually quite challenging because there's about 14 million things happening on the screen simultaneously um, and it breaks every five or ten minutes for an ad session. Um, every Australian should be concerned that there are views given oxygen within their government that are not only um, uh, somewhat questioning of the value of the ABC, they are nakedly hostile to the ABC. Nakedly hostile to the ABC. They want to cut it up and sell it off. They don't want it to be a thing anymore. And they'll come in here and they'll give you all of these arguments and they'll clasp their hands behind their back like it's a young liberal meeting. Um, and talk about the history and all the rest of it. The reality is, if you cut it all down and cut out the noise, what is their problem? Their problem is that sometimes the ABC has the gall to fact-check them. That's the problem. And it fact-checks them and it finds out they're speaking nonsense and then they come in here and they have a sad. And they take that sad to the cabinet room and they put all of these ideological ideas around it and they say, for these reasons, we've got to cut the thing up and sell it off. When really it's just that they're annoyed with the fact that they've been fact-checked and called out. Well, rather than trying to take the knife to the national broadcaster, may I suggest that a better course of action is actually to do your homework before you speak. And then this whole thing can be avoided. Now, Senator Anton Young, who has done fantastic work uh, in this space, and I think is quite fairly regarded as the Parliament's fiercest champion for the national broadcaster, has made the observation that those currently uh, criticising 
uh, uh, made the observation that Ida Butros, the current chair, uh, could eat some of her critics for breakfast. Uh, I totally agree uh, that she absolutely should. Uh, uh, but knowing some of her critics, uh, I would suggest that she not do that, because uh, I can't imagine that they would be very good for her health. Um, uh, well, she's a vegan. Okay, well, then they're safe. Um, specifically to the idea of selling off Triple J. Uh, Triple J is a fantastic institution. Um, it is often one of the only mediums through which uh, information about uh, public affairs, uh, complex issues in our community, are actually addressed by young people uh, in a way that is relevant to our lives. Um, programs like HACK are indispensable, uh, and it also has the proud honour of being uh, the host of the world's largest uh, experiment in musical democracy, uh, with over three million people participating in the POTUS 100 process every single year. Um, it is a platform that has given uh, a space to innumerable artists that make incredible contributions uh, to our cultural life as a, as a community. Um, and it absolutely should be preserved and celebrated. The ABC, as I said at the beginning, is excellent and should be celebrated and supported and well funded. This government's taken about a billion dollars out of it between 2014 and what they plan to do through to the 2024 budget. Now, not only is this money uh, in need of urgent return to the ABC, uh, what is actually needed is for uh, the proper investment to be made. It's not good enough just to take them back to where they were in 2012. We actually need to see uh, proper investment in our ABC so that it is able to be the dynamic, diverse, relevant uh, and trustworthy public broadcaster uh, that our community loves, uh, needs uh, and wants to continue existing. Thank the Chamber for its time. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I think in the, in the first instance I would like to correct the record in one sense, and that is that there are members on this side of the chamber who have listened to Triple J. There are members of the chamber who have listened to Triple J. And I must say, whilst um, my good friend from Western Australia was giving his uh, wistful uh, remembrances in terms of engagement with the public broadcaster, I thought back to 1991 when uh, I, I, I was going through... No, you weren't born yet, absolutely. And I'd gone through a particularly uh, torrid um, uh, matter of the heart and I was looking for uh, some emotional soccer and uh, I spent the day listening to Triple J's Hottest 100. So it was uh, 1991 and... Uh, sorry, what was that, Senator Watt? And... Order. 1991, and let me tell you what was on um, Triple J's Hottest 100 in 1991. Number one was Smell, Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. Number two, Love Will Tear Us Apart by Joy Division. Now, that wasn't a particularly great song for me to be listening to in that state of mind. Lithium by Nirvana. It all had a pretty bleak quality, I must say. Uh, Throw Your Arms Around Me by Hunters and Collectors. Tomorrow, Windy. How Soon Is Now by The Smiths. Blister in the Sun by Violet Femmes. Now, I listen, I've heard that song at many uh, young Liberal conventions after dark, the uh, Violent Femmes. So there are those of us on this side of the chamber who have engaged with Triple J in the past and have, uh, and I, I, I was a fan of Triple J. I'm more likely now to listen to jazz on ABC after dark, I must say, I must say, but, uh, but uh, I do listen to our public broadcasters. One point which has been missed in this debate from those who have uh, spoken on the other side of this topic has been with respect to how ads, advertisements, have actually assisted one of our great public broadcasters, the SBS, in terms of delivering quality material to the Australian people. And I just want to quote from SBS's uh, annual corporate plan 2020-21, and this is on page 13, and I quote, SBS's unique hybrid funding model means that commercial returns may be channelled back, channeled back into curating charter-focused content while continued government funding support 
allows for stability and long-term creative ambitions to be realised. End quote. End quote. So we actually have an example. We have an example of a publicly owned broadcaster, which has a hybrid model. There is a degree of advertising. There is a degree of advertising on SBS, and its charter has not been undermined. So those on the opposite side of the chamber should reflect, should reflect on the fact that SBS has managed, has managed to run ads whilst also being true to its charter. It has not undermined its independence. It has not undermined the important public function that it has undertaken. SBS's 2019 to 20 annual report, uh, item 1.2a in the financial statement, says that from service delivery, including advertising revenue, SBS in 2020 generated $114 million of revenue. $114 million of revenue. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't it a good thing that whilst having the safeguards in place to protect its editorial independence, especially around news and current affair, affairs, it's managed to generate a stream of revenue, a stream of revenue which has allowed it to produce more content. Isn't that a positive thing? Why do we have to be so negative, negative about commercial realities, which is that appropriate advertising can generate revenue which can assist in paying for quality content, assist in paying for quality content for the benefit of the Australian people. SBS has appropriate safeguards in place with respect to advertising, and I quote from um, section 5 of the Code of Practice 2014, I quote, SBS may broadcast advertisements and sponsorship announcements that run in total for not more than five minutes in, an hour, in any hour of broadcasting. Revenue from advertisements and sponsorship announcements assists in the funding of programming which fulfills SBS's charter obligations. Those, op end of quote. Those opposite haven't mentioned this at all, this hybrid model and the success of it. Hasn't been mentioned. Hasn't been mentioned. SBS, the three SBS hasn't been mentioned by those opposite during the course of this debate. Because it undermines their argument, to be frank. It undermines their argument because this hybrid model actually works. I quote again from section 5 of the Code of Practice. All decisions regarding commercial revenue are subject to the overriding principle that the integrity of the SBS charter and SBS's editorial independence are paramount. SBS reserves the exclusive right to determine what is broadcast on SBS services. End quote. Entirely appropriate. The safeguard is there which permits advertising on a public broadcaster, which enables SBS to produce more content, Australian content, for the benefit of the Australian community. What's the problem? What's the problem? It actually works. So then again we look at the facts. I don't need an ABC fact checker on this. The ABC or whoever's listening, you can do your fact checking on me. Uh, page 75 of the annual report 2020 from SBS actually has a section on page 75 dealing with the SBS Ombudsman. And this details the complaints because SBS actually has a complaint process. If you have some concern about ads undermining the editorial independence of SBS. And let's look at the figures. So during the course of uh, the period with 2019 to 2020, in relation to complaints, there were 34 complaints with respect to accuracy on the SBS, not many. 29 per cent with respect to 29, I should say, with respect to how different programs were classified. Again, not, not terribly many, but a few complaints there. How many complaints were there about advertising on, the, on SBS? How many? Eight. Eight. Eight complaints about advertising on SBS. Less than one a month. Eight. Eight complaints. So where's the issue? Where's the issue? Isn't it a good thing to allow our public broadcasters to generate a stream of revenue which will enable them, enable them to produce more Australian-based content and actually discharge their service? I mean, the reality of the matter is there are so many calls made upon us in this place for funding from so many desirable uh, endeavours and things which we need to address in this place. The permission for SBS to have advertising and the track record of adver advertising on SBS demonstrates that it can work in the context of a public broadcaster. And we've seen it work. Eight complaints, 
2019 to 2020. That's all there's been. Eight complaints. I don't know. I've been trying to find out how they were resolved to actually see how many of them uh, went through to ACMA or the different complaint authorities and were assessed and judged. But that's all there is. There's only eight complaints in the whole year. How many people watch SBS? Only eight complaints. There could be eight complaints from one person, as much as I know. I don't know how many people actually complained. But there's the proof. There's the proof, Mr. Acting Deputy President. There's the proof that a hybrid model actually works, and it enables SBS to produce more content for the benefit of the Australian people. Isn't that a good thing? Wouldn't we like to see more women's sport on our public broadcaster? And if, in order to get that women's sport on our public broadcaster, there needs to be some advertising or sponsorship, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? SBS has demonstrated that it can work. It can work. We need to be open-minded, open-minded with respect to funding op opportunities for our public broadcasters. They provide an absolutely valuable, invaluable service to the Australian community, and I think um, those opposite, by the very fact, by the very fact that they refused or decided not to, I, they must be aware. I can't believe they're not aware of the fact that SBS runs ads. I'm a frequent watcher of SBS, SBS World Movies, a lot of the uh, cultural programming on SBS, current affairs in particular. So I, I assume those opposite are watching SBS, but not one of them, not one of them in this debate has actually mentioned advertising on SBS. And I can only assume it's because there's some sort of ideological objection to having ads on a public broadcaster, even though it works even though it works. So don't come into this place, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, don't come into this place throwing bricks at those of us on this side of the chamber and accuse us of being ideologues when you're not prepared to enter into a reasonable discussion about a hybrid funding model which over the course of quite a few years SBS has been running has proven to be successful, as demonstrated by the fact there were only eight complaints during 2019 to 2020 in thank relation to advertising you, on SBS. Uh, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of, uh, of public importance. And uh, just to pick up on uh, Senator Scar's uh, uh, last comments there in terms of SBS and ABC, well, I've had the opportunity to work at both, Mr Acting Deputy President. And in fact, I can give a comparison of what it's like. Uh, this has to be about whether the Australian Parliament uh, supports public broadcasting in this country, and in what form does it support uh, public broadcasting. If we look at the history, uh, certainly over the last eight years, ten year, uh, certainly the eight years that the, the uh, coalition government has been in, there has been no doubt the enormous cuts uh, to public broadcasting in this country. Uh, have been exponential, uh, not only with SBS but incredibly so with the ABC. We only have to look at the regional areas of this country, and I'm sure all of those members in the other House who have electorates in the regional areas of Australia will know how valuable and how absolutely vital uh, the public broadcaster is to this country. We've seen uh, those here in the Senate from regional areas who have joined with us in our battles to stop the cuts to the ABC. Let's look at shortwave, for example, in the Northern Territory. For many, many years we fought, and we even had uh, Senator McKenzie join us on this side, certainly with Senate inquiries, uh, acknowledging the fact that the public broadcaster is an absolutely vital service. Cutting it and cutting it and cutting it completely uh, in those areas where it reaches remote Australians and regional Australians is having a detrimental impact. So let's acknowledge in the Senate that those cuts have been unfair. So when you throw on top of it the pressure of now having to go down the path of ad advertising on the ABC and you compare the advertising on SBS, well, there hasn't been an adequate body of work done on that. Because I can tell you, senators, 
you would only have to ask some of those employees in SBS as to how they think that organisation is running. And I can tell you a few things of what they tell me. So no, having advertising on SBS isn't the panacea that uh, senators opposite would like to think it is. And nor is it an example that you should hold up that says this is why the ABC should be going down that path. You know, that's not good policy. And yes, it's all about politics. But the Australian Parliament has to be better than that. The Australian government has to be better than that. Ask the Australian people what they think. Come to the Northern Territory and find out what people feel in relation to the fact that shortwave has disappeared for nearly five years, where we once were able to hear when cyclones were coming, when we were able to be aware of road floodings, road closures, when remote communities, when rangers out on their boats, when fishos out on the seas were able to tune into the ABC through shortwave, they can no longer do that. Time and time again, I've stood in the Senate to express the importance of the ABC in our remote and regional Australia. If you think putting ads on Triple J, on ABC programs, is going to be the answer, then you're just missing the point as usual. The public broadcaster is vital in its role as an independent media service not influenced by political or commercial interests. And yet this government wants to see Aussie kids watching advertisements during children's programming and it wants to see commercial influence in ABC News and Current Affairs. Haven't we just seen in recent weeks the complete attack on the ABC over the importance of the integrity in reporting? You, you cannot even agree with it now and then you want to throw in something else to just add to the pressures that that organisation is experiencing. It's hardly surprising, isn't it? We know that this government is on a mission to destroy the public broadcaster. You absolutely are. There is no doubt about what your intentions are. We know that you have form. And I've given one example of shortwave in the Northern Territory, and we're still our cattle stations up there, our truckies who drive the highways, and the grey nomads who go along the Stewart Highway and beyond. There's no way they know what's going on because you remove that. Oh yeah, you can say that the ABC made that decision, but there was a reason why it was forced to make that kind of decision. It's because you lot keep taking, keep taking, keep taking the amount of money that's required to keep a very good public service in this country. In 2018, the, federal, the Liberal Federal Council voted to privatise the ABC. And we all know about the Howard government's attempt to privatise ABC International was an abject failure. You remember that one? You know, ABC overseas. Yeah, you probably forget that one conveniently. And since the coalition came to power in 2014, the ABC has lost $783 million in funding. That's according to a 2020 report into the accumulated impact of government cuts to the public broadcaster. And the report's author said the ABC was now operating with the smallest budget since the Howard government's 2 per cent funding cut in 1996 removed $55 million from the ABC's triennial funding. Today, the ABC has more services, including iView, ABC Online and podcasts, yet so much less money. So while facing these cuts, the bushfire crisis of summer 2020 added an extra $3 million in emergency broadcasting costs, which had to be absorbed into the budget. And we're certainly grateful that they did. The ABC saves lives during emergency times 
with journalists in newsrooms across the country working tirelessly to get accurate and up-to-date information out. How many senators in this chamber sit on their iPads, sit on their phones and go through the news and check what the ABC is reporting? It's all those journalists and producers out there who are bringing it in here for you. Objectivity. They are bringing stories from right around the country, all the way up there in Arnhem Land, northeast Arnhem Land, across to the Kimberleys, down to Perth, over to Adelaide, across to Victoria, Mildura, Wagga, you name it. ABC journos are bringing this Senate, this country, the stories that matter. And yet you continuously disrespect that organisation, which is our national organisation as a public broadcaster. And senators opposite have asked about SBS. Well, SBS certainly does punch above its weight. But let me tell you that if you're absolutely serious in wanting to know what uh, the workers of SBS and the workers of the ABC think about advertising, then put it to the test. Do your homework. But don't just go in there demanding that, that advertising needs to take place on the ABC simply because, A, you don't want to give it any more money and B, you don't like it anyway, because that's what this is about, isn't it? It is about politics. It's not about good policy. The journalists, the producers, the staff, the camera crews, the editors, all of the people who work in our ABC newsrooms, ABC offices, from dramas to children's programming, they do an exceptional job, and this parliament needs to show more respect for all of those people who work in our public broadcaster, the ABC and SBS. The time for discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. I'll go through them in order to assist the chamber. Uh, Document number one. Any senator wish to speak on document number one? Yes. Yep. Um, can I just um, note that report and seek leave to continue my, rep my remarks, please, Chair? Is, uh, leave granted. Uh, leave, leave, leave is granted. Uh, and document number two, Australian National University. No senator wishes to speak on that. I will. Are there any? Just looking at my, I'll just go to. Are there any ministerial statements, Minister? Um, uh, yes, I table a response to a question taken on notice during question time on 11 May 2021, asked by Senator Kitching, relating to National Disability Insurance Scheme, and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Uh, leave is granted, uh, Minister. Oh, sorry, sorry to Senator Kitching. I wish to speak to this and to, I think, what will await for Senator Sizelja. I can do it separately or together. So I might respond to that first. If you could do I'll it now, please. I'll so seek Senator leave Kitching. To, thank you. Um, on 11 May this year, during question time, I asked the Minister um, for the NDIS and Government Services questions relating to the net tragic and unnecessary death of Liam Danher. On 5 February, Liam Danher died of a seizure in his sleep while his parents were next door. He was 23 years old and severely had a severe intellectual disability. He was also suffering from autism and epilepsy. Liam's parents have said that his death was avoidable and could have been prevented if he had been provided with a seizure mat. And I'll come to the cost of that seizure mat shortly. Liam's parents have spoken out about being cut out when Liam was moved from a state-run service onto the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The Danhers had become increasingly worried that their son might be having rare nighttime seizures. Even his neurologist had recommended the purchase of the, wait for it, $445 mat, $445, which would detect a seizure and sound an alarm. Liam's family have since been told 
that the $445 figure was just for the MAT component, and they would have happily paid for this, Acting Deputy President, but that the whole setup was priced at over $2,000. However, let's compare that cost with the cost of what the government spent fighting the Dan Hers in the AAT. The $2,000 is a mere fraction of that cost, and that is why we are here today. The minister has just tabled a response to a question taken on notice during question time on 11 May this year. The questions taken on notice were, one, how many thousands of taxpayer dollars did the Morrison government spend on legal advice and lawyers to deny Liam his $445 seizure mat? Question two, could you answer the question about what you spent in legal costs? Question three, why then did the National Disability Insurance Agency still deny Liam the support he needed? And the minister's response in the documents just tabled was, one, two, three, circumstances relating to this case are currently under review by the NDIA. The outcomes will be communicated to the family prior to any public commentary. That's right, Acting Deputy President. The Minister has again failed the Dan Her family by refusing to answer just how much her cruelty and this cruel government has spent trying to deny their son a relatively inexpensive item that we now know would have saved his life. He would not be dead. He would not be dead. Three of Liam's own treating professionals, including a neurologist, recommended that he have this mat. With the overwhelming evidence suggesting Liam needed this potentially life-saving device, the agency instead of amending his plan to provide it, spent 18 months in the AAT trying to deny him this. The agency deployed thuggish tactics, engaged lawyers and barristers. Liam was unable to access legal aid and the NDIA stopped his parents from representing him. He was by himself. Perhaps the saddest part of this whole story is that a week after Liam's death, the NDIA contacted the family's support coordinator requesting quotes for the seizure mat. Now, the least the minister could do, after what we now know that, about the tragic death of Liam Danher, is that she has not done this, but the least she could do is offer a personal and heartfelt apology. Even this is too much, too much for this minister. Last Wednesday, when I asked the minister if she had personally apologised to Liam Danher's family, she gave one of the most offensive answers I have heard in this place. The minister said, my chief of staff has been in contact with Mr Danher, and I have, through my chief of staff, ordered to either in person or on the phone talk with Mr Danher myself. The minister also said, if my chief of staff does something on my behalf, then I consider that is the case. And I did on further questioning clarify that point, that it was in fact my staff. However, the Danhers have told Labor that they would like the parliament to also get any answers about their son's case on the record. That is the family. And yet she spent that question time, Senator Reynolds spent that question time saying that, oh no, you know, I'm, just, I'm think, thinking of the family, I just want to consider their feelings. I'm paraphrasing Acting Deputy President because I'm not sure she was that articulate. But what she did, and remember she has also previously said that she had in fact contacted the family when in fact it transpired that she had not, her department had, and then now we find out that it's her chief of staff, not even her, not even at that point. Now that family is very happy for those answers to be tabled. Correct answers, full answers, answers to the question rather than the mealy-mouthed rubbish that we just got um, just then. Instead of always feigning woe is me, perhaps the minister should take some responsibility for her ministerial responsibilities and actions and pick up the phone to the Danhers and apologise. And while she's at it, she could also inform the Senate how much the government spent trying to avoid providing the Danher family with a simple device that could have saved their son's life. Today at an event, for, the, for motor neurone disease for the Global Day today. Senator Reynolds heard from Peter Chambers, whom she referred to in a response to a question in Question Time today, who had been rejected by the NDIS the first time around. What did she say? I paraphrase. Oh, she said, oh, we must get on to those administrative problems. This is a person with motor neurone disease, rejected by the NDIA, and she says, oh, it's a bit of an administrative problem. She is overpromoted and she feels sorry for herself for losing the portfolio she did have. Not much will be remembered about Senator Reynolds' reign of error other than a lack of candour, a lack of rigour, a lack of intellect and a lack of decency. Uh, the question before the chair is that the Senate uh, take note. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Minister.
Uh, I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning COVID-19 vaccination certificates. Senator Kitching. That response. Um, leave granted, yes, leave granted. Thank you. Um, in taking note of this, I'm firstly going to take the chamber through a cognitive bias effect. Um, when we consider the performance of Minister Reynolds, we are afforded a living, breathing embodiment of what social psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger have described as the internal illusion in people of low ability, where they perceive their competence to be much higher than it is. And while a fascinating experiment to see just how out of her depth a minister can be without a whole government department collapsing and government programs failing, it is clearly time for the government to accept that the Dunning-Kruger effect is real and to put this hapless, heartless, cretinous minister out of her misery. On March 18 this year, I moved I'm, a motion— I'm, I'm wondering, um, sorry, Senator, Senator Brockman. The Chamber's offering a lot of leniency here, but 1933. I mean, this is very clearly a personal reflection. Senator Kitchen, if you could. Is it hapless, heartless, uh, I, cretinous? I, I, Senator Kitchen, it would assist the Chamber if you could just withdraw, please. Well, I think if everyone goes and looks at the Dunning Kruger effect, Senator they will Kitchen, see that Senator, they will see that, that it does Senator describe Kitchen, Senator Reynolds. Just please withdraw just to assist the, the, the well, Chamber, please. Well, I mean the Dunning Kruger effect is a you can you know, it's a it's a Senator, psychological Senator Kitching, if psychological you, if you could just please yeah. withdraw, that's all, all I'm asking, please. Um, well uh, rather why, why didn't I say not entirely sorry, competent. Um, not entirely competent no, minister. Sorry, 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 Senator Brockman. Yeah, you've been asked to withdraw. Okay. Sorry, Senator Kitching, you withdraw. Okay, On 18 you. March this thank year, you. I moved a motion in the Senate that passed with the support of the entire crossbench, requiring the minister to table a monthly report outlining information on COVID-19 vaccination certificates, including the number of certificates issued, number uploaded to the Australian Immunisation Register, number made available on the MyGov app, average number of days between receiving a vaccine and the certificate being made available, among other information. And this was to be tabled. Let's see what we got. On 8th of April, I received the first reply to the order, which instead of being the report that is required, was a letter from, the minister, from minister Reynolds. Here she declined to provide the report on the basis that, and I quote, the request is premised by an assumption that Services Australia provides COVID-19 vaccination certificates to individuals immunised against COVID-19. This is not the case as the proof of vaccination process is customer initiated and the production and potential sharing of any proof of vaccination is controlled by the individual solely and designed to support a range of essential vaccines requirements and settings. However, the minister's letter goes on to say, Services Australia's role is to maintain the record of vaccination. Let's move back in time to the previous minister in this area, Minister Robert whom I have to say um, I think his sole qualification was that he was the Prime Minister's flatmate. But he said in an interview with Cran Kelly on the 8th of February, so the vaccination record gets updated with every vaccination you receive. So after your first dose, you'll be able to look at your vaccination certificate online or indeed go and print it out or the vaccination provider can print it out for you and you'll see that it'll have the first dose and then you'll see it'll have the second dose. He went on to say, and I quote, so it'll be able to be provided in hard copy, either through the vaccination provider or through Services Australia. If you call us, we'll send it to you or pop into a service centre. Now, it is common knowledge around this building that Minister, Roberts has, Minister Robert has always said that he's never going down, he's always only going up because he's a friend of the Prime Minister's. Um, but you know, this minister, what we've seen replaced, what he's been replaced with is no better. He's made other similar statements during other interviews. In community affairs estimates on Friday the 4th of June, Services Australia acknowledged that vaccination certificates, and I'll put that in quotes, Acting Deputy President, vaccination certificates were coming very soon. In fact, the minister noted on that day, amongst, may I add, Acting Deputy President, many, many, many other things she said, both on Hansard and privately, is that the minister noted that, and I quote, that's the next step. So we've got a table that we wanted to see the vaccination certificates, as was provided by the previous minister, by Minister Robert. We've then got the current minister. You know, anyway, she, she's not very. I'll, I'll, look, I won't say I know one nine three three, but you, let's face it. So then she goes on to say, "This is the next step." So just remember that. I then wrote to the minister on the 11th of June to remind her that now that it had been acknowledged that vaccination certificates were here 
there was no reason my order could not be complied with. In my correspondence, I noted that vaccination certificates is the recognised term. And now that vaccination certificates are being provided to those who have been fully vaccinated, a plain language reading of Order 1077 would be that it stands as is and that Services Australia is able to furnish the Senate with a monthly report detailing the information requested. After all this, the Minister comes to the Senate today and, using similar weasel words to the first response to Order 1077, says, This request is premised by an assumption that Services Australia provides COVID-19 vaccination certificates. It's as if she never heard a single word that was being said at the table during estimates. The Services Australia provides COVID-19 vaccination certificates to individuals immunised against COVID-19. This is not the case as the proof of vaccination process is customer initiated and the production and potential sharing of any proof of vaccination is controlled by the individual solely. The former minister has said, the for, so this is Minister Robert, the former minister has said we will have vaccination certificates for COVID-19. The current minister has said this. The department has said this. And if you have received both doses of your COVID-19 vaccination, you can log into my Gov app right now and see your vaccination certificate. But the minister still refuses to provide the information set out in Order 1077 agreed to by this Senate. I can only assume that this is because the vaccination rollout so far has been a disaster. That so few have still re received the COVID-19 vaccine is a national disgrace. If this government can't get this right, how do we expect that they'll be able to open up this country and get the economy going again? Not only has the government failed in its responsibility to keep its citizens safe, it has also failed on its responsibility to provide for the conditions that ensure Australians can be prosperous. And with what we've seen is two ministers who are totally out of their depth. The question before the chair is the Senate take note. Those that have been say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Leave granted. Uh, leave is granted. Thank you. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Okay. Um, uh, the question is the uh, senator agree. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, messages. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Biosecurity Amendment, Strengthening Penalties Bill 2021, Farm Household Support Amendment, Debt Waiver Bill 2021 and Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 4 Bill 2021. Minister. Uh, I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. By Security Amendment Strengthening Penalties Bill 2021, Farm Household Support Amendment, Debt Waiver Bill 2021, Treasury Laws Amendment 2021, Measures No. 4 Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Uh, leave is granted. I move that the debate be now adjourned and the bills be listed as separate orders of the day. Thank you. Uh, and the question of the, the, those of that agreement say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. Oh, one more. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate the House has agreed to the Treasury Laws Amendment, self-managed superannuation funds, Bill, Bill 2020 without amendment and be agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the following bills. Transport Security Amendment, Serious Crimes Bill 2020, Treasury Laws Amendment, More Flexible Superannuation Bill 2020, and Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment Site Specification, Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And if I can pick up where I left off in discussing Australia's impeccable track record 
uh, with delivering a high level of safety and assurance in the operation of these complexities around nuclear technology. I think it's worth briefly reflecting on the fact that radioactive waste facilities, such as is contemplated, are located in the farming regions of France, Belgium, the UK, Spain, the United States and Germany. The impact of those sites on local agriculture was considered as part of the Senate economics inquiry into this bill, and the inquiry found that the international examples provide a strong argument that such a radioactive facility will not undermine agricultural activities or our reputation as a world-leading agricultural exporter of quality. In short, this facility would be subject to strict regulation, meet Australia's already high bar in terms of licensing and environmental approvals, be responsive to the concerns of local communities. And it's for that reason, after all of these years, it is finally time to see the Morrison government implement this important reform. I thank the Senate. Thank you, uh, Senator Small. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, this evening, as we in this place debate the National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill, I am reminded of many such debates in this place, some that have resulted in successful legislation and others that have uh, been mired in dispute in large part because of the failings of government to adequately consult. We know in Australia that radioactive waste is stored in a great many places, which is an undesirable thing. More than 100, including Australia's hospitals and, of course, at Lucas Heights, the originator of much uh, of that nuclear medicine material. And so it is that our nuclear waste, radioactive waste, has built up over 60 years. It's a legacy that has supported the medical treatment of many, many thousands of Australians, including my own family members. It is therefore an important industry uh, that we need to find a solution for uh, its waste disposal. We know there will come a time when the storage at Lucas Heights runs out of room. Lucas Heights does have some capacity to you know, keep the waste there, but I've visited Lucas Heights and it is a fairly constrained site. And ANSTO have made it clear they would rather use that space for other scientific endeavours than uh, to have ongoing status as a waste facility. The, de uh, the department has claimed that ANSTO uh, is going to be completely full by 2030 in any case. And so for more than a decade, uh, I've participated in debates around this issue where the parliament and the government has yet to find a solution. We know that if we're going to continue to use nuclear medicine, a dedicated storage facility is necessary. And back in 2012, the Gillard government enacted the, radioactive, sorry, the National Radioactive Waste Management Act of 2012 for the purpose of creating certainty in a process to enable site selection for a waste management facility for this low-level uh, waste. However, in the hands of this government, they have entirely botched that process, in large part because of their failures to properly consult with First Nations people and traditional owners uh, who have a cultural relationship with the community and lands around Kimba. It's a shame that this government has made such a mess of this process that it's trampled on the rights of First Nations people, particularly, I would note, in its attempt previously to get the Labor Party to simply vote for its site, the, its site selection to override that community consultation process because it botched that process. It botched that process explicitly by failing to include and uh, 
specifically excluding First Nations people from those consultation processes. Uh, it's all very well for uh, local government to have a vote, which is terrific, for ratepayers to have a vote, but there are a whole range of different cultural values and relationships with that country that should have been taken into account, as was intended uh, by Labor when it enacted that legislation. The original bill, the government we know that was due to be debated in this place, previously proposed a new facility at Napandi near Kimba to store low-level waste and to temporarily store intermediate waste. I think it's important to note that high-level waste uh, should not be stored there. That is not what the community has voted for. It certainly, not, uh, certainly also has the objection of First Nation traditional owners. But the thing is, it hasn't taken much, now that this site has been identified, for many of those office opposite to now start talking about a nuclear power and nuclear energy future for Australia. So we need to be very careful lest we jeopardise the mandate for important mandate for nuclear medicine and the need to consult with community, to consult with First Nations people to find a site where we can safely store this waste. To have those opposite starting to uh, mix things up by talking about their support for nuclear energy and nuclear power is, I think, uh, an indictment on what has already been a terrible process. It's worth noting Australia will receive intermediate level waste in 2022. This is waste indeed that's been created by Australia and has been reprocessed into a form that is safe for storage and that it's due to be stored at Lucas Heights until a dedicated facility is available. So as you start to see that that intermediate level waste starts to come in, you can see the looming pressure there on Lucas Heights. The Senate Economics Committee, through its inquiry, has taken evidence that showed some in the community, uh, a majority of ratepayers were perhaps supportive of this facility, but it's not the view taken by all of the community, including many farmers and others that will have that have significant concerns about the impact on the region's agricultural production. Others I know have said that the facility will provide economic opportunity in the region. I do note though that there's little capacity for traditional owners to participate in deliberation around whether they support or whether they get economic benefit from such a project when they have been so overtly excluded uh, from that process. The Bangala uh, Aboriginal Corporation has criticised the process undertaken by this government to assess community attitudes to the facility. They've notably shown uh, quite comprehensively how inadequate those processes have been, including on the grounds that its members were excluded from taking part in the community ballot commissioned to assess community sentiment around the site. I think this is an extreme act of negligence and disrespect that this government has committed. It's an act of disrespect that we've seen repeated in other Commonwealth actions including in the Commonwealth's failure to intervene under the powers that it might have had, that it does have, for the protection of Jukun Gorge, and indeed also at the Gunlom site in Kakadu National Park. We need to see First Nations traditional owners in our nation given a respected place at the table in all of these kinds of projects so that their traditional connection and culture is held central to our decision-making as a nation. Until we do that, and unless we do that, it's very difficult to see how uh, the search for a nuclear waste uh, facility 
is going to be successful because we've seen time and time again that the community division that's created uh, through the failure to up, up, uphold community consultation and consent has brought previous processes rightfully undone. And, uh, it was a privilege to talk to traditional owners around Muckety Station uh, in the past who, through many Senate inquiries, also raised the concerns that they had about their country being um, the chosen site for uh, disposal at Muckety. What's telling in this case really is that, uh, that it has brought around an inevitable failure uh, for a successful site to be found, but it has also brought around incredible upset and discontent for these communities who have been put through these arduous processes uh, where they have felt excluded, marginalised and put upon for what is uh, a profound impact in their mind uh, for, for such uh, a storage facility on their country. To my mind, it's why a First Nations voice to parliament, as called for in the Uluru Statement, is so important because it would mean that we can't debate legislation like this without having a proper intersection of First Nations voices into our deliberation on those issues. It's critical that we have a voice to parliament so that this parliament and indeed governments can legislate responsibly and effectively in the interests of First Nations people and most importantly, in the interest of being able to get things done, important things done on behalf of the whole nation. We know that last year the government wanted to, in effect, try and uh, wedge Labor into helping it select their preferred uh, site in a departure from the legislation that's before us today, uh, where we have seen now uh, the Kimber site uh, put forward in the legislation, as well as two others uh, that could prospectively, with community consultation, also be chosen. We know that the government has agreed to reinstate the ministerial site declaration process in the current Act, which is as proposed previously by Labor. It remains unclear to me, other than uh, they didn't want to be. They, they wanted to make Labor complicit with overriding the rights of First Nations people in appealing that decision uh, to have the previous legislation come before the Parliament. Labor very firmly believes that an aggrieved party should have access to judicial review. And if people feel that the decision to locate the facility in their community, on their country, on their farming land, was, uh, on their traditional uh, ownership country, was not reached in a proper manner, then they should have the capacity to seek that judicial review of those decisions as to whether they were made properly in the first case. I note there has been unanimous opposition from traditional owners. It would appear that if the legislation were to pass uh, previously, the outcome would have been to impose this facility on traditional owners that didn't want it on their country. On this basis, that's why we moved an amendment to that bill that would remove Schedule 1 while retaining Schedules 2 and 3. Uh, so the previous bill, Schedule 1, dealt with site specification. Schedules 2 and 3 dealt with the community fund and other measures. So uh, we're now uh, back in the place where the government has seen sense. But I'm still incredulous that this government uh, would have sought to ask Labor to be complicit in having imposed that site on that community. Uh, and unfortunately for us, uh, we didn't want to support the, uh, the overriding of their judicial rights, 
but we certainly didn't want to see, therefore, a site declaration made uh, that would have seen the community fund uh, go to waste when it should, have been, should be properly in place to support local community impacts. It's worth bearing in mind that judicial review of the decision only allows the legality of the decision to be tested rather than the merits of that decision. And uh, in that context, I would note that if the proceedings are unsuccessful, there's no guarantee uh, that a site selection would not still go ahead without the accompanying community fund, which was pre in, uh, in the previous legislation. The rigmarole that this parliament and, th and indeed the local community has had to go through to get to this place, I have to say, is a sad indictment on the environment that this government has fostered when it comes to consultation and inclusion of First Nations people. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the uh, National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill uh, 2020. Uh, now, I want to go back a, a little bit in history so that the Chamber is aware of how we got to where we are today, uh, because uh, the, the, the bottom line is this bill is a bit of a ruse. It's a facade, and uh, I need to ground that properly uh, in order to uh, uh, for, for people to understand exactly what I'm talking about. We go back to 2012 with a, a bill that, uh, um, where we're seeking to establish a, a national radioactive waste management facility. And I might point out I'm in favour of such a facility. Okay, I think we need a facility. We do need to take responsibility for our own uh, radioactive waste. And I say in terms of the, the safety aspects and, and the philosophy now, I'm, not a, I'm not in any way a person who's you know, fearful of radioactive material. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in this place that has spent uh, weeks sleeping uh, within the distance of this chamber to a, to a, uh, uh, a nuclear reactor on, uh, on US submarines when I've spent time on them. So it's not like I'm uh, concerned about uh, that side of the, the ledger. But um, my... Uh, but, but if I look at the process that we've gone through to select a site, that's where I have uh, some major concerns. Um, firstly, the, the whole process, the concept behind it is, is fundamentally flawed. Instead of selecting the best site for a facility in Australia, we kind of had a raffle and said, who wants to have a site in their backyard? Who wants to have a site on their land? And of course, people, people put up their hand, but that's not the best way to select the best location. It's like trying to say, let's, uh, let's build a highway and we'll, uh, we'll go out and see who wants to have their house knocked down to have the highway uh, run somewhere. Okay, that's not the way in which you, you, you tackle a project. You work out the best route and then you deal with the, the issues along the way. And that's not what we've done uh, in this process. We've just said, uh, anyone wants to stick up their hand, we'll have a look at your property and see if it fits. Not the, not the best way to do that. Now, I might point out, I can see uh, Senator Smith, uh, Dean Smith across there, a Western Australian senator who perhaps you know, supports the, the facility, I'm, I'm guessing here, but uh, uh, you know, places like Leonora in Western Australia could, uh, could, well, could well be a site there are proponents that are pushing for that. And I went to, I went to Leonora, Senator Smith. I went to Leonora, ha, had a good look at it, and uh, spoke to some of the locals. And they, they, they said uh, that they were interested. In fact, they nominated, but the nomination was cut off. And, uh, but, but my point being, what we should do is look, we should have done is look around the country and say, where is the best site? What are the best characteristics for a site for a radioactive waste management facility? Um, and I've clearly touched a sore point because Senator Smith rarely interjects across the chamber. So, um, uh, the, 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 ha having picked a bad way to do this, then what happened was the government committed to the idea that they would not put a facility at a, at a location unless there was broad community support. Broad community support is what they promised. And you know what? 
when a minister of the Crown stands up and says, I'm going to put this, uh, this uh, facility at a place where there is broad community support, people are entitled to repose trust and confidence in what the minister says. That that's, uh, that's the criteria uh, against which uh, a decision would be made. Now, of course, uh, initially the government uh, you know, did, some, did some polling um, uh, using a private company, came up with some numbers, weren't very happy with the numbers. At this stage there were a few different sites. And so they upped their effort. They started bringing people in. They started taking people to Anstow. Interestingly, along the way, as they, as they travelled, they brought a bunch of exports to places like Kimber. And I'll concede that the government you know, did spend money to do that. But they, they didn't bring any contradictors. There were lots of contradictors along the way that wanted to offer a differing, differing opinion, but the government wouldn't, uh, wouldn't assist them get, getting there. And I might point at this time uh, that uh, it was. Uh, Minister Canavan that was at the, at the helm of this, and of course anyone who knows a bit of history about Senator Canavan, he actually started his first political party, it was a Marxist party. Okay, it's on record. Um, he, he was a member of the Marxist parties. <laughs> that, that, is, that, is, that, that is correct. As much as you might uh, uh, find that uh, um, unbelievable, sorry, that is Senator the case. Patrick, and, uh, and Senator so he, pa sorry, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Smith. Thank you, Chair. Senator Patrick knows you can't use unparliamentary language in the chamber. <laughs> <laughs> As a statement, not of fact, a point of order. You, you can, Senator, Senator Patrick, has thank the call. you. You can. Uh, I invite you to Google the word "canavan" and "Marxist," and you'll see uh, you'll see the history here. But but it's because he took a Stalinist approach in in, in his community consultation. He took a Stalinist approach, which was to uh, say, you know, the the the, the, the Soviet uh, uh, f uh, f free thought feel about it being. Please don't think your government will do that for you and then tell you what you need to know uh, in accordance with the doctrine. And that's the sort of approach we took with the community uh, at, uh, at Kimber. Look, eventually we got to the point where we had a vote. Now, in the lead up to the vote, uh, it wasn't unreasonable that, that we might expect to ask, what does broad community support mean? What's the definition of broad community support? You know, and uh, in fact, uh, to find the answer to that, on the um, 22nd of March 2017 in this chamber, former Senator Xenophon asked Senator Canavan, what's the criteria? And he said, well, we've taken, I'm quoting from uh, Senator, Senator Canavan, then Minister, uh, we had taken forward a proposal from the Hawker region, Senator Xenophon might be aware of that, where support was at 65 per cent. We have not put a definitive figure on broad community support for the reason uh, that it is not just about the overall figure would need to need a figure in the range of that support that we received in Hawker. So it kind of he laid down 65%. Uh, but of course, um, we need to consider other factors. Other factors like the direct neighbours. And I note the definitions of direct neighbours changed over the, 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 the period of the process. And we also needed to get the Indigenous people on board, the, Mo the Mangala people. We needed to get them on board as well. But again, in a Stalinist approach, uh, Comrade Conavan, Canavan uh, basically, um, you know, again stealing from, the, uh, from Stalin's uh, uh, playbook, uh, is that saying, you know, um, it's not the people who vote that count, it's the people that count the vote. We end up, ended up with a situation where um, uh, only after the vote came in did the minister say what broad community support was. Now we did get to 62%. The government spent a lot of money getting the community to 62%. But along the way, they still didn't uh, 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 deal with the neighbours, and they still didn't l l uh, deal with the, uh, the, the Mangala people. And I, I might point out that even, even uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the people that were allowed to vote. There were a number of people that were quite close to the facility that were unable to express their view in the vote because they lived outside the council area, the, the, the voting area. So they were excluded. Lots of people were excluded from the vote. And so we ended up with a completely flawed process. And we get to the point where eventually uh, we, we down select into uh, uh, away from Hawker, and I'm very disturbed now that we're going to upset the community if this bill passes. 
uh, and we, we, we reintroduce the idea that Hawker might be involved, that community has been through enough. We already know that the community in Kimber is, is split on this, and it's caused division and it's caused uh, irreparable division. You know, people that used to be mates, people that used to be friends, people that used to be, uh, you know, used to go and play football and with, with each other and cheer for the other kids. You know, people in Kimber now don't shop in certain shops because of the division created. And I note this bill tries to reinstate uh, division in the Hawker community, and that's not uh, uh, that's that's not acceptable. Anyway, so we get to the point where the government decides to make. Um, to, to, to uh, make a recommendation. Now they di they didn't make a decision under the Act. They were empowered under the current legislation. The minister was empowered to make a decision, but he didn't. Why didn't he do that? Because the the the, the AGS has clearly given the government advice that if you go down that pathway, there will be judicial review, and there's a reasonable chance that your process will get chucked out by a judge who looks at it closely. That's, well, that's likely what's going to happen. So what, what, did, uh, what did the government do? They said, Senate, please fix up our botched process by passing a law uh, that nominates the site, because you know what? The courts can't overturn that. And that's the process we, we, we were looking at when this bill first lob lobbed itself onto the, uh, onto the floor of the Senate. Now, of course, we've done an inquiry. We've looked into this, and I look. I thank the Labor Party. The Labor Party has done a good job in identifying a pretty key issue here, and that was the fact that uh, that uh, uh, the, the bill sought to oust any ability to conduct judicial review. Now, at the inquiry into this, I asked one of the officials, Miss Samantha Shard. Uh, uh, how, you know, how is it that, uh, well, you know, were you thinking about this? What was the conversations? Were you talking about judicial rule in the lead up to this bill being tabled? And uh, she couldn't recall. She couldn't recall doing that. Yet when I FOI'd her two or three days later, 500 and something documents that were in her possession that talked about judicial review. So deceiving of the, of the committee, and I've said much stronger words in the, in the dissenting report, you have an official who denies uh, that, that this bill was, uh, was about judicial review. A few days later, when faced with an FOI, and the FOI comes back is saying there's too many documents that mention that, we're going to have to refuse your FOI. That's the status. So we had uh, a deception, a deception by the government uh, who, who were trying to hide the fact that that was the intent to hide judicial review and supported by officials shamefully shamefully people that lied to a, to a Senate committee um, in order to, to, to cover up what the minister was really trying to do and that's what we got to we got to a point now where um, uh, the Senate has stood up and said, we are not going to fix your botched error, Senator Canavan. We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that for the, for the Liberal government. And so what, are they, what have they done now? They've tried to sort of smooth this over a bit by saying, OK, we're not going to get the parliament to select the site, but we're going to bring in some other players back into the game. We're going to bring back Lyndhurst in, in Kimber, which of course is just going to cause the same problem again on, on prime agricultural land putting a radioactive waste management facility, or we're going we're to uh, reintroduce, uh, reintroduce Hawker as, a, as an option. Again, the community in Hawker have had their say. They don't want the facility. Okay? And all you are going to do, we've heard uh, 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 in this debate, issues of uh, um, uh, heritage sites, sacred sites, and I say that because I've been there, I've been there, I've driven out, uh, out into the bush and had a look at these sites, uh, been taken by the indigenous communities out there and, and showing me proudly uh, their, their, their heritage. But that, and so that's what we're going to do with this bill. We're going to introduce uh, and bring back into the picture a few, more, uh, a few more options. Well, I will foreshadow, and I will talk about this in the committee stage, one of the options that I'm going to propose is Woomera, which is a place where maybe if we'd started out with the view of, instead of saying who wants to volunteer some land, if we'd started out with the view and said, 
what's the best place to put a facility, Woomera may well have been one of the places. In fact, it was actually examined in great detail under a former Liberal government uh, as, as, a, as a reasonable place to put a facility. But again, Leonora in Western Australia, the community there, I understand, again, travelled there, talked to Indigenous people, talked to the community, and they want the facility. And it got, uh, and it got knocked out. Okay, in fact, it wasn't allowed into this process. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I do thank the Labor Party for, for uh, uh, recognising Senator, uh, Senator McAllister did a fantastic job drawing out this in, in the committee stage that uh, this bill, uh, as it originally entered the Senate, was about ousting the jurisdiction of a court to deal with a botched process. Okay, and this bill uh, now, as a ruse, says that it's about maybe three sites again. When we know the government is going to uh, select Nepandi, that's what's going to happen as a result of this. Don't pretend for a moment. Don't try and deceive the Australian public that this bill is anything other than uh, a, a way to, to walk away from the failure uh, of the process, the failure of the bill when it, as it originally came into the Senate, to try and uh, you know, smooth over what has been a totally botched process. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the second reading of the National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment, Site Specification, Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020. The issue of a national radioactive waste facility in Australia has a long and fraught history. We don't have a national facility for the storage of this waste, which instead is held at more than 100 locations around Australia, many of which were not designed for long-term storage of waste. The majority of the radioactive waste produced in Australia is classed as low-level waste. We do produce some intermediate-level waste, for example, from the production of nuclear medicines. And the use of radioactive materials in these contexts is of critical importance to Australians. Managing this waste at a single site rather than at many sites across Australia has been an objective of governments of both persuasions, and the public policy rationale for this is clear. Despite this, we have been at an impasse for decades, dating back to the 1970s. Understandable community anxiety about the storage of radioactive waste has not been able to be overcome, resulting in the failure of all attempts to agree a site for a national facility. In an effort to break this impasse, in 2012, the Gillard Labor government enacted the National Radioactive Waste Management Act 2012. That act provided a transparent legislative process uh, for the selection of a site for a national radioactive waste facility, and it sought to build community confidence in order to overcome anxieties about the risks that a, that a national radioactive waste facility might pose to any community. It is unfortunate, then, that every step, at every step this process has been so bungled by the coalition. The deep flaws in this process have been the subject of significant debate here and work by Senate committees, and I don't intend to revisit all aspects of it, although Senator Patrick did go to some of those in his contribution. But a brief history demonstrates how we came to find ourselves here today debating this bill that is before the chamber. In September 2014, the Abbott government released a notice of intention to consider opening a nationwide volunteer process of landowners to nominate a national radioactive waste facility. Between 2nd of March and 5th of May 2015, 28 applications were received. And in November 2015, the then Minister for Resources, Mr Frydenberg, announced the six nominated areas that had been assessed as suitable for a further assessment and public consultation. Two of the three sites now listed in the government's proposed amendment were not contained in that process. But in November 2016, the subsequent Minister for Resources, Senator Canavan, announced a, re a revision to the radioactive waste management nomination of land guidelines. His revision set out a process allowing, allowing landholders to nominate their land as a potential site for the facility. And then, in March 2017, Minister Canavan announced the formal receipt of two new nominations near Kimber, Napandi and Lyndhurst, which he accepted to proceed to initial consultation. In June, Ms. Minister Canavan accepted the nominations of the Kimber sites and announced that the sites were to proceed to the next phase of assessment. And the consultation process undertaken by the government can best be characterised as shambolic.
It fomented division within communities, divided between support for the potential economic benefit of hosting a nuclear waste facility and opposition based on the reputational, environmental and cultural heritage risks. But rather than work with communities to inform debate and to reconcile differences, the approach adopted by the coalition, and in particular then Minister Canavan, exacerbated these tensions. As the Conservation Council of South Australia noted in a submission to the Senate Economic References Committee, confidence in the decision-making process has been eroded by the flawed and divisive consultation, lack of definition and geographic definition of the community and stakeholders. And this is no more evident than in the treatment of traditional owners through this process. Senator Canavan refused to allow the Bungalow people, the tra traditional owners, of the right to vote at all in the community ballots. The Bungalow challenged this decision in court but were unsuccessful. Despite this, Minister Canavan and now Minister Pitt rely on the Kimber community ballot result to justify their support for locating a facility at Napandi. Because the Bungalow people were denied the right to vote, members of the Bungalow Determination Aboriginal Corporation held their own ballot and it returned a no vote. Of course, the minister has refused to acknowledge the Bungalow community's ballot. The fact is, for years now, the minister has had the power to make a declaration under section 14 of the 2012 legislation to which I referred to select a site. And for years, the minister has refused to do so instead bowling up this bill to the parliament. A bill with this bill with which the government is seeking to cure their own stuff up by asking the parliament to do the government's job, by asking the parliament to make the very decision the minister is empowered to make and to remove the capacity for community to challenge that decision in court. So it is important to remember in this debate, this government could have made this decision at any time over the last four years, but it has refused to do so. When this bill was introduced to the parliament, the Bangala people approached me and I met with their representatives and I heard their concerns. I encouraged the government to engage with them. Yet it has not been until recent days that the urging of Labor and in particular the Shadow Minister for Resources, Ms King, that the minister has finally engaged. And when the amendment now circulated by the government was first published, the fact that it included a site on the traditional lands of the Adniamuntna people was news to those peoples. No consultation, no discussion about the meaning of its inclusion, no explanation about the government's intention. It was this side of the chamber again who reached out to the Adniamuntna people, not the government of the day. So Mr Ramsey and many others who keep publicly supporting this facility perhaps should have concentrated on talking to the community rather than telling me and other people to get out of the way. Talking to impacted communities, hearing them and working with them, it's the approach that should have been taken to this bill and the approach that I have sought to take. As I said, when this bill was first in introduced, I was contacted by the Bangala peoples and their representatives, and they made the very reasonable point that the bill as it was overrode their democratic and legal rights. And this, of course, is, is against a history of their exclusion in the decision-making process. Ours is, uh, Labor is a party committed to reconciliation and recognition, and we understand the importance of consultation with First Nations peoples and respecting their views. This matter, this bill and the associated matters was discussed at Labor's First Nations Caucus Committee and the position adopted by the caucus reflected the importance of preserving the legal rights of the bungalow in respect of any decision. Hence our prior position, which was to oppose site selection by legislation and oppose the removal of the capacity for judicial review. And it also informs our position today. We do welcome the government introducing amendments which abandon site selection by legislation and the removal of capacity for judicial review. I note that the government has minister has agreed to address additional concerns raised by the bungalow in a further revision to the explanatory memorandum. We have also consulted in the time allowed with the Adniamuntna people, peoples and we look forward to the government clarifying on Hansard its intentions in respect to the site at Wellabadina. And it is on the basis of the, that clarification that Adniamuntna representatives have accepted our support for the amended bill. I also want to take a moment to briefly respond to the contribution made earlier by Senator Hanson Young, who came in and ran a line without regard to the content of the bill or of the positions expressed by the traditional owners on the question actually before the Senate. 
Ultimately, the bill before us is not about whether a, a nuclear waste facility proceeds. The minister already has the power to that, make that decision, and he could do so right now. We have listened to traditional owners throughout this process, and we have worked with them in securing concessions from the government and in taking Labor's final position. And I encourage all senators to do the same. I want to acknowledge the significant amount of work by the Shadow Minister for Resources, Ms King, her predecessor, Mr O'Connor, and the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ms Burney. And I also want to thank the members of Labor's First Nations Caucus Committee. Our party is made so much richer by, for, for our commitment to reconciliation, a commitment that we have sought to demonstrate by our approach to this bill, to consult, to discuss and to work together to achieve an outcome. Labor supports the Uluru Statement. We support voice treaty truth. The need for a voice enshrined in our constitution has never been more clear to me. The whole process is a reminder of how much we have to go to achieve a more respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. We won't always be able to find agreement, but we must try. We must talk and we must listen, and we must seek to understand. And only then will we be able to continue on the path of reconciliation. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the National Radioactive Waste Management Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020 Second Reading Speech. One Nation will never support the removal of judicial review from legislation. This position means One Nation has and will continue to resist pressure from the government to legislate a site near Kimba in South Australia for the National Radioactive Waste Management. One Nation will always stand up for the freedoms past generations have passed on to us. In the next 12 months, there will be a general election to elect a new federal government. If Australians act like sheep, voting for the two major parties and their sidekicks who want to take away your judicial rights, you are going to get wolves in government. If the two, two big parties had their way, a radioactive nuclear waste facility would now be under construction on the Air Peninsula in the middle of prime cropping land in South Australia. Just 4 per cent of the land in South Australia is suitable for wheat, barley and canola, but this government wants to use some of this prime agricultural land to build a radioactive waste facility. Up until recently, Labor agreed to the removal of judicial review in relationship to site selection for a national radioactive waste storage facility. Now they champion judicial review? I ask, what grubby deal has Labor done with government to get this bill through the Senate? No wonder voters are leaving Labor and turning to One Nation. Today we are debating the National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020, whose purpose is to avoid the need for Minister Pitt to declare a site for a nuclear dump under Section 14.2 of the National Radioactive Waste Management Act 2012 and consequently to avoid judicial review in the courts. One Nation believes the government should be answerable to its citizens through the process of judicial review. It is this principle which underpins our strong stance on this matter. I made it clear to the government that One Nation supported a national radioactive waste facility in a suitable permanent site, but we would not support a bill which took away the rights to judicial review. The government now accepts it does not have the numbers to get the Senate to declare Napandee as the site for a national radioactive waste management facility. Now the government is amending its own bill. The effect of the amendment would be to continue providing community funding and negate the proposal for the Senate to make the site decision. One Nation will oppose the bill and the amendment. We will not take part in face-saving theatre. The government can put up a separate community funding bill once it declares a site and judicial review is complete. There is no doubt we need to store nuclear waste we produce, but the arguments put up by the government about hospital waste is a red herring. The people of Australia have been let down in this matter. Nearly $100 million has been wasted on buying of special interest groups when that money should have gone into rural and regional health and educational. 
The Australian public has just has been subject to a campaign of misinformation by the government, aided by poorly researched opinion pieces on the proposed legislation, like the one written by Khalib Bond in the Adelaide Advertiser on 12 December 2020. Khalib Bond accuses me of selling South Australia up the creek for refusing to pass the government's bill to legislate a site for a nuclear waste dump just outside of Kimba. My advice to all journalists is to do your own research rather than making up stories based on briefings from the government. If you must use the government as your source, then at least acknowledge the source. I am not responsible for the decision by the government to narrow its site selection in South Australia and to reject other sites which appear to have more going for them. The site at Leonora in Western Australia is below ground in an old mine of solid granite. This remote location has community support, including the native title holders, but this government refuses to investigate the Leonora site. A radioactive waste storage facility is a target for terrorists. In the event of a terrorist attack, the deadly waste stored in an above-ground facility at Kimba could easily become airborne and then carried to Adelaide and beyond with the prevailing westerly winds. The government has ticked every wrong box to arrive at its decision to impose a national dump site for radioactive waste on unwilling communities in South Australia. The three sites mentioned in the amended bill are all in South Australia. No one seriously believes that the government is considering any site other than Napandee near Kimba. They have already given this small community upwards of $6 million with the promise of more. Now there is no place on the map called Napandee in South Australia, but you can find the name Napandee on a farm sign. The site manager is living in the area and the government is considering tenders for engineering advice for the site at Napandee. The government knows it will face a challenge in the courts from the Bungala people who are the native title holders on the Eyre Peninsula. The Bungala people carry the hopes of the indigenous people of South Australia. Aboriginal people in South Australia and other Australians carry the legacy of the nuclear testing done in the 1950s and 1960s in South Australia. If the government wanted to give Aboriginal people a voice, then give them a voice on the site for a radioactive waste management facility. To date, the government has sought to silence Aboriginal people on this most important issue, but the day of reckoning will come in the courts. The government talks about reconciliation. In One Nation, we just do it. No one has seen a list of the radioactive waste materials to be stored in the National Radioactive Waste Facility, opening the real responsibility, the real possibility of mission creep over time, and there is no safety case. The minister says it will be safe. How would he know? Nothing is safe where humans are involved. The National Radioactive Waste Management Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill proposes to find a single location to store low-level radioactive waste produced in the production of nuclear medicines and other products and intermediate level waste, including reactor core components that have undergone reprocessing overseas. The level of radioactivity in each of these waste categories at the rate at which they decay determines the management, storage and disposal. In other words, you need to know what will be stored before decisions can be made about where and how to store. Low-level radioactive waste like paper, plastics and scrap, metal items which have been used in hospitals and research institutions are kept locally for six months and then disposed of locally, which means no storage problem here. Intermediate level radioactive waste needs to be stabilised before being moved and then packaged in steel drums and stored in purpose-built facilities which are located away from population centres. The frequency, flow and volume of surface and ground waters is critical to the siting of any nuclear waste storage facility particularly on the Air Peninsula, where all the population rely on ground water. The government has not released the groundwater studies, so where are they? 
Is the radioactive waste to be stored permanently underground? No. The legislation proposes a temporary above ground site at Napandi, near Kimber, with a permanent site to be found later. I'll tell you, when all the members of this parliament are dead. The proposed cost of this above ground radioactive waste dump site is estimated to cost about a third of a billion dollars, all of it to be wasted because it's a temporary solution. I am, a, I am annoyed. The hard decision, which is the permanent dump site, has been kicked like a can down the road instead of being picked up and dealt with. Is the movement of radioactive waste minimised for public safety by keeping the dump site close to the site of production? No. Large volumes of radioactive waste will be transported hundreds of kilometres by road into South Australia. Contrary to Section 9 of the South Australian Nuclear Waste Storage Facility Prohibition Act of 2000. Has the government resolved the conflict with Section 8 of the South Australian Nuclear Waste Storage Facility Prohibition Act 2000, which expressly forbids the construction of a nuclear waste storage facility? No. The federal government proposes a bill to ride over any state legislation regulating, hindering or preventing the establishment establishment of a national radioactive waste facility in South Australia. Where is the Marshall government in South Australia on this issue because its silence is deafening? The next state election in South Australia is the 19th of March 2022. Premier Marshall has said nothing and not repealed the South Australian Nuclear Waste Storage Facility Prohibition Act of 2000. I note the 2021-22 budget provides South Australia $3.4 billion in new commitments compared to $2 billion in Queensland or $377 million in Tasmania. Has the federal government bought the Marshall State Government? Well, I will let the voters in South Australia work that one out for themselves. Is the proposed dump site near Kimber a geologically stable area? No. The site at Napandi, near Kimber, is on a geological fault zone in the Great Artesian Basin. Has consultation with South Australia been adequate? No. The consultation process and the millions spent on bribing locals to support their plans is a stain on this government and the Department, and the department of Industry, Innovation and Science. I call on the government to invite the Auditor-General to audit the funds spent at Kimber and Hawker in the Flinders Ranges. While they are investigating the millions spent on bribing locals, they can investigate how taxpayer money was spent renovating a local hotel, which was then sold. Such a tragedy when 18 per cent of children live in households below the poverty line in rural and regional South Australia. One Nation will not support this legislation. Heads should roll in the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, who have a sorry record in this matter. We need to find a permanent solution to the storage of intermediate-level radioactive waste in Australia, but the process needs to be thoroughly done, and giving another $2 million to the small community of Kimber is not going to get there. The conduct of the government, and in particular National Party ministers, and that is Minister Pitt and the former Resource Minister Canavan, in this matter, is a national tragedy. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson. I call Senator Canavan. Well, uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, um, this is a, a, a tough decision uh, for our nation. Uh, it's been one that um, has been under consideration for many decades, indeed about 40 years. And before I go through some of that history of that 40 years, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank um, the, the many people uh, in Kimber uh, and Hawker and the Hawker region uh, who have been involved in this, this latest uh, consultation uh, process. It was a great privilege and honour of mine um, as the Minister for Resources to meet so many of these great people, some who were both for and against uh, the radioactive waste facility uh, in their region. But both of those regions are, are special parts of our nation. The 
Hawker region is close and proximate to the beautiful Flinders Ranges. Um, and, I, and I thank the hospitality that was shown to me uh, by the people of that region. Indeed, I, I, um, I, I brought, I paid for some of my children to come down onto Aboriginal country at the time to experience their culture um, um, and stayed near the Flinders Ranges with the Adnamutna people the, at, the, um, at the campsite they run. Uh, and it's a great community, great part of our nation. Uh, I hope they're doing well with all the domestic tourism that's going around at the moment. And I also love the town of Kimber, a beautiful town in rural South Australia, a lovely community, full of great people, again, people who support and are against and you can understand. I can always understood why people would not be uh, rushing out to support a radioactive waste facility in their town. Uh, uh, but it is a tough decision, as I said, that we, we have to make as a nation. But I do want to thank the mayor there, Dean Johnson, spent a lot of time with Dean. The landowners, uh, the Bulldogs, uh, Jeff Bulldog. Um, I forgot to thank from Hawker Tiger McKenzie, great fellow out there at Tiger uh, McKenzie, uh, the Hawker and Adam, uh, proud Adam Martin man who runs his own property with his people, um, and also Vince Coulthard, the, the, uh, the well was the CEO of the Adam Martin people at the time. I, I think he might still be, but I have um, not as close to as I once was. But but others there from Kimber as well, um, like Tony Scott. Um, and uh, it's just, just, it's just been, it was a great. Mari, I think, from the, the local hotel, he put me up in a beautiful room one night. Thank you, Mari. Um, uh, she runs a great pub there. It's got a fantastic pub at Kimber, if you're ever passing through. So I just want to thank them, because I know how hard it has been for those communities to be through such a lengthy process. They haven't been there the whole 40 years, but, but this latest process to shortlist sites and go through a grassroots process to find a facility for our nation has taken. Uh, many years. Unfortunately, it did get held up in the courts, which was the right of people to take court action. Um, and of course, it's taken a little while to get this uh, bill here uh, to this position. I, I do want to thank, in that regard, then the, the I believe, the, the cooperation of the, the Labor Party uh, here, uh, and also congratulate the uh, Minister for Resources, Keith Pitt, in, in bringing this forward. Because as I said, it's a very tough issue. If it was easy. Would have been solved, solved at some point in that last 40 years. Um, I, I want to recognise that some of the previous ministers that I know have been involved in this process and put a lot of effort into it. Um, many from the Labor side of politics, like Senator Kim Carr and uh, former members Martin Ferguson and Gary Gray. I know they're both, all, all of them, are very passionate about this issue, and thank them for their long commitment and involvement. On our, on our own side, also Ian McFarlane and Josh Frydenberg as well. Uh, all played a role in getting to this stage. As I said, it is a, it is a tough decision, but um, it is one that we must make at some point. Uh, we should be proud of the fact that we produce some of the best nuclear medicines in the world. Uh, we uh, have a world-class nuclear medicine facility at Lucas Heights, just 30 kilometres uh, from the middle of Sydney. Uh, it is respected around the world. It puts us in the upper echelons of nuclear research and technology around the world, and in terms of nuclear regulation as well, because it is a reactor. There is a nuclear reactor 30 kilometres from the middle of Sydney. Now, it doesn't produce electricity, and it's a relatively small a reactor, from memory about 30 megawatts, only small reactor, but it produces life-saving medicines uh, that one in two Australians will need sometime in their lifetime. So here of us in this chamber, at least for 76 senators, and you add on a few of our dedicated staff, maybe get to 100 odd people sometimes in this chamber, 50 of those in this room will sometime in their lives need nuclear medicines, most of them which in this country would have been produced at Lucas Heights. We should take pride in that. We should take pride in that. I'm sure all of us who ourselves in that situation, have loved ones in that situation, would want to have access uh, to such medicines. But we also then, if we want to have access to the good things, we have to uh, be adult about this and face up to the tough things that are produced as part of that process. So as part of that process of producing those nuclear medicines, there is nuclear waste. There is nuclear waste produced both in the, the, uh, the, the nuclear reactor reaction process itself, in the nuclear rods, and there is nuclear waste associated with the management of the the nuclear medicines and distribution and application of those medicines too, and things like medical gowns and, and equipment. At this stage, right now, as I said, we've been searching for a place for 
around 40 years, I asked someone in the department once, when did we start doing this? And they mentioned that, well, they asked someone once that they thought was still around. It was around at that time and it was in the Fraser administration. We, we started looking at this that long ago. And we still haven't found a solution to this tough question as a nation. Because right now what's happening is that nuclear waste that's generated, that, that waste that's generated for this necessary life-saving process, is almost all stored uh, at Lucas Heights itself, um, 30 kilometres from the middle of Sydney. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's perfectly safe there. It has been managed safe uh, for decades. But the site itself is small, and we are running out of room. Uh, at Lucas Heights to store it all, uh, hence the need to find a long-term place to store low-level and, and potentially mid-level waste uh, for our nation. Now, I heard Senator Hanson say that, that somehow the consultation here had been inadequate. And, uh, I'm not here to defend everything the government did. Others will, will make their judgments about this, but there perhaps has not been a more extensive consultation process. Whether it's effective or not, I'll let others judge. But it has been, uh, 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 it has been as extensive as you can get in terms of talking to people, uh, trying to find a grassroots solution. At the start of this, before my time as Minister at the start, there were applications made from different places around Australia. We were called for applications. The government didn't go along and say, you, 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 we're going to look at you. We asked people to, to nominate their own land. A process then went through to look at well, was there initial support, and then when uh, uh, that Haw the, the towns of Hawker or the region of Hawker, uh, Corn as well was consulted as part of Hawker, but Hawker and Corn, and the Kimber areas, Kimber region, Kimber council area was was selected. Uh, a proper and intensive vote were happened, where everybody in that area got a vote um, according to the local government roles. They got a vote. Uh, uh, and it was a democratic process. We went through an intensive information campaign to provide people with the information they needed to make an informed decision. Uh, I believe I travelled to Kimber and Hawker, I think, three times myself as minister as part of that process to answer people's questions and concerns um, and to provide the experts there to help people make an informed decision about this. Um, uh, uh, there was um, a lot of feedback and a lot of uh, views on both sides. And, uh, and I want to stress here, as I said at the start, that I recognise and accept all different views on this matter. Uh, I always understood why people would have a certain view, and we were never going to have. There is not going to be a place in this country that exists uh, where we would get 100 per cent or 90 or 80 per cent support for a facility of this kind. That, that would not happen. And I think some of those that are holding out here to perhaps seek that maybe there's such a nirvana or utopia either really don't want to find a solution to this because they, for some reason, oppose the nuclear industry, even though I'm sure they'd like to use nuclear medicines, or, or uh, they are seeking to use the division in the community that is understandable uh, for their own political purposes. Um, what I was humbled by, though, was uh, hearing all of that, uh, those views. It was tough for those communities. It took a lot of time for them. Uh, I put aside a, almost a full week, I think, early last year to read through the hundreds of submissions we received along with, alongside the vote. We called for submissions and I sat down and read each of the submissions, each of the bespoke in, in, submissions individually. And there was, of course, some, uh, some, some emails that were part of a, a campaign, campaign-based letters or emails. I read, read examples of each of those. Um, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was an eye-opening um, experience to read all of that individual feedback. And as I said, there were people concerned, as Senator Hanson said earlier, about the hydrology, uh, the geology, the safety of, of of the materials. And I completely recognise that we went through a very extensive design uh, process around stormwater hydrology issues, geological testing. I I can say I'm confident that. This would be uh, would be a safe facility, based on world best standards. Uh, uh, that it would have to go through the world class regulatory process that we have here in this country that already does regulate Lucas Heights. Uh, I also remember taking away um, the particularly struck me were the letters from young people in in these regions in, in Kimber and, and Hawker. 
and especially those young people who, who, who saw this as an opportunity for them. Because these towns are only small, only a few hundred people in either location, and they are vibrant communities centred around agriculture primarily. Uh, but outside that of industry, there's not an enormous amount of job opportunities, and I know what that feels like coming from a regional town, albeit a, a larger regional town of Yapoon, but so many of our young people have to move away uh, from their home uh, just to find work, because there's not the diversity of work opportunities in a, in a regional town as there would be, as always are in a big city. Now, that's always going to be the case. We always face that, that handicap. But where there can be an opportunity to grow new skills, a new industry, uh, that is, that is, that is a, quite attractive to people in these circumstances. Because some people want to stay. They want to stay in their home community. They don't want to move away. But they also need to have a job and need to be able to pay the bills. Uh, and, and this facility would make a difference for some. It's not going to be a panacea, not going to help everybody, but for some. It would help give them an opportunity that doesn't currently exist in these towns. And most importantly of it all, it would help connect these small country towns, great places, but small places, it would help connect them with a world-class nuclear industry that we have here in this country. Now, there are, there are towns of Kimber size and Hawker size right around the country, um, but very few of them, none of them, I would say, would be able to have a direct connection to a world-class scientific establishment that is Lucas Height, the Lucas Heights uh, nuclear facility. It is a world-class facility. Uh, and I, I think what did seem to convince some people, if I could posit this, is that when, when people travel, some people, we, we offered everybody, or all the leaders of community consultation groups we'd established, we'd offered them to travel to, to Lucas Heights to see the, the waste that's currently stored. And, and we offered the opponents of the, um, of the facility that, that access. And a lot of people who went there were struck by, whoa, this is a, this is a serious scientific establishment. And uh, if, if, if my small town, we're not going to get, <laughs> we're not going to, the small town of a few hundred people is not going to get a nuclear reactor or a, or, a, or a medical facility. But if we had this waste facility, then our kids will get school trips, as we, we're going to do, make sure they're connected school trips to Lucas Heights. Some kid from Kimber might get interested in nuclear medicine and go on to a, a stellar career through that, or they might come back and help manage this waste where there would have been, I think at the time the projections were about 15 to 20 skilled positions at this facility, positions that would have taken training, would have helped people. And uh, that to me uh, was probably a, a, a reason behind the fact that at Kimber more than 60 per cent of people supported the waste facility. Now I recognise there were opponents, as I've said, and I particularly recognise the positions of the Bungala people. Uh, who I did meet with and, and wanted to meet more. Um, but uh, we also cannot ignore uh, those 60 odd percent of people in Kimber who do want an opportunity for their children. We need to find a way of balancing these views and positions and making these tough decisions as a nation. I hope through this process we do not hear walk away from this tough decision. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of other sites proposed around the country that have fallen through at the last minute and kick this can down the road for future generations of Australians to deal with. We all benefit from the nuclear medicines today. We should not be kicking the responsibility of managing this waste down to future Australians. We should be able to take charge of this issue, find a solution, work with the communities involved and make this as much as possible a win-win for our nation. Thank you, Senator Canavan. I call Senator Abetz. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020 is worthy of the Senate support. Can I commend Senator Canavan on an excellent speech outlining all the issues? The issue of a waste management facility and its placement is something that the community does need to be consulted about, and it's appropriate that we in this place talk about it and talk about the consequences. But one thing that the community has never been consulted about are the 100 facilities dotted around our country today where radioactive waste is actually stored as we speak. 
under hospitals, in industrial sites, etc. Doesn't it make good sense to try to bring all that together in one national facility to ensure that it is all properly looked after, cared for and protected in a manner that can ensure community confidence in its storage. Now, regrettably, some people seek to make political mileage out of the fact that there is understandable concern whenever the term nuclear is mentioned. But the simple fact is that 50 per cent of us will one day be the beneficiary of some form of nuclear medicine. So for those that want to ensure that Australia has no nuclear waste to deal with, be upfront, tell your fellow Australians that the cancer sufferers and others should not be the beneficiaries of nuclear medicine. And that is always dismissed from the debate. But if you want nuclear, life-saving medicine, there are consequences. There will be nuclear waste. And that is why there, is, there are these storage facilities in hospitals dotted all around our nation. Is that a good thing? Would it be better for it all to be stored in the one facility? Of course it would be. Common sense dictates that that ought be the case. And I think most Australians looking at this situation would commend the government for taking a tough decision. For, I think, a couple of decades now, this issue has been kicked around on the political agenda. People have spoken of what about here, what about there. We are finally now focusing on possibilities for a facility with a $20 million community fund to assist in all this. And I, I simply say to colleagues in this chamber that politics really does have to be set aside and the well-being of the nation has to be considered. And the question is very simple. Tell your constituents 50 per cent of whom will be the beneficiaries of nuclear medicine, that you are against nuclear medicine. I'm sure they won't do that. And if you don't have the intestinal fortitude and the intellectual coherence to tell your constituents that, then you must accept that the nation has to deal with nuclear waste. The next question then is, how best to deal with it? Should it be scattered around the nation in 44-gallon drums under hospitals and uh, other places, or should it all be gathered together and held in one purpose-built facility? We all know the answer to that, and so that is why I would encourage the Senate to consider this legislation in that light get on with the task of ensuring that we can deliver world-class facilities that will ensure the good and proper storage of these waste materials, I think 85 per cent of which, Madam Acting Deputy President, actually comes from the medical sector. I commend the bill. Thank you, Senator Betts. Minister. Um, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, well, as Senator Abetz has, has just uh, articulately outlined, um, every Australian in their lifetime is likely to rely on nuclear medicine to identify and treat life-threatening cancers and other conditions. Australia has a responsibility to safely and securely manage our radioactive waste, which is the byproduct of nuclear medicine manufacturing and other nuclear research in the national interest. This bill reflects over 40 years of effort by successive governments and successive ministers, such as Senator Carr on the other side and Senator Canavan, who's just made a contribution, and now uh, the, the member for Hinkler on the other place, Mr Pitt, to progress the facility and guarantee the production of nuclear medicine in this country. And 
I would like to thank the communities around Lyndhurst, Napandi and Wallabadina for engaging in this lengthy process in good faith. I would also like to thank the member for Grey, Rowan Ramsey, for his ongoing commitment to this project and acknowledge the South Australian government's support for this important infrastructure, which is in the national interest. Government has invited parliamentary oversight of this bill. Minister Pitt referred the bill to the Economics Legislation Committee to ensure stakeholders have the opportunity to have their say about the delivery of this vital piece of national infrastructure. The committee report recommended that the bill be passed without amendment. Consistent with other recommendations made by the committee, the Australian Radioactive Waste Agency continues to reach out to the Bangala people to seek their support to engage in an independent mediator. The government remains committed to work with the Bangala people to appropriately manage Aboriginal cultural heritage and support Aboriginal economic development in the region. Senator Patrick's proposed amendments are unsuitable. It would not be sensible to permanently site a facility in a missile testing range. The government accepts the advice of defence that a radioactive waste facility is not compatible with those operations. Additionally, these amendments would impose a site on a community that has not been subject to thorough community consultation nor extensive technical assessments. <clears throat> in the course of the inquiry and legislative debate, it is clear that stakeholders are uncomfortable about the site selection decision being made by uh, may, being, ma, being, <coughs> being one made by the parliament. The government has heard these concerns and consulted with the opposition and the Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation on these amendments that will reinstate judicial review to the site decision. The amendments recognise that the three shortlisted sites uh, and reinstate the declaration process, a process whereby the minister must have regard to all the relevant information and make an informed decision to declare a suitable site for the facility. This is no longer site-specific legislation. The level of community support will weigh into the minister's consideration when determining where to declare a site for a facility. Listing the Wallabadina station site recognises the shortlisting stage of the site selection process only. It is not, and I reinforce it is not, intended to signal a change in the government's assessment of that site. The community that lives and works in the vicinity of Wallabadina station have made it clear that they do not broadly support the facility being located there. The government's position is clear. The facility will not be imposed on an unwilling local community. In passing this bill, the Senate has the opportunity to establish important mechanisms to support the host community and ensure they can realise the benefits that this new industry will bring. The Senate also has the opportunity to recognise the bipartisan support for a purpose-built facility which will permanently dispose of Australia's domestic low-level waste and temporarily store our intermediate waste. In concluding, can I please also thank all of the senators who have made a contribution to this particular bill, whether it be through the committee process, the very extensive committee process, the bipartisan support that this received in the recommendations from that committee report, and for the contributions that have been made by senators in this place as we have started to debate this bill tonight. I thank them very much for their contribution on this debate and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you very much, um, Minister Rustin. Minister. Um, and Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, could I please table two supplementary explanatory memoranda relating to the government's amendments to be moved to this bill? Are you seeking leave to do so, Senator? Uh, I don't Rustin? think I have to seek no, leave. You just have to table yes, them. Thank yes, you very much. That's no a... Thank you.
The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Please ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Those eyes move to the right of the chair and the nose to the left. I appoint a Senator McGrath for the eyes and Senator Seward for the nose.
There being 34 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, would honourable senators um, please leave the chamber if they're not staying for the next for the next part of the debate? I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Radioactive Waste Management Act 2012, and for related purposes. Thank you. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister? Um, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, um, can I please move um, amendments 1 to 10 on sheet SV110 by leave together? Is leave granted? <coughs> leave is granted. Minister? I move the amendments. Um, and uh, in doing uh, so, um, the government is absolutely committed uh, to the urgent establishment of the National Radioactive Waste Management Facility to secure Australia's nuclear medicine manufacturing capability. Um, the government has invited parliamentary oversight of this bill and is open to further scrutiny of the site selection decision. The specifications of a site in legislation was never intended to avoid scrutiny of the site selection decision. The government has heard the concerns that have been raised. Um, particularly about those who are uncomfortable about the site selection decision being made by the parliament and has worked closely with the opposition in developing and consulting on these amendments. And so I'm moving amendments that reinstate the existing site declaration process and which provide legislative recognition to the shortlisted sites. Focusing the site declaration decision on the three shortlisted sites is consistent with community expectations as the existing site selection process. Together with the legislative amendments establishing the community fund, these amendments would ensure a national radioactive waste facility can be progressed in the national interest and the community that hosts it will be well supported. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Deputy President, I've just got a couple of questions for the Minister, if I could. Uh, in relation to these amendments, which seem um, like a nice uh, face-saving exercise uh, for the government on something that uh, they weren't, they were unable uh, to get through the parliament until now. I'd just like to, could I ask why the table that lists the three sites is included? Uh, I'm, uh, it would be good to know why, because if this is not prescriptive. Um, then what's the purpose of the, the table that includes the three shortlisted sites, as opposed to uh, a nomination process uh, by the minister that is then, of course, uh, available for judicial review? Minister? I was just saying thank you to you. Minister, um, you have the call. Um, so um, my understanding is that um, the, the purpose of the, the shortlisting and, and um, uh, identifying of the, the shortlisting of these three particular sites um, and the fact that it's recognised in legislation um, draws a line between the three shortlisted sites, which have been subject to the extensive consultation, analysis and community surveys uh, and other historical nominations. And so, Whilst the minister is not bound to declare any of the three sites, uh, it's important to recognise that the sites that have been nominated by landowners in good faith uh, and have been shortlisted for further assessment. So, uh, as you rightly point out, the amendments will recognise the three shortlisted sites of Lyndhurst, Napandi, and Wallapadina Station. <coughs> Senator Hanson Young. Could I just ask the minister to clarify? So, if uh, under these amendments uh, the minister is not bound to declare one of these three sites, is it uh, correct that the minister could declare? A fourth site, or a fifth site, or a sixth site. 
Minister. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, the answer to your question, Senator Hanson Young, is yes, but the, the, if there was to be an additional site that was nominated, it would have to go through the full and further process of consultation, assessment, analysis before it was able to be listed. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the minister answering these questions. I think it's important for people to understand uh, why these amendments have been drafted the way they are. Um, so, if the minister is not bound to declare any of these three sites, could indeed go through another consultation period to declare a fourth or a fifth site. Um, I just want uh, what, what would what would be the process uh, that the minister will um, uh, take in declaring which of these three sites? Oh, what will the process? be for declaring any of these three sites? Uh, and what would the process, uh, if indeed the minister says, well, no, we don't want any of these three sites, we'll go back to the drawing board? Minister. Much. Um, the, the process that has to be followed is as is outlined in the Act, so the same process that was followed in relation to these three sites would have to be followed by um, any other site that was put forward, but it would be bound by the requirements of the Act. Senator Hanson Young. Um, and can I clarify from the minister in your second reading contribution, uh, you uh, said that uh, the site in the Flinders Ranges is not um, uh, a site that the government wishes to pursue. Um, are you able tonight to rule out a nuclear waste dump in the Flinders Ranges? Minister. Uh, um, thank you. Um, well, the minister obviously has not made a decision um, in relation to the, the site uh, that he is uh, that he, he may um, choose. However, um, it is consistent with government policy um, that the site would require the support of the community um, for, in order for it to go forward. So, um, you know, I think I've been clear around the fact that it, the Deeming of the Wallabadina station site does not change the government's position in relation to that site. Senator Hanson Young. Can we just be crystal clear about this? Because in, in, previously the minister has ruled out a nuclear waste dump in the Flinders Ranges. Surely we can get that commitment again tonight. And if not, that should be ringing alarm bells. Minister. Um, look, thank you. Senator, as, as you would be aware, um, in relation to the, the amendments that are being put forward, um, they still leave the determination in relation to the site. Um, it is a process that still, and, and it's a decision and determination that still remains with the minister. But I think I was very clear um, that, and in my second reading speech, um, that it is the listing or the deeming of the Wallapazina station site. Um, is nothing more than recognising that it was part of the shortlisting stage of the process that has already been undertaken. Um, and the community that lives and works in the area of Wallapadina Station have made it very, very clear that they do not support the facility being located there. So therefore, um, on that basis, um, the Act um, speaks for itself in terms of the process that must be accepted in order for uh, the, the, the the, um, the site to go forward. The government could not be clearer. It will not force uh, the facility on a uh, or impose the facility on an unwilling local community. Senator Hanson Young. I'm struggling to understand why the minister can't just rule out Flinders Ranges being used as a nuclear waste dump site. I, 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 I thought that is the position that you're taking, and now I'm getting weasel words. So I just want to be—I don't understand why you can't just say, "No, we're not intending. We will not be putting a nuclear waste dump in the Flinders Ranges." Full stop. End of story. Give us that commitment, Minister. Look, Senator, um, you quite clearly understand the process here—the legal process that is being undertaken by these amendments. I have made it very clear that the government is not going to enforce a facility on an unwilling community, and that is absolutely remains the government's position. Um, however, 
I am not in a position to be the person who makes the determination in relation to the site. This legislation does not give me that power. It re power remains with the Minister for Resources, who has that decision-making power. However, however Senator, um, I think I have been very, very clear um, in, in saying that the government does not intend to enforce this facility on a community that does not want it. Senator Patrick. Can I just, uh, just following on from that, um, I just want to know the process the government went through in uh, publishing these amendments, because you could appreciate that the people in uh, in Hawker uh, had been through a process. It was uh, quite divisive. Uh, it divided the community. Uh, just in in re reintroducing this into legislation, I'm just wondering what consultation you had with the community to set their minds at ease that this was not a reselection or really reintroducing uh, Walla Bedina as, the, as, the, as a possible site. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, as, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator Patrick, I understand that, that, um, that the department has, has spoken to the community to reassure them that there is no intention of the government um, to, uh, to reopen um, the, the Walla Bedina site because they have already clearly stated that um, that they don't want the facility uh, in that location um, and also um, I think I've been clear and, and statements by both myself in this place and, uh, and the minister in the other place have been very clear that this decision in these amendments does not reflect a decision to um, to change our, our position on that particular site Senator Patrick so noting the list is, in, in some sense, not really uh, a list that is, uh, <laughs> for, for, for which the site is going to be selected. Um, I, I did listen to your second reader. Um, why is it that you wouldn't then permit Woomera to be included on a list, noting that uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an option and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the list has little meaning? Minister. Thank you very much. Um, well, Senator Patrick, in order for another site to be to be deemed, it would have to go through uh, the same process. Uh, and as I also mentioned in uh, in my second reading summing up speech, um, it, it is very much um, the view uh, of the uh, of the military that um, you know mixing a radioactive waste uh, repository and a missile testing range don't really go very well together. Senator Patrick. I'm, I'm, um, I wonder if you're aware of the study commissioned by the Howard government in 2002 that ex looked extensively at the, at the Woomera site, uh, looking at its suitability. So uh, I have the document here, if you like. It's about 400 pages. It's a very, very comprehensive uh, uh, study, into, and, and it finds in favour of putting a facility at, uh, at Woomera. Uh, I wonder. Again, but perhaps, uh, perhaps you weren't aware of the study, um, but to whether or not that would uh, change your view, I'm happy to walk over and, and give it to you. I'm happy to table it, uh, whatever, whatever is necessary. Uh, it's a public document uh, to perhaps convince you that a lot of due diligence has been done on the Woomera site. Minister. Thank you. Well, it probably will come as no surprise to you, Senator Patrick, that I actually haven't read the document to which you refer, but I'm sure that the minister and preceding ministers have. Um, my understanding that, um, as you would be aware, Woomera has not been nominated as, uh, or shortlisted um, uh, as a site um, under the current process that is, that is underway, and nor have the communities surrounding it been consulted in relation to this. Um, it's also further been advised that in 2017, the department conducted a, a risk assessment and found uh, the WPA unsuitable um, to be considered for the site for the facility. Um, so uh, that was the most recent assessment um, uh, that has been undertaken. Uh, at which point it was determined that this, that, that particular site was uh, not preferred for consideration. Senator Patrick. Right, can you just confirm that the department you're talking to, talking about, is the Department of Industry or is it the Department of Defence? Minister. Uh, Senator, I understand that it's the Department of Industry, but um, I will make sure that I um, get clarification to make sure that I haven't misled you in my answer, but I understand it is industry. Senator Patrick. 
Yes, well, I actually think it might. Uh, I think industry did make inquiries to the Department of Defence, and in, in a two or three-page submission, they they sought to rule that out. You'll be aware that uh, the committee that examined this piece of legislation took a trip to Woomera and had a look at the site. Um, uh, I, I note in your second reading speech that you said that um, that Woomera wasn't s suitable. It's a test range. Just to inform you, uh, Minister, you may already know this, but Woomera is 13 per cent of the area of South Australia. It is twice the size of Tasmania, and uh, it's beyond comprehension that uh, anyone would accept from the Department of Defence uh, the idea that you can't fit a facility there. Um, it is a, a massive area. If you look to the north-eastern corner of the Woomera prohibited area, you'll find there's a uh, a uranium mine at Roxby Downs. Within, uh, uh, it's something like 20 or 30 kilometres you would be inside the, the WPA. And there's a community that clearly don't have a, any particular issue with uh, radioactive material, noting that uh, uh, their livelihoods uh, depend on, on, um, on that. And of course, uh, you, I'm sure you've been up there, as, as I have, up to, uh, up to Roxby Olympic Dam. Um, uh, I also heard during your second reader, you know, that the idea that we're going to mix a a, uh, a radioactive waste site with a missile firing range. Of course, uh, this is this has all been dealt with by the committee. That the Department of Defence uh, advises that whenever they conduct a missile firing, they have a safety template. So they lay out the area f uh, for which uh, there is a danger that. Uh, a missile that goes rogue or an aerial uh, vehicle, a drone that goes rogue, uh, will actually uh, most likely land in uh, that uh, particular safety template. And the Department of Defence provided uh, the committee with a, an overlay, a map of all of the uh, safety uh, templates that have been used uh, since 2014. And there are massive areas of the Woomera prohibited area where, in actual fact, it doesn't overlap with any test sites. It's, a, it's an area that is remote. It's not on prime agricultural land. There is a study here, quite a thick study, that shows um, that uh, it's quite feasible, done all of the geological work, done all of the safety work. Um, and um, uh, you know, just the idea that, that you can't find a location there. This is defence, defending defence land like no other. This is the department uh, uh, who, you know, came to the government in 2009 and said, "Well, let's have a $12 billion future submarine project," that then got estimated up to, to you know, $50 billion and then grew to, to $89 billion, and now we have to pay an extra $10 billion to extend the life of Collins in order to get it to. Uh, uh, the point where the Collins class can last out until the future submarines arrive sometime after 2035. I mean, this, is the de this is the same department you talk about. They're clearly uh, incompetent in, 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 in relation to these sorts of projects. Now, any person could reasonably go up to Woomera, have a look at the, 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 the sites, have a look around the airfield up there. You'll see that there are, uh, there are ammunition areas. There are uh, fuel storage areas, all of which uh, are manageable from a, uh, an aircraft perspective, well away from the range. Uh, we've got the road to Roxby Downs that's, uh, that's a stone throw from the airfield. It's never been shut under the, uh, under the various rules. There's lots and lots of space up there. Uh, you've got a, a list of uh, three sites that appear to be face-saving sites, why, not, why wouldn't you simply accept that there's a, uh, uh, the possibility that Woomera is not a bad uh, facility? Remember at the start of this, uh, we, we ended up with the three sites that you have named in your uh, table uh, in the amendments by asking people if they'd want to have their land as a radioactive waste management site, not by looking and saying what's the best place to put it, just simply, who who wants to have one? Which land owner wants to sell their land at four times the the market rate? 
uh, to have a facility so that they can move on and go somewhere else uh, and uh, leave behind a, a facility. And, uh, um, you know, I, I've got an amendment on the on the uh, uh, on the um, uh, on the sheet, and uh, uh, that that amendment includes uh, consultation with Indigenous uh, parties and indeed the community. It just is beggar's belief that the government doesn't want to add on uh, doesn't want to add on a another potential site where there could well be uh, broad community support, where there has been in the past proper studies done that say this can go there. Um, it, it's, a, it's a government that seems to be scared of the Department of Defence and takes a two or three page submission um, to, uh, rule out, to rule out something, afraid of the brass, afraid of the shiny uniforms and uh, uh, basically take on face value what they've said, yet don't, uh, don't listen to the, the community in Kimber and what their concerns are. That doesn't seem to matter. So um, I, 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 I'm just left flabbergasted as to uh, why, um, why it wouldn't be considered, particularly in circumstances where there are two radioactive waste sites up in um, uh, up in the, the Woomera prohibited area. Hangar 5 has 10,000 syro drums sitting there that will have to be moved at cost. Cooley Milka has, uh, has uh, you know, defence waste which includes intermediate level waste. That's somehow managed to survive uh, for 20 years, uh, longer actually, uh, without causing interruption to the operations up in the Woomera prohibited area. So I, I wonder, Minister, how do, you, how do you reconcile that, the fact that we've had uh, radioactive waste um, up there since, uh, since the 1990s, and yet Defence uh, have been able to operate perfectly well with the two facilities that we have up there? Uh, Minister, I wonder if you can reconcile that. Minister. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy. Acting Deputy President. Um, well, there are a number of responses to that long contribution from Senator Patrick. Um, you know, we are going to have to agree to, to differ in our opinions in relation to the advice that's been received by Defence. Um, you clearly have your own point of view as a, you know, um, in relation to the, the advice um, and the, the efficacy of the advice that we have received from Defence. Um, you know, we, uh, we obviously take very seriously the advice that we receive from our defence forces. Uh, it's also um, worth noting that we have for some time—I mean, this is a process that's been going on for 40 years now, as you would well be aware, um, Senator Patrick—and we did undertake previous processes to, to seek site identification on the basis of technical specifications, but at no time were we able to secure um, community support. Uh, for the sites, uh, for, for any sites based on solely on that basis, uh, I'd also point out that um, you made the comment about you know nobody's listening to the Kimber community. Well, I acknowledge in the gallery, and he's been here most of the day, uh, the member for Grey, who uh, lives in the Kimber community and has been um, a very, very uh, first-hand, hands-on. Um, involvement in the uh, consultation process that has been undertaken in his community in relation to this particular facility. Uh, and I think um, he would probably have been aghast to think that you would come in here and say that the Kimber community hasn't been consulted with, the Kimber community hasn't been listened to, because I think he would absolutely think that that was not the case. The other thing is. Um, the, uh, in relation to Woomera, it has not been nominated to date. It has had no technical assessment and has had no community consultation. So simply to suggest that we go and, and tack on to um, a process that is already well underway in terms of the full process that has been undertaken in relation to the act that governs um, this particular activity uh, is, is, is something that you've obviously overlooked. But, Senator Patrick, we're just going to have to agree to uh, disagree in relation to um, the validity of the advice that's been received uh, by the government from defence. <clears throat> Senator Patrick. Okay, in the uh, lead up to the uh, transporting of uh, radioactive waste to uh, uh, Woomera uh, by uh, waste that came from CSIRO, 
but also that came from St Mary's. Um, there's a report that uh, I got under FOI that uh, got, dates back to 2090, uh, sorry, uh, 1995. It's called a review of arrangements for the recent transportation of radioactive waste. It describes some of the material that is in the Cooley Milker site. Uh, and I just want to understand uh, what the plans are in relation to that particular ma material, noting uh, the fact that it is uh, not low radioactive, low-level uh, low uh, waste. Uh, so I'll just read from the from the paragraph. Um, the, the waste includes obsolete medical radium sources, radium-based luminescent paint powders, obsolete radium-contaminated laboratory equipment, electronic valves luminescent watches, compass faces, night markers and spent sealed medical sources. The radionuclides which comprise the main part of this waste are cobalt 30, radium-226, American-241, uh, American uh, uh, strontium-90 and cesium-137. The waste also can, contains a very small amount of radionuclides, including a minute amount of plutonium-239. Now this material is intermediate level waste and I wonder uh, whether the government, as it's uh, dealing with uh, or it's, its intention, if, it, if, the, if it, a site was, was chosen in Kimber, whether the government's plans are to shift that particular waste into the facilities at Kimber, so uh, in effect making it almost immediately an intermediate level waste uh, facility. And if that is the case, what is the process by which this, uh, this material will be, uh, will be rendered safe? Minister. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, well, Senator Patrick, I'm advised that before um, waste is able to be transported or located um, at the particular facility that we're at the, the pr proposed new facility, it would actually have to um, achieve a waste acceptance standard, a pro waste acceptance criteria um, that would enable it to be eligible to be able to be um, safely stored at that site. Senator Patrick. Yes, yeah, so I'm just curious as to whether that particular material that I've identified, which is in the Cooley Milkle site, so maybe if we don't go to the specifics of the, uh, the, the, the different types, but just getting an understanding, it is, is it the intention of the government to transport that material eventually in some form to uh, the site that would be determined by the minister under the current act? Minister. Thank you, um, Senator Patrick. Well, I'm not in, uh, I can't answer your question specifically about the, the, the waste that is currently located at Cooley Milka, but what I can say is that there is a set of criteria for the storage of any waste that goes to this new facility that has to be met. Um, now, um, I'm happy to take on notice and come back to you in relation to what would need to happen to this, the, the waste that you're referring to if it, uh, if it was to be transported. But, um, you know, I, I am unaware um, of the, the specifics in relation to the particular repository of the waste that you're talking about, um, so I will have to come back to you. But as I said, there are predetermined standards um, that the waste has to meet before it is able to be um, stored at this facility, um, and I'm unaware of whether um, you know, the waste that you're referring to, the, the actual details, but I will come back to you on notice with uh, a direct answer as to whether that would require further treatment. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in some sense, the question is as much about uh, Woomera as it is about Kimber, because if the circumstances are that you can't store that particular type of waste, and as I said, there are small amounts of plutonium uh, that, are, that are stored there, uh, then in actual fact you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have a facility at uh, Kimber, presumably, uh, and then but you're still going to have a radioactive waste storage area in the very place that defence says it can't exist, that it doesn't, that it's not uh, um, uh, consistent with their with their operations. I wonder if uh, perhaps whether that question was ever asked of defence um, uh, to, to you know, test their assertions 
in, in, uh, in relation to the, you know, the claim that you simply can't put this waste there. So, uh, is it the intention of the government to close the uh, Cooley Milker site at Woomera, and in what time frame? Minister. Um, Senator, I, I, I mean, I've tried to answer the question as best I can uh, on the basis of the determining criteria for the use of the site uh, that we're currently establishing at the moment. Um, I do not have to hand the information in relation to uh, the, the specific um, area, the issue that you're talking to, which I've said I will take on notice and get the information to you, um, because I simply do not have that information with me. Senator Patrick. Look, I, I, you know, I don't mean to ambush you, Minister, but I have got an amendment on the table, uh, uh, in fact two, that, that look at Woomera as a site. So I don't think it's an unreasonable qu uh, uh, question to ask, noting that, again, in your second reading, you said it's not consistent. Uh, radioactive waste, uh, radioactive waste site is not consistent with the operations of Woomera. When in actual fact, we've had radioactive waste stored at Woomera since about uh, the, the mid 90s, and it, and uh, it may well be the, the the fact that it will continue to be stored there because the the waste at Cooley Milker is not suitable to be shifted, in which case the whole thing becomes a bit of a shambles. Um, Defence saying, we can't have it here, but uh, knowing full well that it's going to stay there. That's the, that's the burden of my question. Um, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable to, uh, to ask that question, noting I do have a couple of uh, 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 amendments on the table that look at Woomera uh, you know, that you're, you're knocking out for what appear to be quite shallow reasons. Um, you know, if, you've, you know, if you'd gone through the process uh, completely, and I know it's not you personally, Minister, but if, uh, if the department has gone through the process, if the minister has gone through the process uh, properly, when that, uh, when that uh, advice came back from defence, one would have thought that you might have uh, 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 challenged some of the advice, uh, and particularly to, to get an understanding of whether or not that waste uh, will in fact go to uh, uh, go to, to presumably Kimber. Maybe we can start with Hangar 5. Hangar 5 has 10,000 drums of low-level radioactive waste um, that, is, um, uh, that is stored uh, very close to the range head. And uh, uh, perhaps you can answer whether that material uh, noting it's actually in a pretty uh, perilous state, and I know Syrah are working to, to tidy that up, is it the intention of that waste to go from Hangar 5 at Woomera to the new facility? Minister. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, <coughs> Senator Patrick, I mean, you are asking a series of questions of it with some level of detail, and I, and I think I've already explained to you that the, the process that's currently being undertaken is the, uh, the proposal is for the establishment of a of a facility that will have site-specific design that will have a whole heap of information that is contained in that that will determine what is and isn't to be located at that site um, into the future. But um, the fact is that the, the site to which you are suggesting in your amendments should be deemed alongside of the, two, the three sites that are being proposed to be deemed by the amendments that I have just moved has not gone through the same process as the process of the three sites to be deemed are. And so what we are merely saying to you is you cannot just tack a site on that has not been through the process, the appropriate processes that are contained in the Act. And the reason that the three sites are um, that we are proposing to be deemed by this particular amendment is because they all three of them have been through that process. So um, you know, you're, you're talking about something that is quite well in advance of what we're proposing here. The sites have not been consulted on, so we do not know. You know we've never tested the, the, um, the community acceptance of, of those sites. As I said, Defence have suggested that it is unsuitable. I accept the fact that you disagree with that, um, but that the that is entirely your prerogative to do so, but the, the advice that we receive from defence um, is that the site is, is not appropriate. Um, and um, I, as I said, I'm more than happy to get some specific information in relation to the particular current repositories of, of waste that you're referring to, um, but that is not the point of what we're trying to do here by these amendments. The point of what we're trying to do here is to enable the um, determination, um, as has been highlighted through the consultation process that's undertaken, to allow the three sites that have already had the process undertaken for them um, to be deemed to give the minister the opportunity to select one of those sites um, or 
undertake a full another process should neither of, or, and none of those sites be the ones that the minister determines uh, to declare. But that is a matter for the minister. Senator Patrick. Yeah, thank you. You actually clarified things in the, in the last part of the question there, because I thought when, you, when Senator Hanson Young had asked about adding additional sites, you said that that is a possibility. There could be other sites other than those no nominated on the table, which means they would have to go through a process. Uh, so, in, in, in actual fact, you've presented the Senate with an option that says, "Look, here's three sites that have been through the process, but we're not going to limit it to that." Uh, I'm suggesting that the minister could nominate a site in the WPA, that, uh, and we know that that has gone through an extensive process. It might not have been the exact same process, but how is that different to perhaps some uh, some other some other site that could be uh, that could be included in the minister's additional uh, research if he decides not to uh, to, to have it at, uh, uh, at uh, Nepandi? Minister. Senator, as we've, we've, we've discussed um, ad nauseum over the last um, half an hour, um, the advice of defence is that the site is not suitable. Um, in, and you disagree with that, and that's entirely your prerogative to do so. But the advice that has been received by government from defence, and also I understand from the Department of Industry, is that the site is not suitable. It has, and it, equally, it has not gone through the process. Now we can sit here and argue all night about your opinion that it is suitable. But the advice that I have contained in my papers is that it is not suitable, um, and that is the reason why it has not been listed in the uh, shortlisting process. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Um, I just thought I might put on record the opposition's position on these amendments. Uh, the government is proposing amendments that firstly reinstate the ministerial site declaration process in the current Act as proposed by the opposition and as originally contemplated in the 2012 legislation. Secondly, deem certain land taken to have been nominated and approved under the Act being the three shortlisted sites of Lyndhurst, Nepandi and Wallabadina. And thirdly, allow for judicial review of the ministerial site declaration aspect of the process. The amendments include compensation provisions to ensure beyond reasonable doubt, sorry, to ensure beyond doubt uh, that existing rights to compensation are maintained. The current government amendments, if passed, will mean the minister may, will make a site declaration regarding one of the three presently shortlisted sites which has been nominated and approved, or any other site which is subsequently shortlisted. In the event that Nepandi is selected, the traditional owners, the Bangala Determination Aboriginal uh, Corporation, will then have the ability to undertake a judicial review of the ministerial site declaration. The community fund of $31 million will remain as part of the legislation. Labor's primary concern with the original bill which compelled Parliament to make a site selection for the National Radioactive Waste Management Facility presented by this government was that it removed judicial review. This was also the primary concern of the Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation. Labor has been consistent on this throughout this debate. We wouldn't pa support passage of this legislation unless the traditional owners were comfortable with it. Finally, the government has come to the table on this. Labor insisted over many months that BDAC be cons consulted in relation to the current government amendments before they go before the parliament. This happened last week. These amendments are a good compromise which maintains the ability for judicial review, at the same time acknowledging the work that has already been done in shortlisting the three sites to get the process moving ahead in the interests of all Australians. Concerns had been raised by BDAC regarding the deeming of the three sites and whether this would restrict the government in future from nominating other sites outside of the three listed. Labor clarified this with the government, who have since confirmed in the explanatory memorandum uh, to the uh, National Radio uh, sorry Labor clarified this with the government, who have since confirmed in the explanatory memorandum the following, and I quote, recognition of the three shortlisted sites confirms the sites as being nominated and approved under the Act, but does not limit the minister from approving new nominations. The minister may declare any approved nomination as a site and is not bound to declare one of the three shortlisted sites." Unquote. Given the above assurances in the explanatory memorandum, the Bungalow people are supportive of the amendments and are confident the revised bill provides the legal recourse they need to ensure their voices are heard. 
in the event that Nepandi is ultimately declared as the site. That is why Labor is supporting the amendments. And I know there's been a lot of things said, particularly by the Greens today, about the rights of traditional owners and Labor's position on this bill, uh, but we are actually following um, the request of the traditional owners in this respect. Uh, the anti Mathana native title holders, uh, are the, who are the traditional owners of the Flinders Ranges, have rightly expressed alarm at the inclusion of the Wallabadina site in their proposed amendments to the government's bill. Um, the ATLA, alongside the Wallabadina community, have vehemently rejected this proposal. I note that after the ballot was lost in 2019, the community ballot that is, Minister Canavan stated, while the community ballot was just one of many measures I am considering, I have said that achieving at least a majority level of support was a necessary condition to achieving broad community support. This ballot does not demonstrate a sufficient level of support and I will no longer consider this site an option for the facility. Listing the Wallabadina station site recognises the shortlisting stage of the site selection process only. It is not intended to signal a change in the government's assessment of that site. Labor wouldn't support legislation that forced this facility on a community that doesn't want it. Labor has consulted with the Andimanatha and their legal representatives, who are comfortable with Labor's support of the bill, providing the government confirms it will not impose the facility on Wallabadina. Labor expressed this to the government, who have assured Labor that this legislation does not do this. Labor therefore called on the government to assure the ATLA, ATLA of this fact on the record in the Senate, and we welcome this statement by the minister in her summing up speech. Um, so again, Labor's position is very clear, and we have, co have consulted with traditional owners uh, uh, for two different sites. Uh, we welcome the shift in the government's position, and that's why we have decided to support this legislation uh, and why we're supporting these amendments. Senator Patrick. Uh, from, from Woomera to uh, Leonora in Western Australia as another possible site. Um, uh, I, I see you shrugging your, your shoulders. I can see the two Western Australian senators sitting behind you very keen on this idea. Jobs for, jobs for WA. I, uh, Leonora was actually nominated under the process. It's gone through a part process. Uh, it's a, a, a site that was, uh, that, that's, uh, uh, was made um, uh, available uh, or at least discussed uh, well before the process started, actually. Um, I've been there. Minister, let me describe it to you. It's, it's just barren land. If there is a goanna on the site uh, at Leonora, it's in transit to some place better, I can tell you. That's the, that's the situation. Um, the, the, it's a hard rock site. Uh, it could be, uh, ha have a facility underground, could possibly take on... Uh, uh, intermediate level waste. Uh, uh, you know, the, it just strikes me as, as uh, unbelievable that that's not a place that uh, the government would also put on this, uh, on, the, on this list, or at least signal that it was willing to consider that as a site. Obviously, you'd need to consult with the locals. I went up there. I spoke to some elders who seemed, uh, seemed uh, favourable uh, towards uh, the, that, that, uh, that being a site. Now, that's not to say that uh, my consultation would be uh, accepted as rigorous, but uh, perhaps as an indication, uh, I wonder whether the government is looking at, beyond this, uh, the passage of this legislation, the Leonora site. Minister. Mm, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, um, given the way you've just uh, described their communities, I'm not sure you'll be welcome back there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, Senator, um, I'm advised that um, the communities of Leonora and Bawarana were um, both advised that, um, that their alternative site nominations would be considered if any of the shortlisted sites uh, were, uh, did not progress. Um, the communities to date have not had the opportunity of the in-depth analysis that the other three sites have had. Um, and, um, it is also the government's policy about trying to um, come up with a centrally co-located um, intermediate level waste storage um, with the low level uh, waste storage um, disposal facility. Um, so the, whilst um, those two um, particular communities <clears throat> uh, have been uh, considered in the mix, 
Um, my understanding is they have been advised that um, that they will be um, should that none of the sites that are currently have had the process undertaken are deemed to be suitable, <clears throat> then they would be uh, potentially considered. Senator Patrick. Yeah, well, thank you. That's uh, that's uh, at least some some good news. I just want to point out, Minister, just to clarify on the record. Uh, I don't uh, describe Leonora the township in that way. In order to get to the site that is proposed, you have to get into a four-wheel drive, head out to the Never Never, uh, and uh, that's where, again, at, uh, it, when, when you get there, it's, uh, it's uh, well away from town. Uh, if you get there and you see a Goanna, it is, it is transiting. Uh, that's, that's the case. Senator. Patrick, if there's no further response from the minister, do you wish to move your amendment? No, you don't. I've just been told that you do need to move your amendment, but I'll, then we can go and put the government. So, Senator Patrick. Yeah, I apologise. Um, yes. Yeah, so, in that case, uh, um, I uh, seek uh, leave to move uh, uh, an amendment to the government's amendment uh, on sheet. Uh, uh, Help me out here. Um, Senator Patrick, can I just help? Sorry to interrupt you. You don't need to seek leave to move it, but you need to No, seek together, leave. together. Yeah, together. So, so yeah, okay. I was going to say, I seek leave to, to move amendment, uh, my amendments one and two to the government's amendments on sheet uh, 1310 um, by leave. All right. And leave granted? Leave is granted. So the question is, Minister? I was just going to uh, just quickly make a contribution to say the government does not agree with the amendment that has been proposed by um, Senator Patrick. Uh, this amendment is in relation to the woman protected area. Um, and as I have already said in my contribution in responding to Senator Patrick's questions, it would not be a sensible uh, to permanently site a radioactive waste facility in this area. Um, Woolma has not been nominated, shortlist nor the communities surrounding it um, have they been consulted. The government is absolutely committed to community consultations and uh, only citing a facility where there is broad community support. There have been no community consultations on the Woolmer site uh, or indications of broad sentiment towards a facility. Thank you, Minister. Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just very briefly, um, Labor will be opposing these amendments. Um, as Senator Patrick is well aware, uh, Woomera is unable to be deemed a site as it hasn't voluntarily nominated itself to be a site. Uh, Labor is not going to be supporting legislation or amendments from any senator that forces this facility on a community that doesn't want it. Um, I'd encourage Senator Patrick to think about that. Senator Patrick. Well, just to clarify, um, in actual fact, much of, the, much of the land up there is either uh, owned by the state of South Australia's Crown land or indeed is, is owned by the federal government who can self-nominate uh, a site, and the the amendment is not prescriptive in in identifying a particular site on the uh, on the Woomera pro prohibited area. And I might point out that the Woomera prohibited area, uh, Senator Watt, is 12.7 million hectares of desert. Okay, so it's uh, not a small uh, it's not it's not a small site. There is scope to find a reasonable location. Uh, you just have to be willing to want to try. And again, uh, uh, I, you know, a nomination can come from either uh, the either the, the, the state government or indeed uh, from the federal government, who uh, own some of the land there, and uh, that that could then initiate a process, which is by and large in, in, a, in, a, in a number of sites has been uh, examined in detail, uh, and of course. There would have to be consultant, uh, consultation with the local community, including the indigenous, uh, indigenous folk. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The question is that the amendments to Government Amendment 2 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Clark. Have a look at All right. Uh, now, um, the question is that the uh, government amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the opposition welcomes passage of the government amendments on sheet SV110. 
As previously stated, the opposition has worked with the Bangala and Andamanatha peoples to ensure this bill reflects their preferences. In doing so, we sought two actions by the government. First, the government clarified the effect of this bill on the site nominations process, which was done in the explanatory memorandum with the addition of the following passage, and I, and I quote, recognition of the three shortlisted sites confirms the sites as being nominated and approved under the Act, but does not limit the minister from approving new nominations. The minister may declare any approved nomination as a site and is not bound to declare one of the three shortlisted sites. Second, we welcome the minister's commitment that listing the Wallabadina station site recognises the shortlisting stage of the site selection process only. It is not intended to signal a change in the government's assess assessment of that site and that the government has not changed it posi its position, that it will not impose a facility on an unwilling local community. With these actions by the government and the passage of the amendments on sheet SV110, I can advise the Chamber that the Opposition will not be proceeding with the amendments that have been circulated on sheet 1042 revised 2 and sheet 1322. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Oh, okay. To Senator, yeah, I, sorry, I was just doing some scribbling out there. Senator Patrick. Okay. Um, so I'll indicate to the chamber that I don't intend to move amendments one to six on uh, sheet eight nine six five uh, revised, uh, but I will uh, urge the government uh, as it moves forward, noting the division in Kimber, noting the fact that uh, this process has been completely botched to get to the point. Uh, where it has, uh, it will almost certainly go to a judicial review if you pick Nepandi, uh, and um, there is an alternate uh, that makes a lot more sense. You just have to be able to stand up to those uniform people who have uh, who have um, made a claim that is, is is outrageous in the context of that of the site at um, at uh, uh, the the. the the WPA, 12.7 million hectares, 13 per cent of South Australia, twice the size of Tasmania. Uh, not all of the, the uh, site is, is used for uh, uh, missile testing. Uh, it is uh, in the middle of a desert. It's on a secure defence site. Uh, and the community are likely to be much, much warmer to the idea. Uh, and indeed, it is not agricultural land. Well, the question is that the bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Thanks, Rachel. Shut the doors. The question is that the bill now be reported. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Davey to tell it for the ayes. Senator Seward to call it for the noes. Order. Um, the machine's not working. As you were. Thank you. Order. The result of the division is eyes 35, nose 13. The decision is divided in, decided in the affirmative. Thank you. The committee has considered the national order. Order. Hello. Order. Order. I, I know it's party time down the end, but order. Thank you. The committee has considered the National Radioactive Waste Management Amendment, Site Specification, Community Fund and Other Measures Bill. 2020 and agreed to it with amendments. Clark. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. The question is the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against no. Well, the ayes have it. No those have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Close the doors. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. The ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, and I appoint Senator Davey to tell it for the ayes. The noes to the left of the chair, and I appoint Senator Seawitt to tell it for the noes. Thank you. Order. There being 34 ayes, 13 noes, the question is decided in the affirmative.